keeping the torch lit through the long night. It's Game of Microphones. With Lord Sterling, Sir Duncan. Valar Morgolas. Seven blessings, soaring sky pirates and hungry fire breathers, and welcome to Game of Microphones. I'm Lord Sterling, Sir Duncan the Fearsome, Ripper and Chewer. And I'm Lord Zach, the one sapphire-eyed prankster prince. Ooh, and welcome to episode 131. On this episode, we're covering the House of the Dragon season finale. Episode 10, The Black Queen. And in case you're not already aware, this podcast is from the perspective of someone who's current on the show. That means you've seen all previously aired episodes of both Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. If not, there's still time to be eaten alive by the gnashing jaws of a gargantuan winged reptilian. So you don't have to hear these spoilers. Warning. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Fear not, friends. If you haven't read Fire and Blood, which covers this period of the Targaryen reign, we will only be discussing events from the Dance of Dragons that have already come to pass on House of the Dragon, and we'll take caution not to spoil drama that's still to come on the show. And if you're enjoying our coverage of House of the Dragon and our complete series rewatch of Game of Thrones, which covers every episode in depth, Please consider taking the black and helping us to get out of the red by subscribing to our Patreon at patreon.com slash gom podcast or by making a one-time donation to help keep our show live at paypal.me slash gom podcast. You can also support us without spending any extra silver stags by clicking on our Amazon affiliate link located in this podcast's description and at the bottom of gameofmicrophones.com for your online shopping. Costs you nothing, and we'll get a little kickback from Amazon for sending you their way. Thanks. And without any further ado, let's get into our coverage of House of the Dragon, Season 1, Episode 10, the finale, The Black Queen. Ah, am I, am I sitting on something? Hold on. Oh, what is this? This is epic skateboard sent into game of microphones by our friend and listener johnny store from outlawed paint out in california if you're in california and you want a an award-winning painter to paint up your car or motorcycle definitely check out outlawed outlawed paint spelled outlaw with a d on the end johnny store will hook you up and he's (laughs) like i said award-winning look at this freaking thing Epic. Seven blessings to you as well, Johnny. Thanks for sending this in, brother. <laughs> All right. Season finale. What'd you think overall? Wow, man. Really good. Really strong episode. Um, man, what a cliffhanger for who knows how long, probably two years. Um, maybe <laughs> not quite. I, that's the, I'm just going to put that in my mind that way. If it's, Two years, I'm not disappointed. Yeah, you know, if it's more than <laughs> if it's much more than two years, I, I am I will be disappointed. But maybe they'll get it out like next, like the end of next fall, or you know, in, during the holidays <laughs> next year. Probably not, but that's why I'm saying two years. Yeah, but um, who knows? Or maybe early early spring, like January February of 24, instead of the summer of 24 or the fall of 24. You think they'd change the uh, season that they release it in, or you think they'd go for beginning of fall again, end of summer? Yeah, I don't know. They're yeah, they may be trying. They may try to either do you know the old Game of Thrones spring slot, True. you know, March through May to kind of get the old May sweep, sweep, you know, kind of the end for the end of the. That would make sense. And depends on what rings. Depends on if they want to go directly against Rings of Power again, or if. They want to do their own thing or just they release it when they release it, irrespective of, you know, the other fantasy shows, you know, Witcher, Will of Time, Rings of Power or, you know, whatever else is coming out. Last of Us, you know, I assume is going to come out, you know, next year. So it probably won't compete with season two of Last of Us. Well, not that that's really fantasy, but it's kind of zombie apocalypse. But anyway, a lot of the same <laughs> viewer crossover viewers, you know, between the those genres. But 
man, um, I'm bummed to have to wait that long, but like we said in the live last night, it was, it'll be worth it and it'll be good when it comes out. And man, season two is going to be like madness. I bet. Yeah. It's going to start off with just boom. We're, you know, here we go. Luke just died and war. Yeah. Season one has been sort of like a slow exponential curve where we're slowly yeah. building speed. And then now towards the end, it's starting to ramp up and up and up and up faster and faster. And so if we follow that same acceleration curve, season two is going to be crazy, dude. <laughs> like we'll be like Elon Musk, you know, Falcon rocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Straight up, maybe competing with the, uh, Jeff Bezos's Amazon rings a power rocket that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> flopping over <laughs> crashes crashes on the launch pad the 38 percent audience score on rotten tomatoes wow really is it that low dang that's crazy yeah. <laughs> i haven't seen it so i can't really talk shit personally but you know i'm yeah, just yeah. i'm just making jokes because house of the dragon is so good you know yeah yeah they i've watched both and you know i i enjoy rings the power for the most part there are some issues but it's if if Hot D is, you know, a 9.5 or 9.8, 9.9, you know, nothing's perfect, but I'm a pretty easy critic too. I'll admit that. Things <laughs> of Power is like, it, at its best, it's probably an eight or eight and a half. So it's just, it's not, it's just not this quite the same level of just the drama that just grips you. And yeah, and it could be that, but this, you know, writing wise and, you know, it's beautiful. It's well produced. The scenery and the Middle Earth part of the story is really good. But Hot D is just, it's just Hot got that D. extra, just that greatness factor that, you know, is you know, writing, I mean, man. nothing else can, nothing, I mean, there's, you know, like my favorite shows ever, you know, like Breaking Bad. Um, Excellent show. I'm trying to think of, of other stuff, you know, Game of Thrones is, I mean, there's not, I mean, I like war stuff. So I like band of brothers and that sort of thing, but oh, that's yeah. kind of great you know, show. Sub, but anyway, it's, there's just very few shows that are just absolutely at the very top line, above a 9.5 for me. Mm -hmm. So hot D is right there. Yeah. The writing on this show is really, really good. Lots of intense drama <laughs> between all the characters so many different dynamics going on you know what i mean yeah absolutely you know and there's been a few little things here and there but overall it, you know i think it's very well written uh i guess the internet was kind of mad with sarah hess who i think is like a producer and one of the main writers i think she wrote she got the credit for writing i mean there's a writer's room so it's always a collaborative process but i think she was the credited writer last week and people just didn't like book changes um, with Allison's main motivation being this misunderstood conversation between her and Viserys. Right. Uh, whereas the books just show her, I mean, again, it's the history book and you know, it, how accurate are the history books, you know, it's kind of an underlying theme to this whole series. But anyway, some people, and I, I don't really like it either that they're softening Allison and they soften Rhaenyra too. Like, like the book, the history books show them is very like, sharp hardcore you know win cut throat or die cut, absolutely cutthroat and the show is softening that up some you know with some of these changes like they did with Amond and vagar and uh luke and ver Arax this uh this episode but overall but, but and then also i think last week hbo or hot d whoever announced that i think sh that writer sarah has got a contract extension or another year or something like that. And people were mad telling her, get her away from uh, the song of ice and fire universe, you know, <laughs> you know, G O T C U get her, you know, ban her pen. So I was like, I mean, I think those are real nitpicky fans, you know, talking about that sort of stuff. Cause overall the writing I think has been really good. And there's a lot that comes straight out of the book. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so this week's episode starts out with a close-up of the cool painted table, which ends up yeah. being a major feature of this episode. Definitely. I was kind of hoping, since this was the finale, I was kind of hoping for a cold open. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, I don't think, episode, the pilot didn't have an intro at all, you know, right. the title sequence. So it was a cold open because there was no <laughs> title sequence to run <laughs> yeah. at the beginning. And I'm pretty sure every By episode default. since then has been no cold open, you know, straight from the HBO oh, oh. straight into the dun, 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 straight into the title <laughs> sequence. So yeah. I was kind of hoping for a since it was the finale and those were in the original series. They were very 
few and far between. Yeah, sparingly Obviously, the, ret- the Return of the Hound, I think, is the most oh, yeah. well-known mm-hmm. cold open. Um, Definitely. But overall, I didn't get a cold open, but that's okay. We'll probably get one eventually. Maybe. Um, yeah, so the the table is hinting that war is coming. War. Because, um, you know, clearly war. the painted table... <laughs> war. <laughs> like Otto, yeah. <laughs> clearly yeah. the painted table is a war map. Probably a relic from Egon's conquest that he yeah, used to plan yeah. um, his his takeover of the is. kingdoms. And, and the the painted table is cold and dark and desolate. Mm-hmm. You know, i.e., you know, peaceful. Oh yeah, versus true. how it changes in the episode with flame underneath it, lit up and active, and yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, obviously, so like flame and fire being war, and there's obviously dragons here, so things are going to burn. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the realm, the realm, you know, under fire or under siege, so to speak, at war versus at the beginning, we're still kind of in the the end the fuse of the Sarah the peaceful. Yet. <laughs> exactly, we're at the end of the Sarah the peaceful his reign and Jaehaerys before him. So the realm has kind of been cold and quiet this whole time. Yeah, and that's how the painted table appears to us at the beginning and it start. I think most places, most times we see it or the camera pans over it. It usually, I think starts in the North over as it, as it shows us the painted table mm-hmm. and kind of zooms, not say zooms, but pans down and can show the rest of the, uh, of the continent. So it was pretty cool to see. And then Luke is standing there kind of fidgeting and toying with Driftmark. Yeah. And we know it's Driftmark because the table has, carvings written on it to label each area which is cool i don't know if we've gotten quite as detailed a view of that in the past but we see it now and all the all the terrain and everything man imagine how giant that tree must have been that they they used to make the table out of it's a huge piece of wood (laughs) that's what she said and uh (laughs) so so i really liked this intro and like you said luke is standing by drift mark and he's as he caresses it with his hand and it seems like he's contemplating his future as Lord of the Tides since we're in this sort of um, uh, purgatory with not knowing. It's like he's like um, Schrodinger's Corliss at this point. We don't know if he's alive or dead <laughs> or <laughs> we're waiting to find out more information about Corliss. But considering his health is at risk. This topic is obviously on the tip of Luke's mind and considering the whole um, scene that occurred at King's Landing with the questioning of the succession of Driftmark. So he's been contemplating what this means and what his responsibilities will be, and he is not ready for it. Uh, Rhaenyra shows up. And he's chilling in his cool little like half red, half black. I don't know if that's called. I don't think that would be a tunic. What would that what would that? Um, outfit yeah, I'm, be called. I'm not sure. George, I'm, George has like 60 different descriptions for different men's attire, waistcoats and tunics and uh, G- outer... G- uh, something with a G, I think. It, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. But I'm yeah, it's like it, an under yeah. under armor uh, type thing, right? Right, yeah. yeah this is kind of like a, a quilted kind of woolen material that yeah, you could put plated armor over the top of it and it's not going to like pinch and rash. you know your armor's not gonna you know yeah scrape against give you. you yeah rashes and choke you know hot points you know where it's gonna cause pain and friction yeah pretty um, cool it was pretty you know it's kind of you know obviously it opened on luke because he has a lot going on this episode and yeah. obviously ultimately meets his demise they telegraphed it right from the start and i didn't notice yeah they um he talks about we're kind of going back to uh, at Lena's funeral when Luke tells Corliss. Uh, I don't want to, which now, of course, was like Jon Snow. When he, right, for, we didn't make the comparison at the time, but when he was told that oh, he would, would, was going to be king of the north. I don't want it. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's why I've been saying it. I thought you got what I was saying uh, in that episode. Oh, no, I, like, I missed I it. I don't want it. <laughs> Just in the way I was saying, I didn't express it verbally, but I expressed it verbally. Yeah, I don't yeah, want yeah. It. Um, totally. But. And what he tells Corliss is, uh, I don't want to be Lord of Driftmark because that means everybody else is going to be dead. Yeah. But obviously, the reverse happens. Yeah. <laughs> so brutal. Pretty, too soon, man. Sad. Too soon. Yeah. And so not yeah. only uh, will everybody be dead, but also he thinks 
well, now it's happening so fast that not everybody's going to be dead. So he's like, oh, my God, this is all happening so quick. And he just like he doesn't think he's up to task. As he points out, grandsire was the greatest sailor who ever lived. I can't be Lord of the Tides. I get green sick before the ship even leaves the harbor. I'll ruin everything. You're ruining everything! <laughs> This is, this was this was Veyman's point. Team Veyman. No, not really. Uh, we can't have <laughs> yeah, a, this is exactly Team Veyman. We can't have a boy in command of the uh, Valerian fleet. Yeah, and I like the uh, the phrase green sick. You know, that's kind of a cool way of saying seasick. Yeah. George mm-hmm. has a nice way of turning a phrase and uh, saying things differently than are said in our world with getting the point across. Uh, so that's pretty cool. He's like, I don't want Driftmark. I sh- it should have passed to Sir Veyman, and it's too late for that now. <laughs> so Rhaenyra is trying to comfort him. You know, we don't choose our de- our destiny. It chooses us. And he points out that she was allowed a choice, um, at least initially. But once she was told the prophecy, it became less of a choice for her. But, it, you know, it's true. So many people throughout the history of Westeros, Westeros have uh, have chose to not take the, the the crown for themselves like Aemon, who ended up at the wall uh right he and a couple of his brothers chose not to be to take the crown he chose to be a maester um so it's funny some people are like really want the power and other people are like whoa 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 i don't want it like egon who ended up being crowned he didn't he wanted nothing to do with it right, right. If, uh, if he had left the choice to him he would have just reneged the the opportunity and given the crown to his brother, which is probably probably may have been better <laughs> overall. <laughs> Who knows? We'll see. Um, so he's like, you know, grand grandfather, grandsire, let you choose if you'd be his heir or not. And she's like, well, you want to know like more details about this. I, in truth, I was terrified. I was the same age as you, fourteen, and I wasn't ready. Uh, clearly, because she was more concentrated on being a, a harlot. <laughs> Tim Green, Tim Green, woo! And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, so she was terrified and it was her duty, but eventually she came to understand that she had to earn it, you know, especially probably since all the lords and everything want, didn't want her to be heir. She had to, she realized that she had to show them that she was worthy um which you know arguably she didn't do a very good job at <laughs> but uh it's it's funny luke is like well i'm not like you i'm not so perfect <laughs> and she's like ha! i am exactly you know, she admits she knows that she's far from perfect and Clearly. this is just kind of the the quintessential you know sweet sweet child you know even at 14 that still has this you know view of their mother that, you know, she can do no wrong. She's been a loving mother. You know, she cares for them. She gives them what they need and, and, and more, but that, you know, kids for the most part, you know, don't see our faults. Um, yeah. As, and I mean, unless you're abusive or, you know, a twat, but, <laughs> but as a child is all, you know, a lot of times has this, you know, unrealistic view, you know, of their parents. Yeah. That, what's their you know, frame of reference, the, you know? Right. They're great. And they're the parent, their mom and dad are the greatest thing. All powerful. Like, yeah, like you're, they're everything to them. And, but obviously in reality, you know, none of us are perfect and we've, you know, messed up and, you know, dropped them when they were babies and all kinds of different things. (laughs) And you still feel like a child in your mind anyway, you know? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. Sometimes. And it's, it was pretty cool for him to, for us to see his view of his mother is still that kind of sweet, innocent. Oh, mom's perfect. Yeah, that was a cute little moment. And her reaction was nice. She gave him the triple kiss and uh, was like, no, 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 sweetling. (laughs) I am not. (laughs) I'm anything but perfect. And she reassures him that my father, you know, her father looked at looked after her, helped her to prepare. And I will do the same for you. And this is when we get Sir Laurent Marbrand interrupting. And uh, this was the first time we get his name. Uh. House Marbrand of Ashmark in the Westerlands. They're sworn to House Lannister. So that's a little bit of interesting stuff. It could be a conflict if House Lannister is, uh, you know, it's clearly going to be siding with the, gr- the Greens. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> and uh, he informs them that 
Princess Renice has just arrived on Dragonback, and she urgently requests an audience with both Rhaenyra and Prince Daemon. And so at this point, the most logical assumption for a reason that Renice would be there with urgency for Rhaenyra is that there might be news of Lord Corlys. You know, they'd just seen Viserys two nights before, or a couple days before, so they may not might not think that he's likely dead. And Rhaenys wouldn't be the messenger, most likely, in that case anyway. They'd send somebody else to inform her, because it's not Rhaenys' duty. And uh, and since they don't know Viserys is dead, there's no reason to suspect a green usurpation at this point, especially since Alicent had just said at dinner a couple nights ago that Rhaenyra will make a fine queen in their moment of reconnection. Beautiful moment. And uh, so she thanks him and Rhaenys comes in and in the next scene to meet with both of them. And uh, right on cue, Rhaenyra is asking about Lord Corlys and if they have news of his recovery but f- before she can even finish the question Renice is just comes out with it Viserys is dead met with silence and shock and Damon looks over with concern um like a little bit of power hungriness in his eyes maybe but also the gears are turning about what this means and what they're going to have to do to secure the throne and he's been anticipating this for a long time uh and Renice is tells her that you know she's just as sad about this as they are that she's grieving the loss with them that her cousin their Rhaenyra's father possessed a kind heart which is true and he sort of she sort of seemed to warm to him significantly in the last couple days of his <laughs> of his reign as he showed her that he values her opinion and everything during the question of succession of Driftmark and she steps closer to Rhaenyra, adding, there's more. Aegon has been crowned as his successor. And instantly, Rhaenyra turns and, oh, winces in pain as the shock induces the miscarriage. And this is bonkers, just like the craziness of everything that's going on. She's pregnant. The throne has been stolen. Aegon's been, you know, been crowned. Corlys is up in the air. This is just a crazy situation. There's so much going on and so much yeah. at stake. She's literally just been told five seconds ago that her dad has died, who she just saw. And obviously she knows he's in very bad health and, and ailing. But your father's dead. I'm sorry. I know, I know, you know, and Rainey's tries to soften the blow with, you know, he was kind. And he had a good heart. But wait, there's more. Uh, yeah, the Greens have totally usurped the throne. And that just the first like Rainey's or I'm sorry, Rainier can't even really react like she has a look on her face for a split second. And then immediately it's like um, labor pains begin. Yeah. And like you said, just the shock of the situation with I mean, it's a, a one two punch, her dad dying and they have crowned Aegon already. It's not like they got news that dad died a day ago. And now a day later, they're getting news that Aegon is crowned because of what Allison and Otto did and how they controlled the flow of information for a little while. Like it's done. It's over. Aegon has already been crowned in front of the masses. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's like, they crowned him. You know, she emphasizes him like instead of me and Damon is still thinking about Viserys and he's like, how, how did Viserys die? And Rhaenys doesn't know because she was held captive, made a prisoner in her Mm -hmm. quarters, as she says. So she says, she tells him, I could not say. And a day, perhaps two ago. And immediately Damon's like, Viserys has been slain. But <laughs> like, I don't know if I would have jumped to that same conclusion. Oh, man. Considering the state straight, that we saw him. Man, he's like a, he's an Olympic long jumper. <laughs> Jumping straight to the conclusion. <laughs> yeah. They killed him. They killed my brother. And immediately now R- Rhaenyra is starting oh. to get worried. Alicent demanded you declare for Aegon. And Rhaeny is like, she did. And Rhaenyra looks hurt by this. And she's, and, uh, it's funny because Renice almost looks surprised that Rhaenyra would think that she may have agreed to declare for Aegon. Rhaenyra, Rhaenys kind of cocks her head a little bit and she's like, I refused her, you know, <laughs> like I'm with you. We, we, I thought I made that clear a couple days ago. And uh, so Damon is skeptical, like, and yet you're still alive somehow. And I was yeah, thinking like, oh my God, like you wouldn't believe 
her, even if she told you how she survived, you know? Because yeah, was- oh, I stuck in the dragon pit, I busted up through the floors, killed a bunch of peasants. Even before that, I escaped the Red Keep, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> King's Guard. Because Eric, uh, Eric, E. Eric hasn't shown up yet with yeah. the crown. So, you know, he would lend, you know, credence to her story. Yeah, this King's Guard let me go. And then we got separated in the city and I yeah. busted up out of there with Melees. You know, Not like, only would she have had to escape the Red Keep, which was on lockdown, she would have had to snuck to her dragon in the dragon pit while the ceremony was going on, which seems doubly unlikely and, yeah. and everything. So the like, she doesn't bother going through the whole uh, thing. Yeah. She just continues because she's like, they're not going to believe me. So she just continues. It sounds me. like a tall tale. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like bullshit. only the truth. Only the truth could be that crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and Damon, I mean, Damon is so suspicious now, like of Rainey's of everything they've killed. You've killed my brother, prepare to die. Yeah. Uh, he is straight. <laughs> yeah. Damon is straight. And you go Montoya. At totally. one point, he goes like straight to his sword here. Like he's either he grabs it or he's already has it in his hand and he's doing the classic, you know, Damon hand on the hilt, you know, the classic Damon pose. He does that several times in this episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, he's he's ready to go to war immediately. He's just ready. And Rhaenyra knows it, too, as we find out shortly. Uh, but she tells him it's not only was he crowned, but it was the high septon and in front of the masses. And as as soon as she mentions Aegon being crowned again, Rhaenyra has another wince of pain um, from her belly. And you know that nothing good is going to come from that. And uh, she says, Rhaenyra, Rhaenys says she witnessed it herself just before she fled on Maylie's. So, yeah, so Rhaenyra says they crowned him before the masses. And like Rhaenys picks up the sentence right as Rhaenyra kind of trails off and kind of finishes the thought, giving the reasoning behind why they crowned him before the masses. And yeah, Rainey says so that the masses would see him as their rightful king. So at this point, Damon is big mad and his head is leaned forward and his face is kind of twisted. And he's like, that whore of a queen murdered my brother and stole his throne. And you could have burned them all for it. Burn them all. Burn them all. Burn them all. Where's my sister? Yeah. And uh, a war is likely to be f- likely to be fought over this treachery for sure. Rainey says, and uh, Damon is classic. Mm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Damon wanted her to burn them all. Right. Had the chance to end it. Yeah, and so she says to, uh, in response, that but that war is not mine to begin. And I'm thinking, why not? Viserys was your cousin. They're usurping his will, circumventing your blood's throne. How is this not your war? You know, it's at least partially your <laughs> your war, right? Especially considering they may have killed him. Yeah, and as soon as Corlys shows up and declares for, you know, Rhaenyra and the Blacks, may, uh, Rhaenys is like, okay, I'll hop on Maelys and we'll go patrol the gullet. Well, this is the interesting thing. She She's playing it playing it um, very guarded here, symbolized by yep. her, her yep. armor, you know, and she, she says, I only rushed this warning to you out of loyalty to my husband and to my house. So that tells me that it's her loyalty to her husband that's explaining why she uh, she doesn't kneel, for instance, when R- Rhaenyra is crowned. She's the only person that's kneeling. She just has to wait to get the official go ahead from Corliss because Corliss is the head of Driftmark, uh, uh, you know, so... Um, she wants to join Rhaenyra, but she just can't yet. And so she's playing yeah. it cool, playing it close to the to the vest. And because Corliss still doesn't know about Vaymon mm-hmm. and Damon and what happened, he he hasn't heard Rhaenyra's denial of being involved in Lenor's death the way that Rhaenys heard it from Rhaenyra's own lip and swore yeah. it uh, that she wasn't involved in his murder. Um, she was involved in the cover up uh, or of his fake murder. Anyway, we talked yeah. about that. So she just can't commit before Corliss does. Like, right. Corliss, you know, there's a Corliss needs to know a lot, needs to be filled in on a lot of uh, information and goings on before he can make the decision to team black or team green or when he first wakes up or like team Driftmark. Peace. We're going to retire <laughs> in Driftmark and y'all have at it. Team Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. So crazy. So Renice uh, further tells Rhaenyra here that the greens are coming for you, Rhaenyra. 
and for your children. And this moment is foreshadowing, ah, you know, which I didn't pick up on at the time. Yeah. The Greens are coming for you, Rhaenyra. And for your children. You should leave Dragonstone at once. But there's a, a brief, just micro expression of panic on Rhaenyra's face that's not enough to be obvious to everybody around her, but enough to see on camera in this close-up shot because she's got to keep her cool, you know, as the new leader, basically, and she can't freak out. Flip out, man. But uh, she, I thought this was really great acting in this moment with just a subtle facial expression showing her panic at the thought of her children being in danger. Um, and Rhaenys tells her, you should leave Dragonstone at once. Like you got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> oh, so, so ominous. Yeah, very ominous. And at this point, Rainy starts walking away. And that's when Rhaenyra doubles over onto the table and reaches down under her dress and pulls out her hand covered in blood. And she says, the babe is coming. And it's like, oh, God, this is not good. You know, this is going to be bad. Very bad. Bad omen. Yeah, we don't know how bad. Like, am I Aaron, you know, for C-section bad? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lena, who just the child won't come out bad, yeah, or something else. You know, at this point, as the audience, we are like, "Oh no, is Rhaenyra going to die in child in the childbed right here before before she's crowned?" Yeah, the first battle of the war is the battle in the birthing bed. <laughs> you know, like the- just yeah, just like her mom told her in episode one. Yep, just like her mom told her. And uh, so she's got to win this battle before she can even step onto the playing field. And the the rest of the team is waiting for their captain, you know, so they, she needs to get on the field at once. And her body seems to instinctively be be saying like, you know, this it, the time is now it's got to come out uh, like we don't have any options. And so it cuts to the next scene with Rhaenyra pacing in a nightgown. She looks like some specter haunting the castle, you know, like from from uh, the haunting of Bly Manor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the woman walking through the house at, in the night in their sleeping gown. And the maester is telling somebody this is her term is just far from complete. This should not be happening. And Rhaenyra lashes out. It is fucking happening <laughs> like lund like lurches up to the dude's face basically <laughs> viciously and the midwife is like keep your head about you calm down you know she's like all right fuming and she starts pacing around again and she's like rubbing herself and like trying to make this happen but you can tell something is wrong because as elinda one of the midwives says we've done this five times before and clearly things are different this time and she, they're trying to help her and she's telling him, get off, get off, get off. And I feel like the, her refusing to accept help is sort of symbolic of how uh, she's like, got to make the decisions herself for this war. And she's the one in charge and she's got to handle it herself, you know, and she's got to rein in Damon and everything. I feel like her handling this birthing situation alone uh, and by herself sort of symbolizes her, how she feels uh, in regards to the whole overall situation. And she clearly knows that something is wrong this time. And it, uh, it cuts to Damon who's saying that he wants, he's, he's been pure, he's in war mode and business mode. I want patrols along the island's perimeter. Look for any small ships. If the greens attack. Now it'll be by stealth. They may try to land in secret, you know, and then, um, they won't attack directly. And in the background, as Damon is like giving orders, you can hear Rhaenyra groaning. Oh, and it, this is bad, but it kind of reminded me of Mustafa and, <laughs> and Austin Powers. Let this be a reminder to you all that this organization will not tolerate failure. Gentlemen. Let's get down to business. Oh. Oh. Ah. <laughs> the, um, the, oh man, I can't recover from that. The, um, <laughs> when he's talking about a small ship, that made me think of uh, Davos and Melisandre. Yeah. Um, in that little rowboat, in the little rowboat to, um, come, well, they left Dragonstone and went to wherever Rinley is at. Uh, in the Riverlands or the Reach somewhere, 
after that little tournament where Brienne witnesses his death, Davos and Melisandre oh, yeah. take a little rowboat, a tiny little rowboat close to wherever they were at Rinley and his host was at to, you know, Melisandre to birth the shadow baby, whatever thing of Stannis that went and killed Rinley. Um, so there's, you get a couple of people in a little rowboat with some magic involved and you don't know what might happen. So oh, they're trying man. to prevent any kind of stealth incursion. We've seen all kinds of crazy births in this show. Dead, you know, dead mothers, dead kids, dragon babies. Like I think we see in this episode, demon babies, uh, babies that won't come out, you know, and get roasted by dragons. Like This is, yeah, this, there's a lot of births in this or, or attempted births. Craziness. Crazy. I forgot about that shadow baby. That was so cool. And uh, yeah, Rhaenyra is just wailing audibly in the background as Damon is making all these defensive uh, calls. Um, he's saying we don't have enough men to surround the island, but we can appear to we can make ourselves appear stronger than than we actually are. Uh, and he says to conscript the dragon keepers. They're capable fighters. So that's an interesting little thing there. I wonder if that would might come into play in the future. It's got to, right? Chekhov's dragon keepers. <laughs> they're gonna have to yeah, do something maybe. cool. Maybe, yeah. Even if they're just a lookout. So then it cuts down to the beach, and we have Jace and Luke sword fighting. And Jace is being pretty brutal. He's beating the hell out of him, slapping him with the broadside of the sword, knocking him down. He's Kristen Coling, Luke. <laughs> yeah, and even the that's how uh, Kristen trained the two strong boys. Yeah, totally. Vastly out number outmanned, and even the the Kingsguard watching is like, uh, you might want to go easier on him, like so we can actually learn what you're trying to teach him because this is pretty brutal. Jace is significantly more formidable at this point than Luke is, and uh, considering how the episode ends. And this being one of their last major interactions together, I'm wondering if he's going to have regrets in the future about how he, how harsh he was with Luke. You know, he's like, what the hell was that? Like verbally pushing him down as well as physically. And so Renice shows up and she's like, your lady mother needs to see, see you, both of you. And then it cuts back to the inside as Rhaenyra is attempting to deliver the baby and Jace and Luke are just kind of watching in horror. And uh, Rhaenyra's like, fuck. <laughs> and Maester Gerardus lets her know that they're there. And um, she just goes like straight into business mode again. Like uh, she's rem remarkably focused and articulate in this scene, considering the situation that she's in. And she's explaining the issues of the throne um, and I'm, I was curious, like how she's going straight to that and not explaining what's going on with the baby, but I guess it's pretty self-explanatory. So she doesn't really need to, <laughs> to explain that part to them. But yeah, she's just telling them Viserys is dead and she articulate, even in this circum circumstance, the Greens have repudiated the succession, <laughs> Repudi repudiated, that's a five syllable word while she's in like a six or like a nine of pain, you know? And <laughs> so... They're asking her, what's to be done? Like, what are we going to do about this? And she's telling them, nothing yet. We're going to, you know, nothing yet. And so they ask where Damon is. And she's like, I don't know, gone to madness, gone to plot his war. And she's frustrated with him already. Yeah, Jace, you know, just, just tells his mom, like, leave Damon to me. Like, you know, <laughs> Jace oh, thinks he's big stuff. And it's like, mm, like nobody, not even Rhaenyra, not even Viserys, you know, could handle Damon, but Jace thinks he can. Yeah, nobody handles Damon. Um, so as as the boys turn to go up the stairs, there was I think there's a small little editing error. Oh, really? Jace is first. He's like, leave Damon to me. And he kind of turns and goes up the stairs. And then Luke is behind him. And then the camera goes back to Rhaenyra and says, Rhaenyra says, Jace. I know she says, Jacerius. And she, she said it an interest. I always say Jacerius. But she said, just serious, like serious at the end. Oh, she did? Like, just, yeah, she said, just serious. And she has an English accent that I, I won't try to do. Um, <laughs> and then it goes back to him. And Luke is like leaving up the stairwell to the left. And now Jace is behind and he turns and talks to his mother. Jace. Just serious. 
Mm. So just like literally a second ago, I mean, it could have been, I mean, the editors could say, oh, well, Luke passed him on the stairs and Jace was left behind. But I mean, it was a, it was a really quick transition from the boys going up the stairs to Rhaenyra back to the boys. They've switched positions. But anyway, it's obviously not a big deal. But (laughs) um, she tells Jace that, I mean, it's obvious, but like Viserys is gone. So she is the queen. She don't have a crown yet, but if Viserys is dead, Rhaenyra is the queen. And so she's now, Jace is in her former position as the named heir. You are it. If something happens to me, you're the man. You're the man of the house. I mean, there's Damon there, but anyway, um, whatever claim remains to me, she tells Jace, you are now its heir. And then she reemphasizes to him that nothing is to be done without Rhaenyra's command, which Jace tries to carry out, but obviously Damon is not going to be uh, <laughs> reined in by anybody. I like the word "not." Also, "not" is to be no. done mm-hmm. by but by my command, and they sort of Absolutely. nod at one and each and at one another in a like a, a moment of understanding where Jace is realizing how important the situation is, and so now it cuts back to the war room meeting. And interestingly, we're introduced to Bartimos Celtigar. Yeah. Celtigar, <laughs> Crab Celtic, people. Celtigars. Crab Crabs people. in the chat. Crabs in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Crabs in the Crabs show. In the chat. <laughs> we got the Celtigars. So I think, like, obviously, Alshif X has been talking about it, but I think we talked about it on one episode. We did, yeah. They, Vaymond especially, and some of the Targaryens have talked repeatedly about blood of old Valyria, and they're the last, you know, two houses, the last vestiges. The last pillars of Valyria, as Viserys put it. The last pillars of old Valyria. They continually said this, but we were like, okay, so they're just writing House Kiltigar out of the show. And it's like, nope, here they are, finally, in episode 10. <laughs> Oh, so you're not the last pillars. <laughs> like maybe they did some last minute casting after week one and people are like, where's House Kiltigar? And uh, they threw in Lord Kiltigar just in this scene. Uh, and he's probably in it the whole time, but we were just wondering why they have talked about it. Yeah, if people had been speculating that House Kiltigar just didn't exist in TV canon since they're always talking about how Targaryen and Valerion are the two <laughs> last remaining pillars of Valyria. So apparently maybe Celtigar or Celtigar is just weaker and not considered big and big and powerful enough to be a pillar. Maybe they're just like the plinth of old Valyria or something. <laughs> or yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. They're definitely way less powerful than the Valerians and Targaryens. For sure. And so we learn that a raven's come in and that the sea snake's fever has broken. Woo! He's on the mend. Woo! That's really good news. And he's left even fall. <laughs> and <laughs> someone asks, where is he sailing? Do you remember where Evenfall is? Three days away from King's Landing. <laughs> Tarth! Oh! Brienne's home. Evenfall is the seat of the island of Tarth, but Evenfall is like the castle or the right. fortress. Right, that's cool. The Sapphire Isle. So we got Kiltigar in the chat and Tarth in the chat. Hell yeah. And so, <laughs> and so uh, we don't know where Corliss is sailing to at this point, but it's decided that they're going to send ravens to our, their closest allies, house Lords of Darklyn, Massey, and Bar Emmon, which is an interesting name, Bar Emmon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in the background, Rhaenyra is still, oh, and she goes, Damon, and tries to call Damon, and he ignores her. We've got a lot of work to do. Someone- I'm still alive, only I'm very badly burned. And he's totally focused on preparing for war. He must think that it just can't be delayed. And, uh, you know, it's like he's not a person to be handling the emotional situations. He needs to be hand- handling, uh, like, the, the planning and the plotting. And uh, interestingly, uh, the guy, uh, the, the Marbrand, the Kingsguard here, uh-huh. uh, what's his first name? Lawrence Sir Laurent. Laurent Marbrand. Marbrand. He's kind of disturbed by the, this that Damon is ignoring Rhaenyra and he says, Do do you want to speak to the Maester, my prince? And uh Damon kind of like turns and shoots him a look like, Are you gonna are you questioning my will? We'll send Ravens to our nearest allies, Lords Darkling, Massey, and Bar Emon. Do you want to speak to the Maester, my prince? And 
Lauren yeah. turns to face forward again, like yeah, Damon just scowls at him. He don't say anything. Bitch made. Bitch made, motherfucker. He scowls at him, and then Marbrin's like, "Okay, I won't bring that up again." And yeah. Damon just continues straight on with his plan. I'll go to the Riverlands and uh, talk with Lord Tully. Yeah, and it seems like uh, Marbrand doesn't like Damon's answer here. So this it could be important for the dynamic of who the Kingsguard are loyal to. Uh, I think this this little action here by Laurent questioning Damon is going to play into the moment we see in a minute where he's going to question them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you said, put them to the question. And so uh, we learn he he's going to fly to the Riverlands himself and affirm Lord Tully's support, which is pretty, pretty badass. Um, yeah, I but- can see how... I- I can see how Caraxes would be a uh, very persuasive. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> very persuasive. We find that out shortly too. So Jace walks in at this moment and he's like, you will do no such thing. My mother has decreed no action be taken while she's abed." bed. And Damon is just like, oh, you think you're going to boss me around? It's good you're here, young prince, you know, and kind of sassily says that. And uh, you're needed to patrol the skies on Vermax. Like, shoo, shoo, let the men handle this. <laughs> you go go on patrol. And he is, is interesting. A few of the dragon pronunciations were, they're, I'm sorry, the dragon name pronunciations were interesting. He says Vermax, like V-E-E-R. It's good you're here, young prince. You're needed to patrol the skies on Vermax. Did you hear what I said? Mm, Veer. Vermax. Well, it's... it's it's V-E-R-M-A-X, so I would say Vermax. Mm. But Damon says Vermax. Or in German, Vermax. <laughs> like Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht and Flaggen Luggen <laughs> Yeah. So he's like, Jace is like, did you hear what I said? And Damon just like straight up ignores him and <laughs> commands Bartimos to send the ravens. And he's like, uh, Bartimos seems like kind of caught in between uh, a rock uh, and a hard place. And so he's like, I, I'll, sh- I'll see it done, my lord. You know, and... And uh, he, Damon just keeps barking orders, summons Sir Stefan, our King's Guard are needed in the Dragonmont. And this is, you know, where we're going to learn who the, where their loyalty really lies. And so he instructs Jace to come with him to learn the true meaning of loyalty. You want to talk about this part? Mm-hmm. Um, we get these, co- or, no, this isn't where, I was thinking where, this is where we see a few shots of the, just the guys standing on the rocks, but that's uh, at the funeral. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the cremation that turns into the coronation. Um, <laughs> but we just get Damon, you know, standing on the side of the mountain and uh, Jace kind of off to the side. And then below Damon are the two Kings Guard, Stephen, Sir Stephen Darklin and Sir Laurent Marbrand. And it's just them standing on the mountain and Dragonstone, the castle was kind of out in the distance and the dragon mont is behind, sort of behind Damon, like they're on it and it kind of continues up behind Damon. So sketchy. He yeah, is like, oh, what is going on right Very here? Very ominous. Um, he tells, uh, Damon tells the King's Guard, you swore knights as the King's Guard. And they say, you know, of course, uh, everybody who wears the white cloak has to. And obviously we see what Damon's getting at. To whom? Who did you swear your oath to? And Sir Stefan's been around for a hot minute. And he says, well, at first uh, I swore to uh, Je- King Jaehaerys uh, and then to his grace Viserys in a, a, when he took the took over the throne. Um, and Marbrand seems younger. So I assume Viserys has been on the throne for a good long while. So I assume Marbrand swore his oaths to Viserys. And he asked him, you know, do you acknowledge the true line of succession? And uh, they, you know, he say yes. Uh, and then Damon hits him with another question. Do you recall who King Viserys named as his heir before his death? And they say Princess Rhaenyra uh, is here. OK, we still don't get correct. Seas. We hear him uh, like we do a lot with the dragons, uh, uh, Vagar and the other ones. We hear them before we ever see them a lot of times. Um, so I'm trying to remember when Danny snuck up on us. Yeah, I think in the Battle of the Gold Road, the Dothraki came. They come charging down the hill on horseback, and then Jamie and the Lannister army, they hear Drogon. We can hold them off. But anyway, Damon, th- he says, I'm, I'm grateful for your long service to the crown, which sounds like you're relieved. 
which would mean their death. I, I thought he was going to kill him like he, cause he didn't trust him. Uh, when he said, I'm grateful for your long service to the crown, right. meaning it's at an end. Yeah. Uh, but then, he, then he says, I'm presenting you with a choice. And then we get the classic, you know, this screechy, nasally, totally Whistling different sound kind of. of Caraxes. So I'm presenting you with a choice. Yeah, you know, the blood worm mile away. Yeah, we, he doesn't sound like any of the other dragons. So we see Corexi's head and neck kind of come over the rocks and his arms and his wings. He's kind of stepping down. And as he continues to move down towards closer to the daemon and closer to the knight to the king's guard, we see his body just continue to kind of come from behind the rock. I'm like, how long is the blood worm? And then his two back legs kind of go whoop and kind of hop down, which was just, it was really cool. But as he moves different. Then he sold his body is so elongated. A body like a French horn. Differently than he does. A tuba. He moves differently than the other dragons. It's pretty cool. When he's flying and when he's moving on the ground like this. Yeah. And so interestingly, like Rhaenyra tried to summon Damon before, but I think that in Damon's mind, this stuff needs to be handled immediately. And so it seems disrespectful and callous for him to be doing this, but he needs to make sure that these King's Guard are on point and on team black before anything yeah. else is done before they have a chance to sabotage. So it's, he's kind of caught in between a rock and a hard place here. Yeah, he, he really is. And you know, there are things that need to be done, but, and it's one thing to let your wife go to the birthing bed and handle it. But when she starts yelling and screaming your name, um, you should probably go. But obviously Damon being Damon, you know, he, he has other business that he chooses to attend to. And it is important. Like we said before, nobody handles Damon. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no but not even a wife that's in, in the middle of labor pains. Yeah, brutal. He feels like this must be done, it seems. Yeah, he absolutely does because, yeah, uh, a ter- uh, double agent Kingsguard would be horrific. An 11 on the danger scale. Yeah, it could result in all of their deaths uh, very quickly. But so Caraxes kind of sets himself right there beside Damon, and we get some cool shots of Damon in the foreground and Caraxes' head. You know, yeah. he's, you know, Caraxes screams and yells at, and I say yell, roars at him <laughs> and gets close to him. And uh, Damon says, "Swear anew your oath to Rhaenyra as your queen and to Prince Jaceris as heir to the Iron Throne." And um, we get more Caraxes action here. He's he's moving and just being super, super intimidating. Worth noting um, that he kind of just appears without being commanded. Also, exactly. like another example of that mental bond kind of potentially. Yeah, that yeah, he shows up. There's no he doesn't say Damon doesn't give the command. Caraxes come. He just shows up. Right on cue. Right on cue. It's like I'm presenting you with a choice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really cool uh and it, or if he he kind of gives them you know so that was the carrot and now damon gives them the stick or if you support their usurper speak it now and at least you'll have a clean honorable death if you choose treachery and swear fealty now only to be a turn cloak later on you will die screaming know that you will die screaming <laughs> damon is so frightening in this moment he's awesome and he is you can tell he is absolutely he means it with every ounce of himself. He means it. Like he personally, he, cause we see what he did with just random, uh, commoners and thieves and rapists in episode one at the city watch. Like yeah. he will do it himself and he will he love ensure, it. Yeah. Ensure that you, you die screaming. Yeah. And, uh, it's a good thing that Damon seems to be able to control his dragon better than Amond or Luceris, because otherwise these two valuable Kingsguard may have just been roasted unnecessarily. And, uh, speaking of the danger of a Kingsguard turn cloak, Jamie Lannister, the mad King, yep. you know, at the King's side and just is able to, you can't have it. Can't allow that. Super sketchy for the Kingsguard to be the son of a conquering Lord. Yeah. And I mean, Tywin, Tywin sort of did, you know, waited and waited and waited to declare in Robert's rebellion, because obviously he had served Ares a long time as hand. 
Aries had trusted him and then fired him and then I think hired him again. And there was rumors about Aries and Joanna Lannister and thus the yeah. parentage of, of the twins and whatnot. And Tyrion. They, um, and Tyrion, no right, son right. of mine. Mm. Ah, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but so sort of like Corliss and Rhaenys are sort of a little bit waiting to see what happens. Lannister, Tywin Lannister definitely did that. But in the end, Lannister's army gets to King's Landing before the start and Baratheon armies get there from the green, from the, the, what's the river? I know it's the green fort, but the, all three of the them. The trident. The trident. Um, right from slaying Rhaegar. And the Stark and, and Baratheon host, you know, rushed to King's Landing, but Tywin had gotten there first. And Jamie knows that it's his father's army at the door. So what is he going to do? Yeah. And we find out later in the series that Ares is telling Jamie, burn them all, burn, burn them all. It's like revealed. Jamie's reveal like, that was so nuts, dude, in the hot that's tub. That's crazy. It's like Jamie's choices are to set King's Landing ablaze with wildfire or kill a crazy king who's already about to be deposed by you know, a conquering host. So yeah, Jamie did what he did. Burn King's Landing, but burn your father, you know, like <laughs> his dad's out right, there. Yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah. And the whole army out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and all, I mean, those were all the Westermen that he grew up with and he knows their Lords and Knights and Squires and like thus literally his brothers and cousins and everybody that he knows uh, is in that, um, you know, host with Tywin that would have gotten burned up too. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it cuts back to the birthing scene and the, the maidens, the handmaidens are begging the princess to let them help her. But she's, you know, screaming, no, no, get out. And uh, she's, they're begging her to help. She's telling her she shouldn't do it alone, but she refuses. And uh, it's at this point where she kind of leans on her knees and squeezes and a big gout of blood and you know, like placenta or something comes out and just uh, the fluid. Yeah. It just splashes all over. And it's not long after that, that she manages to squeeze out the babe, which kind of sloughs out. And it seems like she grabs it in her hands, but then she kind of like freaks out and like drops her a little bit and she lands on the ground and isn't moving. And, um, oh, it's, so it's so sad. sad. Gosh. I mean, to have, you know, thank, Goodness that, you know, I didn't, uh, all of our pregnancies and births were, you know, no problems, no complications. Very thankful for that. But yeah. it's still a scary situation oh, yeah. with a good heartbeat and everything normal. So to go through this situation and to deliver a stillborn baby would just be, I mean, so incredibly painful and just heartbreaking. And not to mention all the other things going on in Rhaenyra's life <laughs> with the, the realm and the crowd and the, the her family father being dead, the crown being stolen. Yeah. Her family, you know, are Aegon and Aemond and Helena are her stepbrothers and sister. And they have stolen her crown from her, you know, obviously, and, and my, I agree with her. Uh, they, they've stolen her crown and usurped the throne. So, but to be dealing with, you know, a complicated birth situation that's, she doesn't look that big. You know, as far as pregnancy wise, we've only seen her in these fancy kind of dresses, but like, I don't think there's any way she, I don't, I don't think she would even be six months pregnant. Yeah, probably um, not. I mean, maybe four or five. That's what I was thinking too, like five, maybe. I mean, she's showing, but so, but still very, very premature, even by in today's medical environment, you know, mm -hmm. it takes a lot, you know, for a baby that young to survive, you know, if it's, if it's not stillborn. Yeah. The odds um, are against the baby but, for sure. Yeah. But back in ancient history, like there's um, it, zero yeah. chance, even if it was born alive to, Death sentence. for a baby this young to, to be, but I was, I mean, just super hyper realistic, like they did with the sound. In oh yeah, episode the first scene where she's given six birth. or seven, six. Like we get the visual realization of <laughs> that sound, and it like it was a struggle to get through a rewatch. I didn't fast forward it, but it was like that. I mean, but that's like what that little baby looks like. That is what a baby looks like when it comes out of the womb. I mean, it's it's drenched. It's not all clean and perfect you know like it is a few minutes later although and, i don't think whew. every baby looks like this because i paused and zoomed and looked and this baby looks scaly to me it looks like there are sections of patches of scaly skin on its back and um so 
in in the books, doesn't Rhaenyra give birth to a like a dragon baby, kind of like Daenerys does? Visenya. Right. Yeah, I think according to mush according to mushroom. Um, or it may be one of the, one of the maesters that, that say that I'm not sure, but I, I mean, I, I, I saw that and it very well could be, I don't, you know, it, the hair, the head part looks like just matted hair mm-hmm. It's but on, on the, the back, back that run it right on the baby's back. It wouldn't really make sense. So, I mean, it could have been the, as the baby came out, the handmaidens and midwives sort of kind of are shocked and horror. And I thought that to me, they were, because it was stillborn. It wasn't breathing. It wasn't moving. And they were just horrified that the baby, you know, had died. Yeah. I think it's more it was than stillborn. That. And it may be more than that. Oh, it's, it's, it's bad. It's a really bad situation there. The, even the elder of the midwives turns away. Like this seems like something that sh- they've never seen before. And cause they, they should be hardened to this potential, you know, uh, considering so many births go badly. Um, so I really, I think that, I think it, it was scaly and all screwed up. And um, she kind of picks up the baby and cradles it. And it cuts to Damon then arriving and all the sound is gone from the scene. And it's just mournful music. And Damon stops at the doorway and hangs his head. And she's just sitting alone, cr- cradling the baby. And, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, man, Damon returns to find the, this bad situation. He wasn't there for her when she needed him, when she called for him to help her get through this. And so I'm thinking that it could be this could come back to bite him in the future. Potentially, he might need her and maybe she won't be there for him or something. So this is all a very bad omen, I'm thinking. And. Rhaenyra next is doing the work of wrapping the child up for the funeral for cremation herself while the silent sisters are all standing by around with their with their (laughs) flags on poles on their back and uh so not only is this a bad omen to start off the battle but in addition to that we were specifically told that it's ill luck to look upon the face of of death when Renice was watching Vaman's body being prepared a couple episodes ago, or is that last episode? Mm-hmm. God damn, no, two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this is a double dose of bad luck here. She's looking upon the face of death herself, but it's also symbolizing how she's got to take on all of this burden herself and do, and the way that she's viewing the situation, she's got to do everything. She's got to be the one. Remember she t- when talking with Luceris, she said that she had to, earn her position and earn her air her airhood she's earning it and she's she's doing everything herself and i think it's symbolizing how she feels like she needs to earn the respect of her bannermen and of people by being the one to do stuff herself and proving that that she's she may be a woman you know but she is worthy of the role and so her taking on this herself and doing it herself is another way of symbolizing that in my mind. And, uh, while she's doing this, Damon is alone on the beach with his own moment of sorrow, kind of hanging over his sword, leaning, tilting his head and dealing with sorrow in his own way. And they're separated again. Yeah. Back at right before Rhaenyra, uh, delivered, uh, baby Vicenia, we were getting these flashes of Cyrax. Oh Yeah. How just did like just a millisecond, just that, you know, he's like screaming ah. or, or growling and, and then we'd go back to Rhaenyra screaming, you know, in labor. And we got maybe three or four of those flashes. So I think that's just more of, you know, the showrunners and, and George sort of explaining that there really is this deep, not just psychic, but this like interpersonal, interspecies, emotional heart connection between dragon and dragon rider. Pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. Pretty, pretty epic. And, uh, Cyrax seems to be in anguish herself, you know, mirroring Rhaenyra's anguish. And it's remindful of the moment when Damon is shot with the arrow at the battle of the Stepstones, <laughs> and Caraxes <laughs> screeches in pain immediately. Yeah. yeah. And it's like Cyrax is feeling Rhaenyra's pain, not only physically, but emotionally. Uh, it seems I to think me. one of the producers or somebody in, in after the episode or somewhere, they, the way they put it was that Rhaenyra was at war with her own body. Yeah. Um, 
before the war itself can start, she immediately goes into labor when she learns that they put Aegon on the throne. So crazy. And she's trying to get the baby out, even though it's not time, but she knows something's wrong. So, she, you know, her maternal instinct, you know, is to let her, her, the body, her body has gone into labor and to let her body continue and push through. She's pushing through that so that she can go to the next step of planning what to do next with Damon and her lords and counselors. So she's, you know, she's trying to get through this because she knows something's wrong and because she knows that she, she has a lot of other things, you know, that she has to get done. I mean, she can't fight a war, Mine you know, eight, money. nine months pregnant, eight or nine months pregnant, you know, flying around on Cyrax, uh, roasting the green hosts, roasting the host, host roast. <laughs> toast to the roast. To toast. Host. <laughs> she, she, to- she roasts the green host to toast. Speaking of toasting. Next, we have the cremation scene. Oh, God, that was such a brutal transition. Uh, <laughs> sorry. That's all I mean. what, what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, uh, so, yeah, it cuts to the funeral pyre lit atop a craggy hillside, a hill at Dragonstone, and all the people uh, that are at the castle are in attendance dressed in black. And there are guards posted upon the rocks with spears around them. And Damon and Rhaenyra are standing alone by the a pyre on like an altar type of thing. Um, as they cremate poor baby Visenya, the part dragon, as I'm calling it. <laughs> and, uh, and as I think, and it, it shows people in attendance, but, the camera starts, it shows their three kids, Lucerus, Joffrey, and Jacaris. But the camera starts to, to pan and zoom in towards Lucerus, specifically another hint that he's going to be next, you know, unfortunately. And I didn't catch it the first time, but there's a lot of foreshadowing that Lucerus is in trouble throughout this episode. Yeah. And Damon... You know, it cuts back to Damon and Rhaenyra and she's standing stoically as the fire burns before them and Damon is beside her and he turns to look at her and it seems like he's admiring her strength and poise in this difficult moment um, as he seems to be struggling with it himself and the frames, flames are crackling. And it's at this moment when there's a little bit of a commotion behind them as, as who shows up? Eric with an E. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Suck it, Screen Crush. Uh, no, I'm just Got kidding. Got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, I love Screen Crush. Um, Ryan Airy, but you got this one wrong, Ryan. One in a million. <laughs> and so uh, Eric Cargill the the king's guard starts walking up the slope and he's he's got a a, a man purse <laughs> strapped around him it's with mer- one strap it's a merce yeah merce on the side which he had which he had when he was spiriting Rainies oh. through the streets of King's Landing yeah last good week. catch good catch it just took him so much longer to get here because he didn't have a dragon <laughs> yeah, exactly he, had to go. he his plan he had to go through with his plan yeah which was no plan finding a boat yeah. <laughs> go down to the harbor find a boat let's go into Dragonstone not be, don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> and his uh, Magneto helmet, white cloak and all. Yeah. It's like, why is this random King's Landing guy, Kingsguard guy, sailing to Dragonstone? Hmm. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> so he comes walking up through the crowd and immediately Laurent and the other Kingsguard guy, I can't remember his name. Stefan. Stefan Darklin, Darklin and Laurent. Marbrand. Marbrand. They whoosh, both unsheathed their swords like in unison in synchronized, like synchronized dancers or swimmers or whatever, synchronized swimmers, right? Both the swords come out in a single ringing uh, metal metallic sound. And Eric reassures them, I mean, no harm brothers. (laughs) And he removes his Magneto helmet. And it's at this point when he subjects his cranium to danger, <laughs> you know, that that the other two kings guard are like, hmm, okay, he means it. And they sheathe their swords and step aside, but Damon puts his hand on the pommel of his sword. I like you that. mentioned before. 
And it's at, at this moment that Eric walks forward towards Damon only a couple paces before kneeling and placing his helmet on the ground. And as Rhaenyra turns to watch in curiosity, he takes out King Viserys's crown from his man purse and <laughs> holds it out in front of him. And it's like one of the coolest moments. Yeah, it was really awesome. He um, he has Viser- Jaehaerys and then Viserys crown, and he presents it. And Damon had kind of come down the hill a little bit, and so this is the second time that Damon you know picks up this crown and hands it you know to the rightful person. You know, first with Viserys, you know, yeah, two weeks ago, um, as it fell off his head, and then now um, he turns around. You know, he looks at he again. He kind of looks at it. He looks down at it like he did in the throne room. And it looks like he's in pain, thinking of Viserys and seeing the crown. It like he looks like he's struggling in that moment. Yeah, and like now his brother is gone, and he really could be if he really wanted to and to totally ruin his marriage and family and everything he really could take it if he wanted it Mm -hmm. yeah true because he's the most powerful person there right um with the baddest sword there yeah i mean he'd have a fight but anyway yeah so but before he takes the crown the uh eric swears a new oath Oh, yeah, that's right. So, you know, he told him, yeah, he, okay. Um, he's holding so it. He presents it, you know, and Damon kind of takes it. And he, as he's yeah holding it and presenting it to Damon and Rhaenyra, mm-hmm. you know, he, he uh, I swear to ward the queen with all my strength, give my blood for hers. Take no wife, hold no lands, father no children, which is a lot like the, the Night's Watch oath that we, we got to learn so well uh, in the original series. Night's Watch oath, yeah. Made me think of it too. I shall guard her secrets, obey her commands, ride at her side, ride or die. Eric Cargill is my boy, Ooh. ride or die, Team Black. <laughs> ride or die at her side and defend her name and honor. Then Damon, you know, again, you know, takes the crown, you know, looks at it, uh, turns around and uh, does he, he kneel and presents it or he puts it on her head and then kneels. And then I kneels. Remember. I also loved how Eric just automatically goes into his oath. Like he knows what he's got to do. He knows he's got to swear an oath of loyalty. He doesn't have to be asked. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, Damon had to force yeah. the other two guys at Dragon Point. <laughs> you know, yeah. so awesome. Yeah, not a gunpoint at Dragon Point. Yeah, yeah. Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Woo! Yeah, and as he turns to face Rhaenyra to give her the crown to place on her head that female chanting. Yeah. Huh? Oh. Uh-huh. So that's, you know, as we go forward, I think that's kind of the Rhaenyra theme. Yeah, the Black Queen theme. That's what I was thinking, too. And Absolutely. Damon kneels as he, after he crowns her and says, My queen. And some really regal, royal, triumphant music plays. Yeah, it's really awesome. My queen. But it's still sort of like, it, it's not so, you know, the end of Lord of the Rings where they've defeated Sauron and they crown Aragorn. It's not super triumphant because yeah. they're still at this cremation. A dark so undertone. On the rewatch, yeah, on the rewatch, I was like, it's still the right mood for the situation. It, yes, it's triumphant and it's it brings up everybody from, you know, the death of, of baby Visenya. But it was just, I mean, really just a perfect balance of yeah. triumph, but also this still this kind of darker undertone to the whole score is really great perfect analysis great great articulation of that and as she looks at Damon who says my queen her eyes rise to the rest of the people in attendance and one by one everybody starts kneeling and we see the 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 kids kneel Joffrey and Mm -hmm. Luceris and Jace and then Bela and Raina kneel and everybody's kneeling guys with spears except for the guys who are standing guard still on the perimeter yeah they they keep their heads on the horizon you know you know like taking a drink at a at a river the people who keep their eyes on the horizon are the ones that (laughs) we want on duty Um, yep to make a Jack Carr reference woo Jack Carr woo yeah yeah. Uh, and uh, except the only person who doesn't kneel is Rainice, yeah, because she doesn't Rainice. have Corliss on board yet, but she's gonna manipulate him to make it happen later, <laughs> guilt trip him, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. When she didn't, I was like, 
are they going to have a show like a kneel or die showdown right here? I don't think so. I mean, like it's one of those, oh, she's family. She's cool. She's family. Yeah. Everybody else, you have to kneel. And she's still wearing her armor, symbolizing how her, she's guarding her position at this moment. And uh, yeah, everybody else (laughs) except family, it's okay. (laughs) She's already proved she's not a threat because she could have, you know, sliced Mm -hmm. down Rhaenyra when she was face to face with her before. Got a roll? Back at the map table. Ooh, and we see the inner workings of the map table. Um, somebody yeah. takes like a torch or some kind of, not brazier, but, you know, it's a torch basically, I guess. And lights all these candles and then slides these trays of candles underneath the map table. And it's, you know, piece, you know, section by section, it illuminates, you know, with this Dude. back. It's like a backlit. Uh, keyboard that uh, the whole painted table with uh, and a few times throughout the rest of the episode we we get kind of get a like a wide shot across the room we can see little candle little groups of candles sitting underneath like way below the cert like way down almost at the floor level which i don't think would be bright enough to light the table the way it's lit. I mean obviously it's lit with Hollywood you know lighting <laughs> movie <laughs> yeah, magic yeah, yeah. but but it seems like there had to be candles right like they show in this little section right below the surface, like slid in there. And the little it's, ones in the bottom may just add a little bit of light to it. I don't know. It was a really cool effect. Yeah, really cool. It's like, um, you know, like a fancy jack-o'-lantern design where you cut cut it just so that there's a, you, you take off the exterior oh. skin, but then you whittle down the, the meat so it's just thin enough so that the light shines through it without cutting all the way through. So it seems yeah, like semi. they just cut that wood super thin for like the trenches and the stuff that lights up. Yeah, the rivers, the ocean, however they, whatever they decide, you know, the letters for Winterfell or, you know, that sort of stuff. Really cool. I love how they introduced it too, really as cool. they're grabbing boxes full of the war planning pieces that are going to go on the board. Uh, like, like it's a giant chess board. I saw them open a box and see the little figures in there. And I was like, oh, those are for the map. You know, like, This is so cool. <laughs> yeah, and they've got like, the high, t- the, like the flaming high tower. That was the most obvious one. Some of the ones that they set when they were talking about some of their allies, I couldn't really tell what the symbology was on the little piece. It just looked like a little chess piece with a little like flared. Yeah, I wasn't sure what that one was either. The gold thing at piece. The top. You'd think I would be, you know, it would be a dragon. Or, Maybe it's an emissary. They're, you know, they're sending like a. Yeah, and a few, right. There was like when they were talking about Aaron, Stark, and Baratheon. I guess those are like the unknown, like question mark pieces Mm -hmm. Yeah, for we're sending emissaries. We're going to try to obviously win them to our side. But right now they're undeclared or undecided. Dude, the table looks so glorious. (laughs) So awesome. It it really does. I love that. I want to go back and watch the scenes with Stannis and Melisandre at Dragonstone with the painted table. And then Danny in season seven and eight. Yeah. Um, When the babe, when the shadow demon is uh, conceived. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and see if it doesn't seem like there's that much detail. Obviously, we don't see it lit up like this. I guess this was also lost to history, along with uh, the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy. Yeah. Uh, as to how to light up the painted table. Yeah. Instead of lighting it, they paint it in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the true probably lost to history. They have, don't just don't know about the technique. It's not something you would ever guess, you know, the really creative decision by whoever came up with that idea. Props to them, man. That's so cool. They're placing down swords, grabbing the pieces. Uh, props to the prop department. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice one. So Rhaenyra enters and Damon gives her the full introduction first of her name. Queen of the Andals, Lady of the Seven Kingdoms, which is cool to see the uh, the uh, introduction, the heraldry uh, switched up a little bit. For the first time ever. Yeah. <laughs> Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah. And everyone again bows their heads upon her introduction, except Rainey's, whose allegiance is yet undecided, and she remains in her armor, guarding her position closely. <laughs> Raina shows up asking the queen if she wants wine, as a dutiful cupbearer should. <laughs> and um, yeah, they they push the candles under the table. Every, and then there's this moment where everybody's just standing there waiting for Rhaenyra to take charge. And she's just been th- through so much. And now she's got to be on point. This is her moment. 
she's still earning her position. You know, this is where she's got to show everybody that she's a boss. She's in charge. And she gets right to the, the tactics. What's our standing? And Damon is ready, spitting out things. We have 30 knights, 100 crossbowmen, 300 men at arms. And I'm like, oh my God, that's nothing. That's like nothing. How many, yeah. you know, the, at the field of fire, Balerion oh, killed thousands. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems like all some of those armies were were north of 10,000, like separate armies, the Reach army, the Lannister army from the west. Um, I remember in, in the books of of the main series where I think the Starks are trying to muster, get their numbers up to 10,000 yeah. uh, total army size, you know, to face Tywin and, and his army. Yeah, so, I mean, different battles, there were smaller hosts than that, but total as Rob, we get some of the inside scoop on with through Cat's, Catlin's um, POV chapters is into some of Rob's war councils and stuff. Oh, yeah. But yeah, this is, I mean, it is a small island and, you know, he talks about how it's relatively easy to defend, but like he says, um, as an instrument of conquest, our army leaves a lot to be desired, which is a nice way to put it. A lot to be desired. <laughs> it's like the nicest way you could possibly put it. Basically, they're like a ragtag bunch of like a handful of people, not even a bunch, a handful, a, not even a punch, a pinch, you know, like uh, Donnie Brasco. Instead of a pinch of salt, Al Pacino does a punch of salt. <laughs> There's like a whole bunch of salt into the soup, nice. the gravy that he's cooking up. And uh, so one of the, I think it's the maester is saying, we already have declarations from Keltigar, Staunton, Massey, Darklin, and Bar Emin. So they got word back pretty quickly from Bar Emin and Darklin. And Rhaenyra mentions how her mother was an heir, and Emma, may she rest in peace. And so the veil vale will not turn cloak against their own kin. Emma's direct descendants, River Run, the Tullys, Lady Catelyn Stark's home, was a close friend to uh, Viserys. And so with Damon's permission, the maester already sent ravens to Lord Grover, whose family is Elmo and what's the other one? Uh, Oscar, I think. Oscar. <laughs> the Sesame Street Tullys. Uh, yeah, hilarious. So funny. And um, so... Rhaenyra calls Lord Grover fickle and says that he's easily swayed. And they're using this word a lot too, because remember Rhaenys said it in the garden uh, as well. Um, our house, our house's word is not, not fickle, fickle or something like that. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember, is there like a quick little glance between Damon and Rhaenyra when, when the maester says with Damon's acquiescence, I've sent ravens to Lord Grover. I think so. And she kind of looks over at him, but then stays on because topic. Yeah, nothing was supposed to happen without her command, but yeah. obviously Damon has continued to run things as he see fit. Damon is like Rick James, man. He's a habitual line stepper, you know? <laughs> 100%. 110%. And so uh, he announces that he is going to treat with, with uh, Lord Grover himself because they need to be convinced of the strength of their position, as Rhaenyra said and that they'll support him if it comes to war. Yeah, so um, then one of the Kingsguard knights, uh, Stefan Darklin, um, asks about Storm's Inn and Winterfell. And Bartimus Keltigar kind of seems like they're, besides Damon, you know, seems to be the the next, you know, kind of in charge, or he's giving the most input as to far as the preparations for battle. You got these names down, bro. You're Dude. like, boom, Bartimaeus, Keltigar. <laughs> like, Damn, some, I can't even like, say it. With Reyna, Baina, with Reyna, <laughs> Bela, Lena, those I have the most trouble with, with the Valerian ladies. But Rhaenyra, Rhaenys, Melis, Caraxes, Tyraxes, we get his Maraxes. name, uh, that dragon's name. Uh, Maraxes from the Aegon's Conquest. Yeah. Um, some of the dragon names I struggle with sometimes, but for the most part, like these lords and ladies, as long as it's something un just different, that's not like, you know, Lena, Bela, Reina. Uh, <laughs> My favorite dragon names are the Axes and the Vers, like Vermithor. That's the coolest one. Yeah, Vermithor is really cool. And then Caraxes, Maraxes. Those are cool ass names too. There's some really cool dragon names. Yeah, definitely fun to say. I think some of them were, were named after the old Valyrian gods or Valyrian. Oh yeah, that sounds right. Emperors or something, something like that. Like I can't that. remember. Um, and then Bartimus Keltigar uh, 
gives us some good Stark, uh, big Stark energons. Yeah. Um, there has never lived a Stark who forgot an oath. And with how Stark the North will follow. The North Let's will go follow. Team North. Yeah. Team North. Um, and honestly, oh. I really can't remember, like, I think I remember which way the North goes, but I really, I'm not sure uh, from reading the books, but, and, or the errands. It seems like, obviously, and, and I remember there was trouble at, at, at um, Storm's End, but I couldn't remember if it was with Boros, if he sided with Luke or not, but I remembered the, after the fight afterwards. Um, but in the, as far as the show goes, um, we know that he seems to be favoring the greens, uh, which was yeah. kind of, you know, disappointing, obviously disappointing to me, but like, I was thinking that he, because of Boromund and the connection with Rainey's that he would go with the blacks, but he hasn't. Lord so Boros Galifianakis, as uh, Corey Eugene said. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. I saw the first part of that feedback. The <laughs> last High Gardener with a zinger. There's never lived a Stark who's forgotten an oath. So that was pretty cool. So good, dude. That was, that was a great line. Just shows you, like, the honor of Stark, you know? I mean, he says that, and then Rhaenyra says, oh, the veil, the errands of the veil won't go against their own kin, and uh, Lord Boros Baratheon will need to be reminded of his father's promises. But as we see, that doesn't work out as far as the Baratheons go. Uh, yep. Hopefully, at, in the beginning of season two, we'll, I want to see some of Jace's travels to yeah, the Vale of Aaron and to, to Winterfell and to see how that goes. Man, it'd be so good to be back at Winterfell. Absolutely. We haven't gone anywhere North of King's Landing, I don't think. We've been to Driftmark, Dragonstone, and King's Landing. And we saw a little bit of Pentos with, with Damon and uh, Lena. And just a great hall girls. of Storm's End during the marriage tour. Yeah, Storm's End and Heron, a little tiny bit of Heron Hall. So we haven't gone north of Heron oh, yeah, Hall, Heron hall right. uh, this season. But, um, you know, definitely should be more, I think, expansive story, you know, ge geography-wise next year or next year. Next season, you know. And with each one of these houses that they mention, they place a piece on the board, at least one, to describe what actions need to be taken in regards to them. So I love how this map table is playing a big role in this, you know? Like, it was just kind of in the background, something you have sex on every once in a while in Game of Thrones. <laughs> but in this, yeah, it's like, I mean, it Danny, has meaning. Right, and at the end of six, you know, Danny is sailing uh, west uh, across the narrow sea to Dragonstone, but then she gets there at the beginning of season seven, and there's a few different scenes with her and Tyrion and some of her advisors. Oh yeah, kind of looking at the map, looking at the painted table, and trying to decide what they're going to do. Shall we begin that scene where she's exactly. looking at the territory? Exactly how to how to conquer uh, the seven kingdoms but, all over like, it's again. <laughs> really getting really getting used now like with lots of different people moving the pieces around and it's really cool too it's almost a character in and of itself yeah it really is it's really cool so yeah Rhaenyra talks about uh, Boros Baratheon will need to be reminded because it was Boromund Baratheon who was at the tourney in episode one and I was going to ask you when still with young Rhaenyra when we were at Storm's End and the fight broke out between the Bra Blackwoods and Brackens was that Boromund or Boros? That was Boromund. Who was with... Okay, so mm -hmm. OG Baratheon. Yep, yep. And then um, Rhaenyra kind of turns around and, and looks at uh, Rhaenys and says, what news from Driftmark? And so we learned that Corlys uh, sails for Dragonstone because before yes. the last time we had talked about them, he had left Evenfall, but Rhaenys wasn't sure where he was headed. But he's coming to Dragonstone and Damon kind of interjects to declare for the queen. Absolutely. To kind of <laughs> try to manifest, you know, his will as, uh, for yeah. what needs to happen. Because if they can get the Valerian fleet, that is a huge, huge uh, strategic and tactical advantage that they have to have. They have to. Uh, to win the war. Um, the Valerian, uh, Rhaenys kind of comes back to Damon. The Valerian fleet is in my husband's yoke which is a cool way to say, you know, yeah. his, under his control, he decides where they sail. Lots of great verbiage this whole season 
Exactly. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's lots of cool vocabulary and vernacular for for this time. Um, so Damon is kind of being a little bit pushy or a lot pushy with, with uh, talking about the Valerians. Obviously, Rainey's is right there. Um, and Rainey's kind of g- jabs him back a little bit verbally. But Rhaenyra is trying to you know, keep the peace and like we don't want to offend the people that we're trying to win to our side. So, so Rhaenyra tries to calm things down a little bit. We shall pray for both you and your husband's support, just as we pray nightly. She's reminding yeah. me uh, they've play, prayed nightly for the sea snake's return to good health. Like we really care. Um, we hope you care about us too. Right, exactly. <laughs> and obviously she restates the importance of the Valerian fleet. Nobody on the narrow sea would would dare to uh, to make an enemy out of the enormous, I want to see the, like Danny's fleet as she sails west at the end of six. I want to see the Valerian fleet in all its, like in glory. All its might. Yeah. yeah. In all its glory. She's so um, sick. So, and the, is it Danny or, yeah, I think it's Danny, or I'm sorry, not Danny, uh, Rainier, <laughs> Targaryen queen. Man, that look at the end is like a Danny look, a mad Targaryen woman. Don't mess with them. Don't mess with um, them. Um, asks in our enemies. Um, and then, is it Damon that says we have no friends among the Lannisters? Um, um I think it's Damon who's, who's yeah, he talks about specifically about Tylan. Tylan has served Otto, you know, way too long to turn against him. Mm-hmm. And Otto obviously needs the Lannister fleet. But here's the thing about the Lannister fleet. It's on the wrong side of Westeros. Yeah. There is no like the Viking Viking, the Ironborn longships can kind of penetrate deep into the continent on the rivers, but there is no passage, you know, no uh, northwest passage to get through the continent, like the Panama Canal. They'd have to sail down around the Horn of Africa. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. All the way, all the way down by Old Town, around through Dorne, through the Broken Arm and the Stepstones, which we learn uh, is something really awesome has happened there later. Yeah. Um, but the Lannister fleet, I mean, they may, I'm sure they have some ships here and there, you know, but going back and forth to Pentos and Bravos and different places. But the strength of the Lannister fleet is mainly going to stay, you know, on the west side of Westeros, you know, near Lannisport and their other ports over there to always kind of be on guard against the reaving ways of the Ironborn. So, I mean, obviously a lot of time is going to pass for them to move, but if the narrow sea is totally controlled from the Stepstones north, then the Lannister fleet is... They'll get blockaded at the Stepstones and they're useless. Exactly. So that's, that's very important. Very. Um, but he does have a fleet. And the red, in the time of the original series, the Red Wines have the most formidable fleet uh, in as far from the Westerosi lords that are I always kind of Ironborn. fighting. Well, we, well, the Ironborn are basically anti-Westeros. They're always fighting and reaving oh, the yeah, Westerosi lords and ladies. So, but as far as the main lords and ladies, the houses of Westeros, the red wines are, have the fleet that everybody's trying to get and use for their, whatever's go, their war, basically. R.I.P. Um, Ryan Redwine. Yeah. OG, OG. Uh, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Um, so, you know, pretty interesting how the naval side of, of the war is going to play out. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, then another person says, uh, without the Lannisters, uh, that they probably won't find any friends or allies west of the Golden Tooth, which I'm trying to remember if that's like a passage or, or just, I think it's a place, like a fortress hmm. somewhere along the Gold Road or the West Road, whatever yeah, I'm it's not called. sure there, but it's a cool word, cool phrase. You know? <laughs> um, I think there's a battle or something near Golden Tooth um, where Rob, there's Whispering Wood where Rob wins a victory. And it seems like something else happens at Golden Tooth. Hmm. I can't and, but maybe when, when, uh, Rob's army is based at River Run. There's some kind of trickery at play that Rob's trying to do, but somebody messes it up. I can't remember ah. the mountain or something. So anyway, go read the books. They're great. Yeah. Um, and Dan, so, read you know, the books. they, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, and Damon agrees that, you know, they're, they're definitely probably won't find any friends or allies west of gold, the golden tooth out there in the Westerlands. And, and Damon agrees with that. And he knows what every commander in Westerosi history knows. The Riverlands are essential. Like everything, you know, the final battle with Robert and Rhaegar right there on the Trident. Right there at the Ruby Ford. Mm -hmm. That's where it all happened. Heron Hall was built there, you know, for a reason. You know, here, like Tywin uses Heron Hall 
to house his host at different points. The choke point, right? Um, and then there and then further north at the neck. Um, yeah, yeah. Where um, the Kranig men live. The bog men. There's every, everybody, you know, the, the, the houses from the south are going to come north. The northern houses are going to, and the neck are going to come down. The houses from the east and west, from the, the, uh, the Vale and the Lannister, Lannister lands, the Westerlands, they're all going to meet in the Riverlands. And the, the books do a really good job of showing how just ravaged and destroyed the Riverlands become through the course of the war. Um, between Rob and Tywin and Joffrey, you know, Joffrey, Ta- Tywin is fighting for Joffrey. But uh, it's, you know, Damon knows that if they can, you know, get a toehold, he actually says that word in a minute. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Instead of foothold. Um, yeah, <laughs> foothold. So it's not even a toehold. It's a tiny, we just need a little toehold <laughs> um, uh, to get to the, in the Riverlands. But then uh, Keltigar kind of speaks up and says, uh, forgive me for being so blunt, your grace, but all this talk of men and armies, crossbowmen, knights, mounted knights, it means nothing compared to the dragons. The dragons. And I'm like, for real? Like, Let's go. Um, your cause owns a power that has not been seen in this world since the days of old Valyria. So many dragons. We got dragons on top of dragons on top of dragons. We got... <laughs> Dragons everywhere. And uh fried dragons, makes a wild good point. dragons, <laughs> dragon shrimp, <laughs> you know, bubble grump. <laughs> yeah. Um Rainier makes a good point. Like the Greens have dragons as well. And one of them is might be unbeatable. Uh unless you literally get like a five on one situation. Oh, uh, God. Vagar is enormous. So they have three, but one of them is is absolutely worth yeah. you know. And we saw how easily Vagar took care of uh, Arax. So that's... It's crazy, dude. In this part, Damon is like, they have three adults by my count. And I'm like, uh, Damon, <laughs> Vagar counts as like six adults, dude. The way Damon is yeah, underestimating real. Vagar here in the count is highly ominous to me. Potential foreshadowing of him underestimating Vagar in the future and it you know, being problematic. Uh, I think so. Really, really, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, he, you know, he feels confident in their position, you know, which is true. They do have the numbers of dragons, but not all dragons are equal by a long shot. By a long and, shot. Uh, and they have Vermithor, which might be a kind of a secret weapon. He needs a rider, but nobody else really can compare. Oh. Even even Caraxes, I think, or Cyrax, uh, size-wise and age and experience, yeah, not even close. I don't think can really contend with with just the size and power of Vagar. Are they going to get Reyna on Vermithor? Are they going to like? I really, I really it think so. somehow. I really Next time think so. it'll be uh, you know Damon goes in singing his song, doing his jig, dancing. Next time it'll be Damon and Reyna singing a duet. You know, <laughs> harmonizing right, yeah. with each other and counterpoint. Turn it, <laughs> turn it into a little, a little music, a little mini musical inside of uh, Hot D yeah. season two. And she climbs on up, and he started. Na- he starts kind of naming them, and uh, it was a pretty funny moment here. He says, uh, "We have Cyrax, Caraxes, and Melis, and Rainy, and still Rainy is hasn't declared any, <laughs> hasn't declared for anybody." And Rainy's like, "Does this look? It's like, do we have that's my minutes? dragon, son? What you talking about?" <laughs> that's my but Damon is Damon is kind of assuming, you know, he's assuming that oh, they don't, the other side only has three adults, and we're assuming that Melis is on our side. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just kind of keeps on going, and and it was just a funny look of uh, that Rainy's kind of gave. It's like. I totally uh, missed what? that. That's hilarious. That's my dragon. Yeah, that was really good. Um, you know, they say your sons have Vermax, Arax, and Tyraxes. New which one. is the first time that we have uh, little baby Joff's dragon. Bela has Moondancer. First which mention of that too, right? Be, all these are pretty small. Vermax is bigger than Arax. Moondancer is probably bigger than Arax and Tyraxes. Um, I wish they would have said if, if Joffrey has claim Tyraxes or if it's a hatchling riding it because if he's only six we never really get the exact passage of time with Danny and how old the dragons are as and in relation to how their size as the story the story just kind of grows along and we go back to Danny and it's been like two years and the dragons are a little bit bigger and then they're a lot bigger and then they're huge um so 
I, would, I wonder if Tyraxes is even, if Joffrey has even ridden him yet. He seems small, but the 14 year olds are flying dragons to storms in, in the middle of a thunderstorm. So yeah. Anyway, Rhaenyra tries to kind of bring Damon back down to reality a little bit. <laughs> uh, Damon, none of our dragons have been to war. Uh, and he says, they're also unclaimed dragons. Sea smoke still resides on Driftmark, which if what we think we know about dragons is true, sea smoke is going to be pretty useless unless I think, unless Lenor comes back, um, which is he's impossible. alive versus the books versus the books. They say he's like totally dead. But so then sea smoke would be available too. there is speculation that Lenor may be another character in the books from some, from what I hear. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, I've heard a little bit about that too. So really interested to see what happens with that. Imagine that Lenor's triumphant return. And like as like a Deus Ex Machina in a battle where all seems hopeless, and then sea smoke comes it, flying through. It's with, definitely with possible. Laying on top, like woo, pod racing. Woo, <laughs> this is what I call dragon racing. Yeah. Uh, uh, on the fifth day, look to the east for my return. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> totally. Uh, Gandalf, 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 Ex Machina, sea smoke. Um, Permathor and Silverwing dwell on the dragon mount, still riderless. And then there are three wild dragons, all of whom nest there on Dragonstone in the dragon mount, I assume. Uh, and But Rhaenyra with the key question, and who is to ride them? And it cuts to so, Raina at this point, who's kind of like, ooh. Yeah, absolutely. Because her egg hasn't hatched. I wrote down, in my notes, I wrote down as he's naming Vermithor and Silverwing, right then the camera cuts to Raina. Yeah. Before Rhaenyra asks... Uh, who is to ride them? Yeah, that sounds so, right. So I, I think I think Reyna, she may choose Silverwing because that was Queen Alisane's dragon versus Vermithor. But if I was her, I'd choose the biggest, baddest dragon I could. Yeah. Plus, people should encourage her to because that's what we need. Yeah. If, if Vermithor has a little bit of size on Silverwing, I'd say go, go for that one. You know. It does, who cares if it's the king's dragon or the queen's dragon yeah, from, yeah, from yeah. your great grandparents? Just find the biggest dragon you can and learn how to fly that baby. As far as dragon names go, it does not get any cooler than Vermithor. It's like a mixture of vermin and Thor, the Norse god. Vermithor. <laughs> it's like the coolest, yeah. coolest name. Really cool. So, so yeah, I'm thinking maybe she'll choose Silverwing, but... Maybe because of its how it's beautiful or different stuff, but like I, I can't remember at all from the books who, if anybody gets from Thor at all, who uh, Raina gets. I have that's, that'll be a total surprise to me. I don't remember at all, but <sighs> definitely. But any so, if Damon had illegitimate children run around Dragonstone, mm. they they might have blood of the dragon. If any other old like. Random other uncles and cousins in the Targaryen family, like all you know, Alisane and Jaehaerys, they had kids. They had kids everywhere. Oh. Uh, besides Viserys' father and mother, so they could go on a recruiting um, tour around. The, so uh, I mean, there could. I mean, the Targaryen. We're focused on this one little part of the Targaryen family tree because Viserys became king, and then it's all what's underneath him, with Randy's kind of out here to the side. But there's a lot of other potential dragon riders out there. I mean, the Celtigars, if they're from old Valyria, is that enough for them to be dragon riders? Or do they have to have the special Targaryen, yeah. Valyrian? Well, not all, not all Valyrians were dragon rider families. Right. And, and the Valyrians that we know in this story that are dragon riders are Rhaenys children. So the, these Valyrians get their dragon rider blood from Rainey's Targaryen. Interesting. Yeah. So they have a different last name because of the mother and the father and who was who. But anyway, probably the Celtigars are probably not going to be dragon riders, but hey, at least they're in the show. <laughs> Crab people. Crab people. Crab people. Um, let's see. Wild dragons. Dragonstone has 13 to their four. Yeah. Rhaenyra says, who is to ride them? And like Damon is answering none of her questions. <laughs> <It's kinda> like, <laughs> he just keeps talking faster. And she's the queen. And this is like the war council. Uh, Dragonstone. Oh, this script is kind of, it's kind of ridiculous. Oh, the transcript. Uh, Cause it says dragon's tone. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think it seems, <laughs> almost seems like this script, somebody like voice to text it. Yeah. And that's what like, they, I'm pretty sure that's how it was done. Yeah. It doesn't speak uh, George R.R. R. Martin. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's a transcript, not a script. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was writing uh, synopses of the all the original books, like chapter by chapter. And my phone learned to like auto correct and like to give you the little suggestions for like Baratheon, Targaryen, Winterfell, all kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> my phone just suggests dirty things for me to type. <laughs> <laughs> That's all my phone but, yeah, there's, there's all these. Uh, here, anytime I ty- type in H-A-R, even to this day on a different phone, but it's like been copied. Oh, right. The, all, you know how you can copy your iPhone to the new phone now? It's all your like, settings it still and stuff knows. Saved. A lot of the like hair, like it, 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 I say, I see it all the time. I don't know why to write this like H A R or H A R R. It's, it's like Loop Heron Hall with a capitalization and everything. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's like, I have a hilarious. problem. My phone knows. <laughs> my phone, my phone text, uh, predictive text knows how to speak uh, a song of ice and fire. It's badass. But Dragon's tone uh, has thirteen to their four, which I was trying to figure. Who's number four? Maybe Darren. Because Aegon, uh, I always forget their their dragon names, but we we named them last week. So go back and listen to last week's episode. <laughs> Aegon has his. Uh, hey, De- oh, Helena has hers. Her name is the other one that I struggle Dream with. Dreamfire. And then Aemond obviously has uh, Vagar, but it's got to be Baby Daron, who's in Old Town. He Ooh, must have yeah, a hash Because he they say four, and I was like, I've been counting three. I was like, Allison ain't got one. <laughs> Otto ain't got one. We hope. Uh, bro. So I cannot remember what happens to Otto. Ooh, I can't remember. That must mean all. he's going to survive and end up on the throne. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go team green. I just, <laughs> I really want to like, like how, I, how much I was rooting for Cersei to have a terrible demise. And I was disappointed with it. <laughs> oh, and see, that it. was my biggest was so good. disappointment in season eight was how easily she died. Oh, man. Oh, crushed by bricks. But, I mean, overall, I mean, I'm glad she died, but... I thought it was so poetic. I really want to see what happens to Otto. It was very poetic, but it wasn't brutal and die screaming. True. But pretty crazy. 13 versus four. And a score, like, I rewound that, like, four times. Did he say a dozen or three, a a half dozen? He said a score. I always forget what a score is. Is 20? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, four score and seven years ago is uh, 87, four score and seven. Yeah, it's 87 years ago. <laughs> I always get um, score confused with Fortnite, which is two oh, weeks, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yep, 14 days or, or two weeks. A score of eggs incubating in the dragon mine. Oh. Um, and here's where he says, now we need a place to gather a toehold large enough to house a sizable <laughs> host and dragons. He didn't say that. Yeah. A toehold, you know, in the the mainland of Westeros, to a place to uh, basically be home base uh, for their uh, big enough to hold their dragons and a sizable host. Because right now their host, their army leaves a lot to be desired as an instrument of conquest. But they're trying to improve that. If they can get the north behind them, it's a good place for the the north, the northern army, to come down the King's Road through the neck down to Harrenhal and. Uh, meet up with uh, the black ho- uh, the existing black host. Uh, so Heron Hall is, is Damon's first choice of uh, the place that they want to kind of set up shop. Um, and it cuts off the West and kind of surround. They can, that way they can keep the Western Lannister armies away from King's Landing and uh, surround King's Landing with the dragon. Um, and Damon, Damon has this all gamed out and played out. And uh, he said, we can have every green head mounting, mounted on spikes before the moon turns. <laughs> and you know Which, me. I, mean, I guess I love those spikes. So I was all for this. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> heads on spikes. Heads on spikes. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm thinking they're talking about uh, he's talking about a full turning of the moon. So basically a month or you, is it you thinking of half of that? From it to turn to full to a new moon. Yeah, good question. Is I think it a means month when they say most. A moon, right, yeah, right. I think they mean the full, like from wherever it is now, yeah, all the way to the opposite and back, meaning a full turning of the moon. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, I think, or otherwise, otherwise they'd say a fortnight if it was just two weeks. True, so, true, true. But it, I mean, it's going to take a month to get the armies in place. Um, I love this. Part. They can do a lot with the dragon, but. The uh, the greens have dragons too, so they need the land the the 
I'm trying to think of another way to say the land ground army, forces, the, the ground forces to, you know, be a place to, to see, to besiege King's Landing. Yeah. And since there are dragons at play on both sides, they need to be extra strategic about the whole situation. I freaking love this dude. Damon's got the whole thing gamed out. Like you said, he's got all the angles. He's got the, got the plan. I'm like, woo, go Damon. Heads on spikes. Um, this is what, this is what he was figuring out while Rhaenyra was uh, trying to give birth. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Although, and also he's clearly speaking out of turn since, uh, since this is Rhaenyra's moment, you know, and she's, she's growing more frust- frustrated with him every time this happens. And, and, um, He's, as he steals her momentum, you know, she sits there and she's like, it's like she's about to open her mouth. And then Damon starts speaking and, blah, 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 and everyone's paying attention to him. And, um, you know, I was watching an interesting video last night by this guy, Blurredly, on YouTube, who broke down the Damon situation really well. And um, remember how I was saying that Damon is, has difficulty handling emotional stuff? Like when we saw him, when he showed up at Viserys' bedside and it, he hesitated before even entering past the, the, um, the dangling, sh- the, the curtain and thought you were approaching say dangling his participle. <laughs> participle. <laughs> I was going to say dangling participle. Sorry. The dangler. Yeah. He, he hesitates before passing through the curtain and actually approaching Viserys in his his ill state and it was really hard for Damon to handle that I, I this is the way I perceived it based on his acting and he he instead of addressing the emotional situation head on he jumps straight into why they're there we you know we need you to make your claim for Rhaenyra and Rhaenyra was like what are you serious you know but um so Damon I think is is highly emotional and he has to hide this by refusing to confront certain things head on. Otherwise, he risks breaking down in front of everybody, which he can't have because he has to maintain his uh, his his public persona, essentially. And so, yep. as I learned from this video, I had forgotten this. Damon's mother, and this is this plays into why, particularly, he was so. Uh, hesitant to be in, in the birthing chamber and why he wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't think about it, wouldn't address her, wouldn't answer her calls, scolded Sir Laurent for even suggesting about it with a, with this snarl. Um, Damon's mother dialed during childbirth. Uh, Did you say dialed? <laughs> Damon's mother died during childbirth, uh, one of his younger siblings. And so he was traumatized by that experience from early on in childhood. And then Viserys's wife died in childbirth, further traumatizing Damon because he saw Viserys's visceral reaction to that. And then Lena died during childbirth. <laughs> well, got roasted by a dragon when the baby wouldn't come out. Close enough. All right. And so Still, now, yeah. who, who he'd been angling for Rhaenyra the whole time because he really loved Rhaenyra. And so now the idea that Rhaenyra could could die in childbirth as well, it's like it's too much for him to even handle. He can't handle it. So he 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 refuses to to con- confront the emotional uh, situation head on. And he just has to go straight into the planning because otherwise he, he might just smash into a bazillion pieces. Effectively, he has, uh, so in, in the book version, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate in the TV show. They didn't really accentuate how much he loved Lena. Apparently in the books, he doted on her a lot. And when she got is having this problem with the birth. He flew all around and gathered up the, as many maesters as he could and attached them to his dragon and flew back to Dragonstone where uh, I think, I think that's where she was at this point where he flew back to where Lena was only to find her dead before he could get the help that he needed. Oh, and uh, so it really affected him like the danger of the birthing bed uh, he has extreme PT- PTSD over this these types of situations. So, um, basically, he's really emotionally fragile, which you wouldn't guess from his steely exterior. But that's the point. He's trying to preserve that steely exterior to to maintain his public image of being a big badass. And uh, I think it's embarrassing to him that he's actually like a you know somewhat emotional, emotionally fragile, and so. Uh, 
after the birth, remember, he goes out and he sort of has his breakdown on the beach. He he finally allows himself to feel and he gets away from everybody around him. So there aren't any witnesses and he just loses his shit on the beach. Um, thankful that Rhaenyra is alive, but, you know, sad. He, now he's lost a mother, a wife, a sister-in-law and a child to the birthing bed. And uh, it's just, you know, it's really hard for him. And so he he just has to handle it his own way. And um, thanks to Blurredly for pointing that out on YouTube. It is a really good video. I recommend his channel. Yeah. It, if anything, that his scene where he he goes in to see Rhaenyra, but she's she's sitting there and she's well, but obviously the you know the baby was stillborn, and but he can't even go to her in that moment. Uh, so he you know he goes out down to the to the beach and 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 breaks down and if anything that was like they didn't show enough of that i don't think they i mean it was a very quick little sequence where yeah. he walks out to the beach and then he's standing there with a sword and then on to the next scene so if the scene had lingered there a little bit more and i mean you're paying Matt Smith, exactly if you're paying matt smith so <laughs> <laughs> Let, let, and I'm sure they filmed more and tons of stuff gets left on the, the cutting room floor yeah. as the, the editing process happens. But man, just even if it's like 10 or 20 more seconds of Matt Smith, just, you know, in despair. Yeah, it was a short there, enough you know, episode. Crying and yeah. And yeah, it was only like an hour and 10 or 11 minutes. So not even. It was not 59 s- minutes. Oh, I thought maybe last week wasn't. I, I thought there was one uh, that was an hour and 10 or hour and 11, somewhere in there. Something. But still, <laughs> anyway, they... I mean, that definitely gives you know a lot of insight and background you know into Damon and the issues that he has and the way he deals with them is just retreating with you know internally into himself and keeping all all of it pent up you know He's until just he, trying to hold it together you know <laughs> right until he you know just chokes his wife and it's like bro chill, ch- chill out you need to find another <laughs> uh, avenue to vent your frustrations whether it's beating up a messenger or something else. Yeah, very Anakin of him. No! Let's her go! Demon. <laughs> the, um, is it Sir Laurent Marbrand that comes in with the news about the uh, a lone galleon flying a banner of a three-headed dragon? It's Eric, because as Damon is explaining uh, the the okay. the tactical situation and how they can surround King's Landing and get the heads on spikes, uh, this is when some dude wearing a, a gambeson, which is <laughs> that under under armor type of uh shirt thing with the quilted leather um i had initially been thinking jerkin which is what you had thought also in our chat but right. sir matthew pointed out that it's called a gambeson so i was right about it starting with a g but wrong about what i thought it was <laughs> so it was just yeah, I was lucky thinking like I was right. g jerkin j yeah. jerkin you know they have that both have that same sound i guess mm-hmm. a jerkin's more just like a tight fitting usually leather sleeveless kind of a vest but yeah, without anyway, the padding and stuff. Pretty cool. But yeah. So this, if they're going to go forward with this uh, heraldry, this uh, a change from the books, because in the books, Aegon's Aegon two here, uh, his sigil is a golden dragon on a black field, as oh, opposed right. to the traditional the traditional Targaryen sigil red. of uh, a red dragon. I say a, dra- a three headed dragon on a black field. Um, so, uh, we were thinking in the live maybe, or I don't mean you chatted about it or something, but that maybe this is just auto ship that has a three headed green dragon. But if he's coming as an envoy of King Aegon, why would he not use King Aegon's her, uh, new gold dragon heraldry? And we saw that, that gold dragon heraldry on the background at the coronation mm-hmm. and his, his, uh, outfit was mostly black, but when the light hit it a certain way, it looked kind of golden or bronzish the dragon on his chest. So yeah. Interesting that, that Otto comes here in under the flying a banner of a three headed green dragon. Yeah. I was thinking maybe it's me. like the hands individual Targaryen logo well, because sigil, of the kind of mini sigil. But green is not green. technically a high tower color. It's just their war color. So it's interesting. Like you said, it's, it's strange. Uh, back to Damon just for a split second. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you, the, how you were saying, it's unfortunate they didn't show more of his breakdown on the beach. It's also unfortunate they didn't show more of the dynamics with um, with Lena and his two daughters with her because apparently he's 
he really likes them you know, a lot more, it seems, in the books. And they kind of left out a lot of the emotional connection between them in this. And so it 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 only it makes him seem a lot more callous than he uh, potentially is. But, uh, you know, he's like, yep. <laughs> he's like, really, I just on the verge of breaking down and has to emotionally wall himself off and just think about something else. Think about something else. We got men over here. We got dragons here. We can, so, you know, it's pretty brutal. Um, and, you know, at this news, Damon is, you know, again, he's already on high alert. Yeah. But he's like, all right, alert the watchtower, sight in the skies. They're looking for dragons, looking for an attack. He's assuming they'll, they'll attack by stealth, if anything. Yep. But this could obviously just be, uh, uh, a distraction, a diversion for, you know, some other nefarious plots yep. uh, by the Greens. So he wants everybody on high alert as uh, they go out to meet Otto Hightower. And again, as Damon speaks up immediately, giving orders, Rhaenyra is left silent and overlooked. And the camera cuts on her as the scene ends. And she's just standing there kind of looking around as as everybody's following Damon's orders and she doesn't say anything as he stepped in front of her effectively, not physically, but spoke out over her voice to, uh, to start issuing commands immediately. Yeah. And so next it cuts to showdown version two on the Dragonstone bridge, <laughs> just like the last time after Damon had stole the egg with the with Otto and the King's guard and some soldiers walking along up the bridge and Damon and coming maester, down from the opposite side. Maester. Oh yeah, Orwiles with him. True. Yeah, they're always bringing the Grand Maester. I think the show puts him in certain points so that it makes sense that the history books oh. knew about this encounter and wrote about it. There you go. That makes perfect sense. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. Because uh, Grand Maester Melos was at the first encounter and now Orwile is here. So interesting that the Maesters come along to these. And we we had heard that Damon that Damon's wife was that he was planning on marrying Miss Arya and she was pregnant. Something the Maester would have heard by being at that confrontation on the bridge in the first place. Yeah. So, so, so Damon and, and his guys uh, to include uh, three uh, King's Guard now Queen's Guard are uh, on his side of the bridge, and Otto walks up. And I, on the rewatch, I was trying to watch pretty closely. I only see one King's Guard on Otto's side with a Magneto helmet. And the rest looked to me to just be, you know, regular men at arms. Could you tell if there was an, so I don't think Crispin was here. Yeah, I don't think he was either. Um, he's probably guarding Alicent. Um, I did not, I don't recall exactly what the situation was on the bridge. Um, yeah, I missed the exact head count. <laughs> So, yeah, so if, if Stefan Darkland, Laurent Marbrand, and E. Eric Cargill were there with Damon, that's three. And if A. Eric was there on the other side with Otto, that's four. Crispin makes five. Harold Russelling makes six. So there's one more Kingsguard that we haven't met at all um, this year. But that pretty much accounts for everybody because Harold Russelling is in the wind. Crispin is with uh, with his girl, Allison. And... Uh, and the, but the two twin brothers are on opposing sides of the bridge here, so yeah. that was, was pretty, pretty uh, impactful and you know potentially, fr I mean frightening and you know like they talk about the American Civil War, brother fought brother, father fought yeah, son, exactly. And it's pretty crazy here that uh, the Greens and the Blacks have split up the Cargill Cargill twins. Yeah, there's one moment where I think um, Damon says, "Sir Eric, bring me Sir Otto, so that I can have the pleasure myself." And I think then it cuts to Eric on the other side, who's like, "Oh," and readies himself for potential conflict with his brother. It's like, "Oh my God, dude, that's so intense!" Crazy. <laughs> yeah, I think that probably must be a you, you know a U.S. Civil War reference. That's what I was thinking as well. Um, Otto says, I come at the behest of the Dowager Queen Allison. So I think that's the name, the title that I had come up with last week. Yeah. So we talked about Regent. Um, but since she had uh, lost, she, she's now a widow um, and the king had died. So Dowager Queen um, Allison, <clears throat> mother of King Aegon, second of his name, titles, 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 titles. <laughs> um, he's been told to only deliver his message directly to Princess Rhaenyra. 
Well, that's impossible. So right, and, and I love her line when when he try when Otto tries to to uh, spit that nonsense here in a minute. Uh, I'm Queen Rhaenyra now. Yeah. <laughs> she just, just just says it so plainly, and uh, Otto says, "Where is the princess?" And Damon just kind of stands there looking, and right on cue. But in this case, Cyrex has as her rider right on cue. Cyrex you know, swoops down, and it seems like she does an extra lap around everybody that yeah. she did in. Uh, because her intro in uh, episode two was they were kind of underneath the clouds and oh, kind of yeah. swooped up over everybody Misty. and then circled around and landed. I think this time she kind of did an extra little the domin the domination lap. Yeah, um, <laughs> you've been dominated. Um, <laughs> and the one thing I, if I was Princess Rhaenyra, the one thing I would have done is I would have had Maylis, uh the biggest dragons that I could, probably Maylis and Vermax continually circling this whole encounter. She comes in and flies around with Cyrax, probably the biggest one. Well, maybe least I guess is probably bigger than Cyrax. Anyway, circle around. Uh, she lands behind them again. Uh, and this in the, in episode two, Rhaenyra was on Otto's side trying to bring Damon to heel. Yeah. She lands behind him and walks up through the crowd of allies towards Damon. Right. And now she lands behind them and Cyrax is just ah, super intimidating, even more like angry and, and just, just pissed off than uh, Cyrax was in episode two. Oh yeah. And now she walks through a whole host of enemies, traitors <laughs> to the realm. She calls them extreme uh, in, in power here. move within sword yeah, range. With you know? Yeah, exactly. With Viserys crown on her head. Yeah, like you um, wouldn't which dare Otto's touch probably me gotta with be like, Cyrax there. Exactly. Otto's got to be like, wait, what? Oh, how, that's Viserys crown. How? What? Yeah. Uh, how did he? He how probably puts it that? together as he. Yeah, as he sees E. Eric on the other side, he probably figures that he looks at Eric and he how, doesn't say say it. But he, oh, sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, I think you know he he probably sees Eric over there and figures that's probably how Rhaenys got out of the Red Keep. And how the crown got stolen. Yeah, he didn't say it, but I imagine him looking at Eric and be like, I told you to bring the the prince to me, you bastard. And now you just abandoned us completely. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> and uh, he, he's, you know, they're probably considering like, oh, we, we could take her out and end the claim of the blacks entirely. We could completely eliminate their claim, you know. Uh, well, I guess it would move to... Uh, to Cirrus, so no, I guess it wouldn't. But it would cost them their lives, even if they tried to, because the second they come down on her with steel, they're met with dragon fire from just the, the Cyrax is just itching. Yeah, itching for say, fire. Yeah, get, like Damon, say it. Just give me a say reason. Please, yeah, yeah, just yeah. give me a reason. Um, so then, um, Otto greets her, Princess Rhaenyra. I'm Queen Rhaenyra now, and uh, and you are all traitors to the realm. <clears throat> uh, Otto, you know, continue, you know, continues to call him King Aegon, second of his name, you know, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I had a funny uh, little reaction here. When, I'm Queen Rhaenyra now. I heard, I'm the captain now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they need to put Rhaenyra on, the, on that meme that says, I am the queen now. Um, <laughs> But Otto, Otto is telling, you know, is acting like he's coming in good faith. Um, King Aegon in his wisdom and desire for peace, which we know he's just a twat. So they're, you know, they're giving him all these uh, traits and characteristics that are just. From he and Allison, mostly they're Allison. Just, yeah, exactly. Is offering terms. Acknowledge him as king's or obeisance before the Iron Throne. And in exchange, his grace will confirm your possession of Dragonstone, which is. You know, again, like Allison promising uh, Driftmark to Rainey's last week, they already have Dragonstone and they have 13 dragons to defend it. So <laughs> whether you confirm is their possession or not, and I get it, they're just that would be if they chose peace instead of war. We'll they let would you just keep be re be exactly reconfirming that um, <clears throat> it will pass to your trueborn son, Jaceris, upon your death. So he's trying to to be kind about it. Obviously we know Allison and Otto don't believe that. that right. He said true. Rhaenyra's true born sons. Um, and Luke will be confirmed as the legitimate heir to Driftmark and all with all of its lands and holdings. Um, and your sons by Prince Damon will be given places of high honor at court hostages, squire and cupbearer. Exactly. Ho hostages to make sure <laughs> that, uh, 
that y'all don't uh, act a fool out here at Dragonstone. <laughs> Finally, the king in his good grace will pardon any knight or lord who conspired against his ascent. Um, <laughs> which I wonder if that would include Kingsguard. I mean, I'm sure they would be st- sent to the wall instead of killed, but there's yeah, no way they probably. would continue to to trust a Kingsguard who had sworn chosen Rhaenyra. Yeah, definitely. I would say it was, I mean, it was sworn to Viserys. Wall. Yes, it was sworn, they were all sworn to Viserys. So, I mean, in their defense and like what Harold Westerling said, my authority comes from the king. So until there's a king, you know, holla at your boy. I'm gone. <laughs> um, which they do crown Aegon, but obviously that is a complete, you know, joke and a, and a usurpation. But I mean, I wonder if uh, if now that they have actually crowned Aegon king, if that would change Harold Westerling's thinking any. because. Harold was there as they were plotting to install Aegon against Viserys's wishes, but and admitting it was it, a was plot. it just the plotting? Right? Was it just the plotting that in the interim that bothered Harold, or like the actual usurpation that? Bo- I mean, I'm sure it was both. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I really want to see what happened. What happens with Harold Westerling in season two, where he ends up? Yeah. Very much. It's, it's, I'm excited to see that too. And it makes sense that they don't, would only send one Kingsguard with the auto here because if they only have three in Harold's absence, they need to retain as many as possible to protect the royal family, quote unquote, at the Red Keep. So, uh, you know, I'd thought, oh, maybe they sent all two or three. No, just send one because you need to keep the other two close by the king and the queen dowager, the dowager queen. Absolutely. Um, and before Rhaenyra can even respond to again. the terms, you know, Damon, you know, jumps uh, jumps in again. And a pretty epic line. I would rather feed my sons to the dragons than have them carry shields and cups for your drunken usurper cunt of a I'm, king. <laughs> I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> oh man, that is <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if if your match, if your wife is the cho- it was the real chosen heir. And then here come these just absolute scoundrels coming in, stealing her birthright. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I'd have no part in sending my sons off the court to serve that. Yeah, totally. And this is the part where he kind of admits, you remember, like you, you, you mentioned, he's like um, pretending to act like this is legitimate, like giving all the titles and saying, oh, you know, it'll pass your true bones. This is when he kind of admits that, they know that that they stole it. He says, Aegon sits the Iron Throne, wields the Conqueror's crown, wields the Conqueror's sword, has the Conqueror's name, uh, was anointed by the Septon, a Septon of the Faith before the eyes of thousands. And he says, every symbol of legitimacy belongs to him. That's like a, an admission that he's not really yeah. legitimate, but every symbol of legitimacy belongs to him. Who says, then there's Stark Charlie Baratheon? Also him. Is that Otto? Yep. So here we like this. We're finally we're at the end. We see uh, Stark in the end of episode one as he swears fealty, and I think uh, Boros Baratheon, or like Boros or Boromund, the the father, Boromund, yeah. Boromund Baratheon, as they swear their uh, allegiance to Rhaenyra as heir. Um, but other than that, we haven't gotten very much, you know, Stark, Tully, or Baratheon action this year. A little bit with with uh, Boromund as uh, Rhaenyra was uh, flying about the kingdom. And sailing about the kingdom looking for suitors. Ormond reminds but, me of Tormund, the, the the name. Sorry, it just popped nice. into my head. <laughs> they um so they mention them here, and then they again at some in some of Rhaenyra's war councils that some of the uh OG Lords Paramount um from the books and the original series are gonna be more involved in season two as uh the how as the blacks and greens vie for oh, their yeah, allegiance. Um, there is Stark, Tully, and Baratheon, houses that have also received and are at present considering generous terms from their king. And then she says, Stark, Tully, and Baratheon all swore when King Viserys named me his heir. And uh, a good point here by Otto, but I mean, nicely they should worded still, too. yeah, stale oaths should mean something. But like, like the Lannister, you know, twat says, and Boros ends up saying, um, 
those old oaths, you know, I didn't make that oath. My father made that oath. Yeah. Um, By uh, definition, an states. oath should never be stale because an oath is like yeah, a lifetime thing, you know? That's it. It's your, it's your bond. But he's making but he calls them stale oaths. Like, you know, those yeah, words stale. were said a long time ago, mm-hmm. babe. Yeah. Lots has happened. Generations Toots. have passed. Um, stale oaths will not put you on the iron throne. Princess. Again, he continues to call her princess. The succession Change the day your father sired a son. I only, re- I only regret that you were the and he were the last to see the truth of it. So brutal. Pre- I mean, it's you know that's in a lot of people's mind, in a lot of lords' mind, and it's around the Seven Kingdoms. That's true. It yeah. did change. Remember that? Even you even had when, that line earlier on in the season. That was before Egon when he was talking with Alicent. Yeah, and when he hit when. Uh, when Otto's older brother Hobart was talking to him in episode two or three at the Royal hunt, he's already trying to get Otto to push Viserys to name Aegon. And he's like heir. proclaiming Aegon, the, the second of his name, second as they're of exiting his name. the carriage, planting the seeds and the, the, any of the hosts that are there to join the, the hunt. Yeah. So from Otto's perspective, you know, him and his brother and the other Lords that are siding with the greens, they saw this. As soon as Viserys had a son, but now Viserys and Rhaenyra were the last ones to see the truth of it. And he, I was not expecting this at all. Rhaenyra just marches up to him. You are no more hand than Aegon is king. Takes his hand pin right off of him without even a move from uh, Otto and flings it off the bridge into oblivion. I love that. <sighs> I wonder if they have extra of those. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, clearly, the production company does, but you know, it's like, is that right. something you keep more than one of around in case something happens? Are they going to have to remember how it was designed and have? <laughs> I mean, probably not. They probably have to employ the uh, blacksmiths or silversmiths uh, to make a new one, but just put a foot on it this time for Larry. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. <laughs> Since Damon was using the word toehold, maybe he watched that pre- the last episode of House of the Dragon and was just so disappointed. <laughs> Disturbed by Laris and the feet. Oh, that he, <laughs> he, instead of saying foothold, he, he says toe hold. Hold. Yeah, because, you know, he has trouble confronting emotional situations head on. The toe hold, that's just as traumatizing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You are no more hand than Aegon is king. He takes it and just chucks it off the bridge. Drops another F bomb. Traitor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you traitor. Uh, and now Otto kind of pulls out the, the ace up his sleeve. Grand Maester. And Damon is sick of it. His hand is still on the hilt of a sword, you know, in that classic Damon pose. Uh, what the fuck is this? And he doesn't you even know, like really what, say what the what the fuck. He just says, fuck is this? <laughs> it seems like. Right. Yeah. In the script. <laughs> yeah. yeah it says the, the the what the. But yeah. And the, probably as they went through the rehearsals, they're like, this would be a little bit more powerful yeah. to say it this way. Fuck is this? Um, Greens are dropping mad F-bombs or the blacks are dropping mad F-bombs here. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're mad, man. And oh, rightfully yeah. so. Um, so Otto gets the little rolled up page from Grandmaster Orwell and hands it to Rhaenyra. And as Rhaenyra unfolds it, you can kind of see the the sadness, the just what could have been uh, kind of go across Rhaenyra's face. That's, you know, that page she tore out of the history book way back in episode one. Yep. Where her and Alicent were talking in the Godswood. And uh, it's the page that talks about Nymeria. Fuck and, the scepter. Um, <laughs> I said, yeah. The, um, the page talks about, you know, being being lashed together, which was kind of how Alicent and Rhaenyra were as they were, you know, teenage girls. They were just oh. joined at the hip, great friends. Um, and then, you know, some people were saying that kind of the hidden message or undertone of this page was about how Nymeria burned her most, her most powerful weapon, the fleet that brought them from Essos to Dorne. As a statement that um, we're, we're staying here, we're here to stay. As a statement that exactly, they're not going, they're not fleeing anywhere else. This is their home now. They're going to make this home and they did. But I think Alicent sending this is sort of, is hoping that Rhaenyra will not use her most powerful weapon against Allison and Aegon, her dragons. Interesting. Yeah, I forgot to pause and read it. <laughs> and that they will choose, you know, Allison is hoping that Rhaenyra will choose peace, you know, instead of war and not use her, her most deadly destructive weapon 
against them. Obviously, the greens have dragons as well, but it, it, it's going to get very ugly if if dragons are roasting armies and roasting each other and fighting, you know, these aerial battles. It's going to be crazy. Dragon dog but fights. Alicent chose this. Alicent chose this when she chose to put Aegon on the throne. I get it. She had this conversation with Viserys where she thinks she's carrying out his will. But she may not this, have had much of a choice, though, because they probably would have locked her up. We're so, right, because yeah, Otto and Otto and Lannister and company were were already moving forward with this anyway. Man, such a crazy situation. Yeah, and it, you can see they really have been because they already sent word to Tully and Stark and everything, and uh, they had these plans set up in advance, and they used that two days before Rhaenys escaped and made her way to Dragonstone to send the ravens or dragons to every place they need to and orchestrate the extremities of the coup, you know? As Otto hands that page to Rhaenyra, he, he tells her, Queen Allison has not forgotten the love you once had for each other. No blood need be spilled so the realm can carry on in peace. Queen Allison eagerly awaits your answer. And again, Damon jumps in again. <laughs> she can have her answer now. Stuffed in her father's mouth along with his withered cock. <laughs> let's, end this, <laughs> let's end this mummer's farce. Uh, Sir Eric, I believe this is where he uh, draw, uh, Damon draws swords yeah. first again, just Everybody. like in episode two. So in episode two, they came to swords again. Yep. I mean, they didn't clash, but everybody drew swords in episode two, and they do here again. Sir Eric, bring me Lord Hightower so I may take the pleasure myself. So he is going to castrate Otto Hightower, the fake Hand of the King. Oh, right. Just like the the, the rapist when he was on the, the City Watch in the premiere. Yeah, on the chopping block. He loves Absolutely. Cyrax off wieners. goes crazy as... <laughs> Wiener, wiener, wiener. Start. <laughs> <laughs> Cyrax starts roaring, and uh, as they, as they, uh, everybody draws swords, um, and Rainier stops the madness. No, King's Landing will have my answer on the morrow. And now, what happens later in the episode? I'm wondering if that answer will be spoken with fire. I am wondering also. And uh, interestingly, since he Damon says, Sir Eric, bring me Lord Hightower so I can take the pleasure myself. I think at that moment it cuts to Sir Eric, who's behind Hightower, who kind of grabs for his sword and in, in, you know, fear that he may come to blows with his brother. And uh, Sir Matthew of House Rep sent us some interesting information that apparently some bard named Lucien of Tarth had written a sad ballad about when the Cargill twins met on opposite sides at Dragon at Dragonstone when the terms of surrender were delivered to Rhaenyra called Farewell, My Brother. And so this is like kind of a moment in the lore where these two brothers turn against each other and uh, wow. legendary type of stuff, just like the Civil War. There's uh, one of the one of the Ramin Jawadi songs from season four, three, four, or five is called "Farewell, Brother," and it's oh, like a stark theme. It's the stark theme with the violins and cellos, but like even more sad and melancholy. <laughs> um, and but the title of Ramin Jawadi's, you know, that piece is "Farewell, Brother." Mm, so I'm wondering if he. That. Right. If he got that phrase, that name from this uh, Lucian Barth in back in Westeros history and used it, you know, to name this piece of music, because I think it was when Rob, maybe when John found out that Rob had been killed or something. I can't remember when that piece is in the show. Lucian of Tarth. You said Lucian Barth. Just, <laughs> just oh, sorry. But the bard Lucian of Tarth. Um, Beautiful. Pretty wild. Um, does Cyrax take? Does Cyrax take off, or this the scene just kind of end? Um, well, Rhaenyra says no, and Damon kind of looks at her like, "What are you fucking serious?" And she kind of glares at down. him, and then after, like, he doesn't immediately um, relent, you know. But then eventually, after she glares at him, he he does relent, and he lowers his sword and puts his hands on it like he does, and. Just tilts his head forward like like C-3PO shutting down. <laughs> you know, like he's out of commission for the moment. And uh, oh, nice. I was like, oh, man, for once, somebody did handle Damon. She she handled him. Yeah. He yeah, submitted to her he, will. 
he, you know, Damon has, has sort of been a little bit uh, disruptive and trying to take control of situations within the Council of the Blacks. But here, where the Greens are, you know, coming with terms, like he cannot treat Rhaenyra with disrespect. Mm-hmm. They have to be united behind Rhaenyra. United so front for the he, enemies. You know, he doesn't want to, but he does, you know, listen to and obey to what she says and uh, puts his sword down. And I think this moment really pisses him off because he sees an opportunity to strike a huge blow, taking out a King's Guard, taking out the hand. Otto is the strategic mastermind behind this whole situation. If they can get rid of him, it would be really good for their war effort. And so the Absolutely. scene, uh, yeah. the scene where he Bart Simpson's Rhaenyra, why I oughta, you know, choking uh, <laughs> like Homer Simpson choking her. Um, I think that this all that frustration, yeah, this a lot of frustration in that moment comes from this being forced to stand down when it's like a golden opportunity for their cause. Um, but like Rhaenys says to Corlys, it's the only thing holding the realm together and preventing all out preventing all out war at this point is is Rhaenyra, you know, who's refusing to start the war herself. I think next they're, um, they're back around the painted table with, uh, with all the Lords and cupbearers and knights and, uh, Damon's continuing to strategize and discuss the, the war. He says, it's no easy thing for a man to be a dragon slayer, even though we know Jamie Lannister was going to try. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Idiot, you fucking idiot. <laughs> but dragons can kill dragons and have. Uh, the simple truth is we have more dragons than Aegon. But what that begs the question, how many dragons is Vagar going to kill before Vermithor, Caraxes, or Cyrax, or maybe Silverwing? Like those are the four that could possibly, but even then it's going to need to be a team up against Vagar. As, but how many little dragons is Vagar going to kill in the meantime to even oh, to more even the odds is pretty pretty horrific. Even um, one is too many. Ugh. And Rhaenyra comes back at Damon. Viserys spoke often of the Valyrian histories. I know them well. When yes. dragons flew to war, everything burned. Everything burns. Everything burns. And when Alfred says, some men just want to watch the world burn. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what was it, Danny, that. that said, I don't, I don't want to rule over uh, a kingdom of ash it's, and bone? Like, isn't that she basically it's, it's said a the same close, line? It, exactly. It's, it's not the exact same line. It's pretty close. Um, a queen of ashes. She says, or... Yeah, I don't want to be queen over the ashes, I think is, is maybe what she says to Tyrion or Varys or Missande, somebody in as she's plotting her conquest of Westeros. Mm. Um, somebody asked Rhaenyra, are you considering the Hightower's terms? Uh, I guess it's Lord Bartimus. Uh, as queen, what is my true duty to the realm, Lord Bartimus, to ensure peace and unity or that I sit the Iron Throne no matter the cost? Well, it depends on how you interpret the prophecy, you know? Right, right. If, you know, must a Targaryen sit it? Absolutely. Aegon's a Targaryen, so maybe she could take the terms and pass the prophecy on to Aegon and live out her days on Dragonstone. Keep the realm united for the greater good. You know, that's what she's thinking. Like maybe the greater good is her stepping down and just letting the realm coalesce behind Aegon to keep the peace and to keep a united front. Cause any day the darkness could come from the North, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's the prophecy is, is weighing on her mind about what's the best way to move forward. Obviously she and Damon, you know, want the throne. Um, and it's, it's hers, you know, by birthright and by as I've said, presidential proclamation, <laughs> by the king, by the king's proclamation, by executive order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, ultimately she's, she's weighing absolutely what is best for the realm. Like Allison last week, you know, a true queen counts the cost to her people. Yeah, exactly. And not just the cost of the war in the here and now, but, Right as when the realm is most divided is, you know, when the enemy, you know, the unknown White Walkers might attack. So yeah. she's thinking about, you know, what's the absolute best thing for the realm. And speaking of Damon, this line of, of thought is not pleasing him at all. And he shoots back at her. That's your father talking. My father is dead and he chose me as his successor. 
which is kind of like a straight up dig at Damon. You were his brother, but he chose me, this a girl, to be his successor. He's getting his choking hand ready at this point. Oh man, yeah, like he's already <laughs> like, doing his grip, grip. Don't remind me of my problems with my brother. I miss him. Yep. Yeah, he chose me as his successor to defilm the realm, not cast it headlong into war. Will the enemy have declared war? And what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Bro, he's he, stepping like, out that of That is line. straight up. Yeah, that is like straight up uh, disobedience or almost rebellion against, not rebellion as far as like a war, but in the moment, like you Near can't mutiny. speak this way. Yeah. Mutiny is a good way to put it. You can't speak this way to the queen in front of everybody. And she, she doesn't enter. She doesn't get down in the mud with him and start fighting. She says, clear the room. Yeah. She's finally asserting herself and like, you know, letting him know this is not going to fly, dude. And she's, she does it in private, which is smart. Clear the room. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. She's about to lay down the law. Yeah. Rhaenyra is, uh, she's more stately than my clear the room. <laughs> so, you know, she's not like queen of England. Clear the room. <laughs> she's forceful, but not, you know, tyrannical. Yeah. Joff, you know, Joffrey. Clear the room. <laughs> Um, so everybody slowly kind of mingles out of the, I guess mingles, not the right word. They slowly meander. proceed, meander. Yeah, that's a good word out of the room. So the queen can have a word with her prince consort or king consort. Like I know earlier they talked about how Damon would be the prince consort. When Corliss arrives in the next a couple scenes from now, he, she says the prince is off in different business. So she refers to him as a prince in this episode, which made me wonder. Right. Maybe because he he's always been a prince because he was the second son of uh, Viserys and his parents. So maybe because he's always had the title prince, he just becomes prince consort. Whereas Lenor was never a prince. So when if he and Rhaenyra had, were still married, he would go from Lenor Valerian heir of, to Driftmark. A prince has become kings all the time. Yeah, once you ascend the throne, I guess. I don't know. It, it, may, it makes sense to me. I can understand. I can see it both ways. But it, it would seem to me that he would be king consort. Right. Because he's not yeah. the king. So it should be king consort. I don't know. Um, she says, did the promise of war excite you? It's like, why you uh you want to get down? <laughs> right, <laughs> the table uh, is right uh, here. <laughs> yeah, Stannis and Melisandre have yeah. uh, already in the future, uh, story wise, <laughs> done that. Um, but he he's a little bit worried that she might be thinking about the bending, you know, about uh, agreeing to the terms. You cannot bend the knee to the high towers. They stole your birthright. I was like, yeah, Damon, tell her. Yeah, they stole it. And I was wondering if Damon was having kind of a Corliss moment here, talking about his wife's birthright as a shield for his own ambition to charge forward. Yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, I think he genuinely does, you know, I mean, he feels like they stole her birthright. And I agree with him. They they did. But yeah, he's definitely like he, I mean, like Rhaenyra brings up right here. If you could take the Iron Throne without putting... Otto's head on a spike, would you do it? You know, obviously, I meaning that's what he really wants to do. And him and Otto have been at odds since day one since that we started one. the series. And they were in the high count, the high council, the small council meeting room. And they're, you know, at odd. And Corliss also kind of at odds with with the hand and Viserys. Um, but he, he doesn't answer her question and just trying to, you know, use her anger and sh how she's been wronged to motivate her. Aren't you angry? And, but she, you know, she's being very, um, even and, and not emotional. Uh, should I declare war just because I'm angry? So, I mean, she, she is angry, obviously. Um, she's using logic. She says, no, it's like, you know, there's that right. constant, constant fight between emotion and logic, uh, left brain, yeah, right absolutely. brain type thing. And, you know, a good, leader would have a balance of both and know when to un, when to be calculated and when to <laughs> unleash the fury you know <laughs> yeah like because robert robert had to put down the rebellion that the uh the gray joys started and they you know they went to war but the gray joys did that because they thought robert was kind of 
not feckless, but they didn't know he was, you know, still fairly new on the throne. And they, you know, people are going to test you when you're new to power. Yep. But uh, Damon says, Damon says, no, uh, he should, she shouldn't declare war because she's angry because it's your duty as queen to crush rebellion. <clears throat> and she's, she tells him that, you know, my oath reaches beyond our personal ambitions. When she said this, I'm like, what, what is she talking? Is she going to, what do you mean? She meant her oath. Your personal ambitions are everything. You're the queen and you're supposed to be the queen. You were promised. Uh, and she says a song of ice and fire. I'm like, whoa, oh, she's going full, you know, full retard. Is that, is that <laughs> what they say in Pineapple Express? Or, uh, Tropic Thunder. Never go, yeah, never go full retard. You went full retard. Never go full <laughs> retard. Yeah, she, and when she mentions, you know, how it goes beyond personal ambition, he looks at her like, what? Like, what are you talking about? What? She goes full prophecy on him. Um, <laughs> never what? go full prophecy. <laughs> exactly. Like Not to Damon. Uh, <laughs> the coming war against the darkness in the north, the conqueror's dream. Viserys shared it with me when he named me heir and he grabs her. And I couldn't believe it. I know. I was like, what? Oh my what is God. It? Was it, bro, 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 bro. Stop. What are you doing? Um, that's Rhaenyra. That's the queen. That's your wife. Like, I get it. The love of your both, life. They've both been through so much in the last day like this day i guess this is still presumably maybe the next day um after the cremation funeral which turned into the coronation and then it's kind of dark it's either early it's either dusk or dawn when otto and them are out on the dragonstone bridge so this could be the next day maybe but still so much has happened to them following the odd like the night um later on in the evening after they treat with otto on the bridge that's the impression that Mm -hmm. i got yeah, yeah, me too. But I mean, they've just been through so many emotions, lost a baby, lost Viserys. The crown has been usurped. They're planning a war. Uh, Damon has to question the Queen's Guard and ensure their loyalty and think about attacks and, man, try to co- figure out how they're going to get to River Run. Or I'm sorry, how how they're going to get their army to Hall. Obviously, Damon's got to go to River Run and talk with Grover, Oscar, uh, Elmo, Tully. And Um, all that energy is just like pent up inside of him and he's ready to just explode. And when she holds him back on the bridge, it's like, oh, and he's just like, you know, he like squeezes and holds it in. But this saying, like informing him that his brother left him out of the secret, even though he was heir. It's just like it's the it's the hair that broke the camel's back. You know what I mean? The straw that broke the camel's back. It just snaps. Absolutely. Yeah. He just snaps. Force joke. And. Yeah, he was the heir until, you know, Viserys had a son and he didn't have one for so long. And Rhaenyra was 12, 13, 14 years old. And then she's named heir. So Rhaenyra is assuming that Damon already knew about it because he had been heir the whole time. But right. Viserys had chosen not to tell Damon because even though by blood he was the prince and he yeah. was next in line, Viserys didn't think of him as his chosen heir. Not only that, it's not even like a, necessarily a matter of, of being chosen, but he had his own dream prophecy that he would, ha- would have a son named Egon who would wear the yeah. conqueror's crown. So in his mind, Damon was only ever a placeholder because he was sure that the prophecy would come true. But um, uh, so he never thought it like really necessary to tell Damon. Ironically, if he had told Damon, Eamon, uh, Damon may have played ball a lot more. He may have understood the larger importance of presenting a unified front. And it also uh, it explains Viserys' obsession with peace. As far as he knew, they'd have to call the banners to fight the darkness at any moment. So his in his mind, peace was critical to ensure the prophecy would be fulfilled. And also... Uh, Viserys just should have told him because if some catastrophe had cost Viserys's life, the secret would have been lost. So in in my opinion, you must always tell the current heir so that your prophetic eggs aren't all in one basket per se. Yeah, you know, because anything could happen to the king at any moment. Just drop dead from a heart attack like his dad, Balon, I believe, you know, just died from a burst belly just out of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. You can't risk it. So. If he, if Balon was the heir, I mean, Jaharis outlived Balon. So if he had told Balon, Jaharis then just told Viserys after the Great Council of 101, I guess. But <clears throat> yeah, uh, Damon and Rhaenyra are both surprised that 
they that he doesn't know about the prophecy and the coming darkness in the north and how important it is for them for a Targaryen to sit the throne and for them to be able to hold the realm together. And it's like insult to injury for Damon. Like he uh, he loves his brother so much and just wanted his affection all throughout everything we've seen. And for now his brother to be dead and him after they reconciled and he, he thought everything was cool. And then learning that, you know, his brother left him out of this major secret is just like a huge yeah. blow to him, I think. It really is. So it just, he totally snaps and just has his way for a moment. I mean, yeah, he literally Darth Vader's uh, <laughs> Padme here. Yeah. And he, he Anakin's Padme. Uh-huh. And um, she's, you know, she's trying to breathe and, oh, and he's telling her, his hands. you know, my brother was a slave to his omens and portents and visions and dreams. And so it's definitely, I mean, I think Viserys is definitely a dragon dreamer. And, and his dream came true. Aegon, he had a son named Aegon wearing the Conqueror's crown. I know it ended up happening. was enthroned. Or is that the right word? We can make it the right word. Enshrined is a different word, but he was put on the Iron Throne. Coronated, you could say. I think this was a line from the early trailers, maybe? I can't remember. Dreams didn't make us kings. Dragons did. Oh, I forgot about that. What a crazy context it's in. We didn't know he was literally choking out yeah, like, <laughs> his <laughs> niece wife. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Great. Yeah. If you had, in episode one, if you had told us this was going to happen in episode 10, you're like, whoa, what? Who? Wow. wow. <laughs> um, he finally lets her go. And she's just like, just Emma Darcy made some, I mean, amazing like sounds. Like I, even on the rewatch, I'm like, she's like talking a little bit, but then her mouth is barely open and she's making these these breathing sounds that it seems like, like it doesn't look like her, her mouth should be making those sounds. Not that it is like it's mismatched with timing. It's, it's just really, it's just, it's really good. But I was like, is she, I couldn't tell if they'd like put it in and post or what, but I think she's really just this like breathing in sound. I don't know how to explain it. But it was crazy. It's, it, he never told you, did he? Oh, and he's just like, Argh. and dude, for like for a split second, just before he releases her from his from his grip, he this look of like fury comes across his face, and he grimaces like snarling at her, like just for a brief second, he's considering just ugh, crushing her windpipe, and then he ugh, kind of pushes her back and steps back and <laughs> releases her, but for a second there, like crazy energy came over over Damon, some some evil type type stuff yeah i mean and this is people's like oh this doesn't fit damon's character uh damon's my favorite it's like uh, okay same with danny if she or he and damon in this case if they're your favorite okay it is what it is but they can be your favorite but still be this very dark complicated character that isn't your stereotypical hero from another story Right. That's not how George writes his characters. And speaking of prophecies, like people were, you know, the whole point of this show is that like prophecies are bullshit. You know, Cersei, like Cersei has the prophecy from the Woods Witch about, you know, all of the bad yeah. stuff happening. And the only reason any of it comes true is because of her own actions and that alienate people around her and cause the prophecy to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If she had never heard the prophecy, it never would have happened. None of it. And same with all these other people, Rhaegar, with his, the death at Summerhall and all these things, prophecies end poorly and don't turn out the way you think they are. It's like a fluke that Danis the Dreamer got her thing right. And, and um, Viserys correctly you know seeing the egg on with the crown you know that's kind of a fluke too i mean it, as long as he has a male son it's virtually a guarantee so <laughs> that's not even that's barely even a prophecy you know what i mean <laughs> like that's mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like just likely to happen anyway um but you know people were upset that like oh john snow wasn't the one to kill uh you know the night king that's because prophecies are bullshit that's like the whole point of this whole of the story you know what i mean <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, yeah. At best, you know, like Melisandre says, same with magic. You know, it's it's a double edged sword with no hilt. You know, there's no way to use it without getting cut. Right. Bits and pieces are true, but never like the whole thing and perfectly accurately. Like, yeah, the the darkness comes from the north, and there's White Walkers, but 
not, you know, like I, I've already ranted about that enough on other <laughs> other podcasts. I don't want to piss off any more people <laughs> who didn't like it. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, you know, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so, yeah, then it cuts to, uh, to Renice sleeping in the chair beside Corliss. And so Corliss oh, wakes up in his bed and man, it's good to see Corliss after a couple of weeks without him. Good to know he's feeling better. And Rainey's is sleeping in her chair. And <laughs> I've had men whipped for falling asleep on their watch. And she kind of wakes up. You are no man. He's happy to see her. And right off the bat, she plays the guilt card. Uh, to yeah. emphasize it's it's it, like that this is important to her and to lay the foundation for leveraging him in a few minutes to make sure he'll support Rhaenyra. You abandoned me when I needed you the most. He left us! He left us! Our children stolen from us. I needed you. Bela and Reyna needed you. You abandoned us for adventure far away as has always been your way, you know, off to sea. And uh, he's, Corliss is trying to justify it that he lost everything and had nowhere to turn. But she's like, we, we lost everything, Corliss. It's sort of like Damon. He, instead of turning and holding his family close, he, you know, just kind of looks for an exit and looks for a way out. And for Corliss, it's always been the sea. So that's what he does after losing Lena and Lenor. And uh, obviously at the expense of, you know, almost his own life, going to the Stepstones and he's left his wife for these six years. It's, you know, yeah, not a great, not a great relationship building tool to uh, sail away for six years. Definitely. And like you said, some interesting parallels here between Corliss and Damon, the way they're alienating their loved ones uh, in their own, you know, selfish way of dealing with loss and trauma, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> so he's like, I understand we have a new king changing the subject. And his, and Rainey's has to break the bad news to him that the stranger has cast an even longer shadow over their family at this point, since Vaymond is also dead. And Corliss like, oh, like starts to sit up in bed. And she explains that in his haste to bury you and claim your seat, he stood before the king and denounced Lenor's sons as illegitimate. Uh, in your anger, you killed her. <laughs> I'm not just about to it. <laughs> and uh, Corliss is like, oh, like he kind of like relax, like loot the tension kind of like disappears. And he's like, oh, that sounds about right. Fucking idiot. He's always mutinying <laughs> in one way or another. God damn it, Vaymond. You fucking idiot. You know, like, oh, why'd you have to go and do that? You know, because he knows that it's true that they're illegitimate, but he's like, ah, oh, God, it's just senseless death, you know? I mean, it's not heedless senseless. ambition. Yeah, heedless ambition. Yeah, exactly. He says it's always been a Valerian weakness. Uh, she, oh, yeah, because Radius explains Damon took his head for it. And he has like this moment of self-actualization where he realizes that their ambition has cost them dearly. And he's like, you were right, Radius. I reached too far. And for nothing, our pursuit of the Iron Throne is at an end. We shall declare for no one. We will retire to high tide and be content with our grandchildren. And, and I'm like, oh, no, don't talk about retiring and being content. That type of talk never ends well on TV shows like this. <laughs> you know, like, don't do it. Don't even go yeah, there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she cuts him off, reminding him that Jace, Luke and Joff are all claimants to the throne. And she didn't even mention Bela and Reyna are married to, to are going to be married to Jace and Luke. So none of them are going to be safe as long as Aegon is king. And ch sad cello starts to play. And uh, it's true, you know, and Rainey says Ari's already planted the seed with her first mark about Corliss abandoning her. Basically, now all she's got to say is you already abandoned me <laughs> when I needed you most. We cannot abandon our grandchildren when they need us most, you know, and he's, uh -huh. she's got him hook, line and sinker. And so, <laughs> so, so he tries to resist. Uh, it is useless to resist saying uh, Rhaenyra was complicit in our son's death. That girl destroys everything she touches. And Rhaenys is the one this time in the power move to pull her hands away from Corliss the way he had in front of the hearth when they were talking about uh, the succession and whether there were whether the kids were bastards and illegitimate and she points out rightly that that girl 
Rhaenyra is the only thing holding the realm together at present. Every man at the paint round the painted table, and it cuts to a, a image of the painted table in the next scene as she still starts to talk so we can see how true it is. Every man standing around the painted table urges her to plunge the realm into war and she's the only one who's demonstrated restraint. Hashtag truth. Everybody is just you know, rearing for battle at this point, except her. She's the only one that's trying to keep peace and hold things together and uh, then it cuts back to the war room. Yeah, we get a little, you know, tactical talk uh, between uh, Bartimus Keltigar and Lord Staunton. The purpose of war is to fill graveyards, my dear Lord Staunton. <laughs> <laughs> the trick is to put more of their bin in the ground than your own. Um, which, I'm trying to remember the quote. Is it from a Marine general? I don't think it's Chesty. Chesty. I don't know. I heard it somewhere. That, you know, They were talking about the point, oh, I'm trying to remember, the point of war is to not die for a country, but to let the other poor bastard die for his or something like that. That's a good one. Yeah, that <laughs> makes sense. Fine. Who? Oh, maybe George Patton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his. Nice. Patton? Yeah, I believe so. George, General George Patton. So pretty epic. Yep, Patton. And then uh, one of them talks to the other. Easy words for a lord who commands from the safety of his castle. So I'm wondering if one of these guys is like a Ned Stark riding at the front of his army. And the other guy is a uh, uh, Walter Frey. A George Washington versus a King sits, George. Yeah, sits in his castle and waits for waits for their army to go do their bidding. What is thy bidding, master? <laughs> and then Eric with an E announces, Lord of the Tides. Lord Corlys Valerian and his wife, the Princess Rhaenys Targaryen. Uh, and they kind of slowly come down the steps. He has a, uh, Corlys has a cane now. Yeah, he's um, he's on the mend though. Absolutely looking good, <laughs> walking pretty good, a little bit slow. I still think he has like a bandage or kind of like a scarf thing around his neck from where the Corsair's dagger slashed him. Oh, right. Uh, cause this, that was the, what happened with, that was his wound. Uh, he took a slash. Um, Rhaenyra greets him. Lord Corliss brings me much relief to see you hale and healthy once again. Doesn't Missaria wear something around her neck too to hide her scars? I don't know how she got these scars. <laughs> Similar type thing. Uh, right? At least so, because we saw our last episode. We saw she was wearing a different kind of dress and we could see this, the scars at, at uh, kind of at her neck at her windpipe kind of area right yeah i thought so oh yeah she says hale and healthy just like uh, her father said about his father yep. absolutely it's a targaryen phrase i guess hale and healthy. <laughs> corliss you know tells Rhaeny- rhaenyra that you know he was sorry 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 i almost said it was the canadian way sorry <laughs> sorry i'm very sorry about your father princess he was a good man where is damon there were other concerns which demanded the prince's attention, which I was like, I figured he might have already flown off to River Run. Right. Yeah, I thought maybe she just sent him to his quarters to sit and think for a while. Yeah, because because Damon Rhaenyra's last interaction was you know, the force choke. Right. Um, yeah. But so um, he's off doing uh, Vermithor things. We yeah, find out. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Corliss kind of walks over to the eastern side of the painted table, you know, kind of near the gullet and is kind of looking about uh, and asks, you're declared allies? Yes, too few to win a war for the throne. Like, thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, (laughs) (laughs) He's a captain, too. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) The Lord of the Tides, Master of Driftmar, Driftmar, Captain of Obvious. Uh, (laughs) um, He... um, and Rhaenyra says, well, we would hope, also hope, to have the support of Houses Aaron, Baratheon, and Stark. And uh, Corliss is kind of different than Gandalf, where uh, Gandalf says, oh, a fool's hope is all we need. Oh. Corliss says, hope is the fool's ally. Um, Great reference there. Um, Dude. Both, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, Rhaenyra says, and obviously, Aaron and Baratheon both share blood. With, with her house, with uh, through Jocelyn Baratheon, the mother of Rhaenys. And then obviously Emma was an Aaron. Uh, her mother was was uh, Targaryen and her father was Aaron. 
Let's let's not gloss over that line though. Corliss uh, says hope is the fool's ally. That's that's pretty hardcore. He's it's ballsy of him to insinuate that the new queen is a fool like that. You know what I mean? Like that's that's some attitude he's given her, and he's he's not making it clear yet that he's backing her. <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty funny. Right. Yeah. Although Corliss and Rainey's are both wearing black here, mm. which you know. Is a good omen for Rhaenyra and her calls, you know, t- until until he declares. True. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good point. Good point. If they had come in wearing gl- green, you know, she should have just told the uh, King's Guard to cut him down. Off with their heads. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so Rhaenyra is is thinking that because Aaron, House Aaron and Baratheon share blood with her, then they should, and they swore oaths. Uh, all of them swore oaths to her that. They should side with her. But uh, Corliss says, well, uh, House Hightower, they swore an oath to you, too. And, you know, look at what they've done. Dude, and she flips it on him so hard. And she does flip it on. As did you, Lord Corliss. The gauntlet is down. Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, that was such a badass line. It's like, All right. What say you? And she what just looks you? right at him. Yeah. <laughs> what say you? <laughs> yeah. Your father's realm was one of justice and honor. Our houses are bound by common blood and common calls. And before he gives his full answer here, it's like when she when she says, uh, "As did you, Lord Corliss." He stops dead in his tracks, and and he starts. He's, his eyes pan the room, and he focuses his, in on his grandchildren. You know, and uh, he knows, like from his conversation in the last scene with Renice, he knows he can't abandon them to the mercy of the Greens, and that his remaining blood needs his strength and the strength of House Valerion and their fleet at their backs. And he looks at the grandkids and then turns forward, and for just a brief moment, he closes his eyes and hangs his head as though he feels the weight of the decision he's about to announce, bringing his family into war and risking everything that he's built over these years from from his bootstraps, you know, the fleet and everything. And that's when he, uh, he begins speaking again. And as he was saying that our houses are bound by common blood and common calls, I was like, yes, yes, do it. Um, I did remember from the books that, that Corliss and then House Valerion end up siding with the Blacks, but this was kind of an, a fun. Uh, I mean, unless they're going to change it, but that'd be a that like that would be a monumental ch- book change. They, they made us think they were potentially going to change it for a little bit. Remember when Rainy split temporarily? That was good. Yeah, they played with it and dramatized it and made us wonder. It's like surely they won't do this big of a change to take the Valerions from the Blacks and put them right. in the Greens. Dude, the writing is so good on this show. But, you know, they, so, yeah, they kind of left us in limbo all the way to the finale here, yeah. uh, to the end. So this good. high tower treason cannot stand. And I like, almost expected the room to, like, erupt. Like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and me going, like, I think I, Yeah, I think uh, when I was, uh, when he said that, uh, I think I was like, yes. 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 Me too. I was yes. like, yes. Yeah. For the win. <laughs> I summon you to fulfill your oath. Uh, and he does. Yeah. He fulfills his <laughs> oath. Um you have the full support of our fleet and house, your, your grace. grace. And Rhaenyra looks like surprised at his quick declaration of support. She looks so surprised that she almost does like a double take. <laughs> like, what, what, what? Yeah. <laughs> and Corliss does a long, solemn head bow, showing how, just how serious he is, taking his time with the bow. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, she's surprised, but she's like very relieved because this could literally turn the tide of the war, having a naval power. And how much, uh, how, how affected she is by this, like it, it shows in the way, in her delivery of the next line. You absolutely, me, Lord Corliss. It reminded me of uh, Alicent mm-hmm. at dinner saying, your, wo- your, your, your words move me deeply, princess. You know, like mm-hmm. a very heartfelt delivery of those two lines and... She she turns around and, and looks at Rainey's and says, you know, Princess Rainey's, I'm meaning that, you know, obviously her and Lord Corliss, they both honor Rainier greatly. Yeah. And finally, Rainey's has taken off her armor. Exactly. She, she has on the black dress. So I wonder if, I mean, surely Otto, I'm uh, no, sorry. I just really uh, disparaged uh, 
Corliss by calling him Otto. Um, <laughs> like, truly Corliss, like some of their, he and Rainey's conversation hap- the end of their conversation happens off screen. Yep, yep. And after Rainey's is kind of pushing him, it's like our grandchildren are involved and our actual true born grandchildren, Damon's daughters, they're in this as well because they're betrothed to the Valerian boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're involved because they're involved. So you know, exactly. we got to fight. So they changed their clothes and put on their nice black outfits and black. went out to uh, declare for Rhaenyra. Once you go black, you never go back. And, hey. uh, and so, like, she says, you honor me, Lord you Corliss. And he kind of like nods at her. And then his eyes flick over to Rhaenys, indicating that it's Rhaenys who convinced me. And that's convinced. when Rhaenyra turns to look at, at Rhaenys. And uh, Corliss is saying that you should be thanking Rhaenys for, for making it happen. And Rhaenys is just smiling so broadly at this point. Finally, like you said, she's taken off her armor. She's let her guard down. She can show how she truly feels. And uh, she's smiling like, yep, I want him to your side for you. I got him to join. And <laughs> I love it. So good. Just such an awesome Very moment. Good. Rhaenyra kind of continues her war council and brings Corliss up to speed a little bit. I've told my bannermen, I made a promise to my father to hold the realm strong and united. If war's first stroke is to fall, it won't be by my hand. Oh, great writing there. Very good. And, but Corliss is like, so you can sit here and do nothing? Are you not going to act? And, but she says, taking caution does not mean standing fast. I wish to know who my allies are before I send them to war. Confirming what Rhaenys had said to Corliss that Rhaenyra is holding the realm together with her thoughtful approach to the whole situation instead of just plunging into battle and chaos. Yeah, I mean, she runs into battle and starts fighting now with the few, the small army she's got and their position becomes, you know, they lose a couple of battles. Those fickle lords, you know, right. like Tully and Frey, well, they haven't mentioned the phrase, but I assume they're always fickle and oh, basically yeah, of course. slow to do anything. Uh, Late. They will go to the other side. Whereas if you just kind of prepare and get ready, do what you can, you know, patrol the skies with the dragons, but figure out if the Starks and the Aarons are with you. Right. Because if right. they are, you have a lot more backup coming. And learning that the Baratheons are against you is, you know, that takes a lot of potential manpower away from your position. Yeah, definitely. And it sort of reminded me how in the gods with Rhaenys had said, tomorrow the the high towers strike their f- first blow. They land their first blow. If you kneel, you know, if it if it brings you to your knees, I'll be forced to 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 stay my own course and to, you know, hold back. So she doesn't want to, uh, like you said, lose big battles early before she's gotten all the support because those other lords would be like, I don't want any part of this. You know? Definitely. And Cor- this like sort of reassures Corliss that he's made the right decision here as he sees that Rhaenyra is thoughtfully preparing their war footing. And he goes Absolutely. on to explain the result of his battles in the Stepstones that they now control the whole area and that it's fully garrisoned and that there's a total blockade uh, that's going to be in place in days if it's not already, you know, all set. The Triarchy's gone. The Narrow Sea is ours, which is important potentially if the Lannister fleet wants to come around the southern uh, tip of Westeros, as we talked about before. And hopefully music begins to play with a war drum undertone. What did you say? Sorry. You talking about the Lannister state, the Lannister fleet sailing around the southern tip? And I said South Side. Oh, South Side! <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, hopefully, they don't pick up any Dornishmen along the way and further <laughs> add to their numbers. Yeah. Oh God, um, that's a good way. I really, do, I can't remember if the Dornish are involved at all. I don't think they are because yeah, they're not really they don't in come the until the Seven point. Kingdoms until another couple of generations. So, but I don't. I can't remember if they play any role for the greens or the blacks as the dance goes on. Um, Hmm. So is it Corliss or somebody else that says, if we further seal the Gulf, we could cut off all seaborne travel uh, and trade into King's Landing. That's important. And right away, um, Rainey's offers to uh, use Maylis. She said, I'll take Maylis and patrol the gullet myself. And the two share potentially roast any ships that are trying to any, Green dragon bannered or golden dragon yeah. bannered ships. Roast them. Roast them. Toast them. And uh, this is another 
important moment, she shares another friendly gaze with Rhaenyra, giving a broad smile and like, yeah, I'm on your side. And Rhaenyra looks and she made she keeps her cool, but her her mouth flickers in a brief smile just at the corners of uh, her lips as she works to conceal her enthusiasm and delight at learning that Rhaenys joining her cause means an additional dragon, you know, as Damon had assumed earlier. <laughs> yep. Yeah, big dragon at that. And yeah, Maylis, who had a little asterisk beside their her name uh, <laughs> in the chart of green dragons and yeah, black dragons, yeah. Maylis was a little asterisk by it. But now she's full, fully blown on Team Black. So absolutely. Bartimus Keltigar says, when we drain the narrow sea, we can surround King's Landing, lay siege and force them to surrender. <clears throat> and then uh, Rainier, I believe, says, uh, if we have... If we are to have enough swords to even surround King's Landing, we must first secure the support of Winterfell, the Eyrie, and Storm's Inn. And uh, the maester wants to uh, send the ravens and let's go. But Jace, with a very fateful idea, we should bear those messages. Dragons can fly faster than ravens, and they're more convincing. Send us. Yeah, he's stepping up big. Absolutely. Jace and saw a meme where Jace says, send us. And Luke's like, no, nah, bro, I ain't going. <laughs> his interior thoughts, but you know, yeah. his brother has the idea. So he's kind of got to go along with it. Yeah. Unfortunately, this suggestion results in his death. Another reason yeah, for him to potentially feel guilt following Lucerus's demise. Oh, yeah. Big time. He's going to have a big role upcoming. I mean, he's the prince. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got to try to convince the Aarons and the Starks to, uh, to, start, to side with him. He's a natural born leader, man. A Corliss tells Rainier, the prince is right, your grace. Uh, meaning, you know, it's a good, a good idea for the, to send dragons instead of ravens. Um, and Rainier, you know, I think sort of hesitantly agrees. She looks over at them and Luke gives a nod like, yeah, he's right. And that's what seals the deal. And Rainier gives the orders, gives them their missions. Prince Jaceres will fly north, first to the Erie, to see my mother's cousin, the Lady Jane Aaron, who may not be all that thrilled that Damon is in the mix because of what he did to Rhea Royce. But <laughs> anyway, it's still Jane Aaron is still um, <laughs> Rhaenyra's aunt. Uh, or no, not her aunt. That's her mother's cousin. So I guess it would be Rhaenyra's second cousin. Want to remove? I don't know. Anyway, my mother's cousin, the Lady Jane Aaron, and then to Winterfell and to treat with Lord Cregan Stark. Great name. What Cregan, a name, yeah. <laughs> to support, uh, to uh, try to get the support of the North. Prince Lucerus will fly south to Storm's End and treat with Lord Boros Baratheon. And as she's saying that, the camera cuts to a close up side shot of the boys with Luke in focus. And it's another one of those camera hints that they're doing mm-hmm. uh, with the foreshadowing. And so I think this is something we need to focus on in the future, keeping an eye who the camera zooms in on, who it's focusing on, and uh, at any given moment, it may provide hints of things to come. And, uh, yeah. Um, Rhaenyra tells, tells them all, we must remind these lords of the oaths they swore and the cost of breaking them. Epic line. So then it cuts to the battlements to outside and Rain- Rhaenyra is watching as the sun is setting, waiting for her boys and the clouds are thick. A storm is coming and the, the sky is a little bit red. Um, they say red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the, in the morning, sailors take warning. But mm-hmm. <laughs> apparently that prophecy is wrong in this case, too, because <laughs> it's a red sky <laughs> at night and things are not going to go well. Uh, so the kids arrive and she's talk, she talks, uh, is, this reminded me of Viserys's conversation with her in front of Balerion's skull. How uh, they talk about how Val- Tar- Targaryens are seen as closer to gods than men. And Viserys says that the dragons help with that. Um, without them, they're just men. And here, uh, Rhaenyra says that the Iron Throne puts us a touch closer to gods, perhaps. But... If we're to serve the seven kingdoms, we must answer to their gods. And so she tells them, you can't go on these errands as warriors. You must go as messengers. Take no part in any fighting and swear it to me under the eyes of the seven. And holds out this, the book of the faith. <laughs> like, what's the book called? Do you know? 
I think it's called the Seven Pointed Star. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I thought, and um, I totally totally remember that. And <laughs> and they swear on it like a Bible at a courtroom, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just shows you how firmly dedicated she is to not starting the physical war. They both swear it, and she thanks them, and she gives them some some encouragement and reassures them about their trips to come. She tells Jace that Krieg and Stark is closer to his age than hers, and maybe they can find some common ground to negotiate. And he's like, okay, okay. And then Luke steps forward with a worried look on his face. But his mother's perfect, right? She'd never put him in danger with a careless oversight, like how the Greens may be sending out dragons also, right? Right? And so uh, Storm, she tries to encourage him. Storm's end, it's a short flight. You know, she picks this because it's the quick, easy trip and he's got the smallest dragon and, oh, it's so sad. She's trying to like, like do something to help him and let him like uh, show, to let him grow into his position as a potential heir and prince uh, with an easy task to start. And it's just, it just doesn't work out. And uh, she tells him, you have... Baratheon blood from Rhaenys and Boros is an eternally proud man. He'll be honored to host a prince of the realm and his dragon. Little little does she know that he's already got a bigger prince and a bigger dragon there. Yeah, and, uh, I call that on the rewatch. It's like, oh, prince of the realm and his dragon. Yeah, the biggest dragon. The biggest dragon and the most badass oh. prince. And uh, the camera focuses on their two hand on their hands holding each other as uh, as they're talking here in a, in a mo- moment of silence as they kind of um, just embrace each other's hands and she's imparting strength into Luke and he looks worried, but he trusts her because she's perfect and she wouldn't make a dumb decision and he wants to be strong and and live up to his, his roles. And uh, so he doesn't voice any of his fears. And speaking of that, when Corliss came walking down the stairs into the map room, Luke had a look on his face like, oh, he's he's doing well. Phew. Oh, oh, nice. I'm not going to have to be the Lord of Driftmark and, you know, anytime soon. And unfortunately, you know, you'll never have the opportunity, kid. Uh, oh, so brutal. Yeah. Is it Luke or is he asked Luke says, yes, mother. And he's like, oh, your grace. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah she's, that was she's, funny. she's mom, but she's also the queen. But, yeah. Um, so that was a cute little moment. Quickly corrects and, uh, himself. Yeah, that's that's the last thing he says to her because she says, "Go to it then," and uh, yeah. they fly away. Um, I was trying to figure out who the third dragon was, but I'm pretty sure it's Melis. Yeah, Melis, it is. Uh, it is. Rainy's going to patrol the gullet. Yep. Really great music here as the the three dragons take flight, and they're all kind of flying together for a minute, and presumably, probably like westbound towards the continent of Westeros and um, they kind of split off and um, Luke has to go south towards uh, Storm's End and um, Rhaenys and Maelys probably just continue westbound towards the gullet or maybe southwest bound and then Jace has to uh, turn north uh, northwest bound towards the Vale of Arryn. It. It's a really good shot too. Jace and Vermax take off from the castle and they sort of fly out and then Maylis comes from behind him and kind of catches up and they zoom past the camera as Arax takes flight and then the camera pans with Arax and then they are all flying together. And the asymmetrical articulation of Arax's wings here as he flies past and each wing is moving slightly differently is just incredible. Super, super, super realistic looking. Great, great work with the animation. <laughs> and yeah, they split up and man, you know what it made me think of? What's that? The quote from Game of Thrones, when the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. It's the thing about dragons and dragon riders. They're, you know, by nature, they're a lone wolf. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Rhaenyra, via the prophecy, is trying to convey is she needs to hold the realm together. The pack so together. So that it's not, yeah, hold the pack together. And that way it's not just the, the you know, her and Damon or her and Cyrax and Damon and Caraxes. They're not where they're all working together. Yeah, Not, uh, separately. And instead of snow falling, we have a storm blowing, you know, instead of the white winds and 
Arax and Lucerus fly off alone like Lone Wolf. And, oh, and it's just like the Starks little saying there. But uh, yeah, like you were saying, next it cuts to darkness. Uh, yeah, right as Luke flies, Luke and Vermax fly into the storm. It's uh, very foreboding to fly even an airplane in that kind of weather, much less a reptilian beast. Oh, Arax. You said Vermax. Have I got them backwards? Yeah, uh, Luke's is Arax and um, Jace has Vermax. Oh, okay. I did have them backwards. Cool. Awesome. Noted. Yeah, because when I discovered the dragon's name, it was when he landed at Storm's End in the courtyard. And it says Arax, like uh, Grumbles or something. And I was like, oh, Arax. Okay, that's a cool name. (laughs) Excellent. And so Damon is going through these dark corridors with nothing but a torch. And he's stuck, like, it's almost a hum at first, I think. When, and then we hear him start to sing. And Matt Smith has a pretty good voice. Yeah, not bad. Um, he's continuing to, to move forward in the passageway and continues to sing in High Valyrian and really cool sounding lyrics. And he kind of finally comes into this open chasm sort of uh, situation, and which reminded me of Tyrion when he went down into the depths of Marine. Oh yeah, to, good call. Um, Tyrion unleashed them, didn't he? Or no? Yeah, he uh, he took the chains off of them. Danny had gone away, I think, or something, and nobody was there to do yeah. it. And he went in and don't kill me. <laughs> you know, yeah, unchained absolutely. their necks. Yeah, and he said, "Don't eat the help." I remember all the all the theories, ours yeah. included, that uh, oh, Tyrion is blood of the dragon because they didn't roast him, they didn't eat him. Yeah, very um, interesting. Which still could be true. Like that's definitely something George could explore in the books, and he very well may. That's what's taking so long. Um, <laughs> Maybe it'll be important in the Jon Snow series. Yeah, Jon Snow, knows? you're my lost brother, Tyrion. <laughs> <Here>. <laughs> we have to find all the secret Targaryens. Tyrion Targaryen, first of his name. <laughs> yeah. I legitimize you as king of the north. But um, he, uh, he, he sets the lantern down, which was an interesting, I, was, I wouldn't expect him to do that, and continues singing. And then do we get a little glimpse of Vermithor before he lights up the fire? Or like, it's just Yeah, you can see him just fire. kind of lurking out in the darkness just a little and his wings are off to the sides. And it's just like a, a blurred shadow sort of beyond yeah, Damon I mean, in it's the a darkness. Dark, yes, inside the mountain, I think. And it's just total darkness. Like when Drogon appears out of the darkness to roast Varys in yeah. season eight. It's just those dark dragons, like you can't see them. And there's like steps up to a little plateau and a couple columns mm-hmm. and a hallway leading up to it, all carved from the, the living rock. Crazy, crazy. And then just Vermithor out of nowhere just blah, unleashes. I mean, like this may be the biggest, <sighs> longest gout of flame we've seen in either show. Maybe. Drogon had some pretty good roast fests. Yeah. But like Vermithor really unleashes the fire here and just every way up and kind of pans his head across the room and just lights Damon's face, not literally, but the light of the fire. <laughs> illuminates <laughs> Damon's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. That's the better word. Illuminates Damon's face. And uh, he's just kind of looking at it as the bronze fury, the second biggest dragon in oh. the universe. And he manages to keep his cool too. He, he seems a little bit nervous when the fire starts breathing, but he keeps his, keeps, calm keeps singing the song and interestingly when have we seen a dragon light fire like we unleash the fire like you said one of my favorite symphony x songs the <laughs> the the opening track to the odyssey uh great album if you're interested in symphonic metal technical progressive power symphonic metal uh but we had seen something similar a few episodes prior with Amond when he snuck down into the dragon pit after the pink dread situation when he encountered Dreamfire down there. The same, the dragon did the same thing ah, and shot fire all over the ceiling and he fell over on his back and it ran, remember? So these are like mm-hmm. another parallel between Damon and Amond alone in the darkness inside of a cave with a dragon lurking in the dark, shooting fire on the ceiling. Basically the same thing with the two different dudes. 
Absolutely. They're really hammering home the parallels between these two. And uh, this the scene is just mesmerizing, man. And I, I found some information about the song from from Screen Rant. The title of Damon's nice. lullaby in House of the Dragon is Haros Bartosi, which translates to with three heads in English. Game of Thrones language creator David J. Peterson added another stanza to the song in its English, tra- English translation to properly convey the meaning of the lullaby, which is a haunting tune about dragons, their connection to House Targaryen, and perhaps even the prince that was promised prophecy. Since Damon's lullaby was successful in calming Vermithor, it's possible that the song was already sung to the dragon by the previous writer, King Jaehaerys I. Nice. Here's the English translation of Damon's High Valyrian song via David J. Peterson. Fire breather, winged leader, but two heads to a third sing. From my voice, the fires have spoken and the price has been paid. With blood magic, with words of flame, with clear eyes to bind the three, to you I sing as one we gather, and with three heads we shall fly as we were destined beautifully, freely. Bro, is he trying to like dragon horn Vermithor <laughs> and another? Know. I don't know. I mean, is he gonna ride is he gonna ride Caraxes, but also like sort of command Vermithor and Silverwing together? Like that Danny with Viserion and Rhaegal. That would be Bro, nuts. That, like that song, is, he talks about a three, basically a three-headed dragon. Yeah. So the it, unclaimed... It, it, and there's a little more information... Um, right, that's spoilery. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, just more yeah. context about the song. If you want to finish your thought, then I'll uh, read it. Man, that, yeah, but that, like, I mean, I'm thinking he's take, just kind of getting Vermithor used to humans again because yeah. Jaehaerys has, has been dead for a while. And if he can figure out that he can approach Vermithor without getting roasted or crunched, he'll take uh, Reyna, possibly, to go claim Vermithor. That's what I was thinking. They could do their duet <laughs> and sing together to him. Yeah. Uh, and, or we, and we talked about and or Silverwing. Mm-hmm. Not and or, but or Silverwing. But this seems like some Damon has something very different in mind. It's entirely possible. Uh, for some more context from Screen Rant, they add, wow. as beautiful as the lullaby was without any context, Damon's dragon song is far more powerful when discerning its real meaning. The first stanza is describing three dragons, but more importantly seems to be describing three Targaryens, Aegon the Conqueror and his sister wives, Visenya and Rhaenys. The second stanza in House of the Dragon's High Valyrian Song, is referring to the blood magic sacrifices made in Valyria, likely by the Targaryens. The stanza's lyrics are also seemingly describing the doom of Valyria, as the land was devastated by fire and natural disasters. The doom of Valyria was theorized to be caused by blood magic, suggesting the doom was a price to be paid for such sorcery. While the words of flame in the song's third stanza could be representing Aegon's dream and his inscription of the prophecy in the Valyrian cat's paw dagger. It may also be referring to a Valyrian wedding ceremony to bind the three Targaryens in marriage through fire and blood, the conqueror and his, conqueror and his sister wives. The marriage between the conquerors, Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys is why House Targaryen's sigil is a dragon with three heads, which is represented by the lyrics in the lullaby's fourth stanza. The three Targaryens are able to fly freely in Westeros, with destined being a crucial translation that applies to Aegon's prophecy. So yeah, it the, like you mentioned, binding and the dragon horns, they're, in the books they do speak of these dragon horns, which you the Valyrian dragon riders would use to bind the dragons to their will. And if I remember correctly, somebody has one on a boat. And one of the characters, I don't want to say who or anything, too spoilery potentially. Read the books. Yeah, 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 exactly. Read the books. But somebody blows the horn and it roasts their lungs 
from like burns their lungs up from the inside and uh, only people that are Targaryen potentially can blow the horn without being killed by the, uh, the fiery ness <laughs> of it. Maybe even just Danny, maybe the unburnt. Maybe. Which yeah. Is a special, even within the Targaryens is a speciality. Yeah, seriously. Um, Chaos Demon wrote on Twitter, Damon is such a Targaryen history nerd. I love him so much. Singing a dragon <laughs> song, using all of his knowledge to protect his family, even risking his own life. <laughs> Thought that was pretty cool. Nice. Yeah, pretty crazy scene. And then that, but that's all we get. He, he, he yeah, it, Vermithor comes close. It seems see to calm a little bit down. of his detail. His teeth are like jagged and they're crooked. They're not like shark's teeth. They're not like alligator. They're like it's like a mixture of shark and it. dinosaur. Yeah, it really is. It's really gnarly, angled all crazy, and his jaw is like waggling back and forth. Like wow, wow, wow! It's crazy. <laughs> And he kind of comes close, and uh, we zoom in on Vermithor's eye. We zoom in on Damon's eye. Like you can see the dragon in the reflection of Damon's pupil. Yeah. And they just have this moment, and then that's it. It just cuts to the next scene, right? Yeah. The last like, time we saw, we yeah, <laughs> the last time we had seen a dragon and a human make eye contact like that, it was Lena right before she got roasted by Vagar. So it seems like they connected in some way in this moment as they yeah. you, they reflected each other's eyes and everything. And I'm really curious Absolutely. to see what happens. Too bad we have to wait until like 2040 for the next freaking season. Oh, man, brutal. <laughs> but uh, I was trying to find some music for uh, Sir Richard Horsfield, and we finally found it from season yeah. six. It wasn't season seven or eight like we were looking. But in that search, I uh, rewatched the Danny and John uh fly around the town at Winterfell and before John mounts Rhaegal. John and whichever dragon he rides, it's got to be Rhaegal, have this kind of eyeball connection moment before John mounts him. And I'd forgotten that John is a legitimate dragon rider. Yeah, so going yeah. forward, like Danny is dead and Drogon is unclaimed. Obviously, he's the, all the theories that Drogon carried uh, Danny off to shy by the shadow or somewhere else to be reanimated i, I mean who so. knows that'd be so cool john literally rode a dragon and Rhaegal got killed maybe he'll find an ice john, dragon in the north in theory probably the, if they were to go epic with the, some people are like john the john snow show should be like these simple little fun adventure stories with torment and the island of skagos and random stuff up at the wall but like if they wanted to go big and epic and something totally wild Ice dragons conquering, you know, the far north of Essos. I mean, this is a million possibilities. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so badass, dude. So next, it cuts over to the storm again, and Arax is swooping down towards Storm's End with its giant central tower that rises up like a huge middle finger to the gods as the Baratheons defy their will by conquering the storms with their insanely thick castle walls that <laughs> seems to defy all the gods' efforts to destroy it. And <laughs> it's a really cool looking castle. And yeah, very cool. Arax comes zooming around it and lands down in the courtyard and he hops down from Luke hops down from Arax as the guards are staring silently, ominously and Arax is kind of agitated and as Luke walks forward we hear it a deep grumble <laughs> oh man it's so awesome right then, right then turn around, give your little message throw your message at the guards hey, <laughs> give this to your lord I'm out of here. Hop back on that, your dragon, and get out of there. Yeah. Run. Uh, totally. And so then lightning flashes, and we see Vagar <laughs> lurking off to the side. And he kind of <laughs> shakes his head, and his tongue is flapping. And Luke is like, oh, <laughs> oh shit. Aemon is here. And uh, he explains to the guards who he is, and they bring him inside. And oh, man, I was thinking that, you know, Vagar must be reacting to Arax's arrival. And I don't think they've yeah. had any interactions before, as we know. There's no history 
between Arax and Vagar. So there's no pre-existing emotional connection between the two, which probably made it easier for, you know, Vagar to look at him as prey and not as a peer. Um, and I, I felt like Vagar is like looking down, like, who is this little bitch? You know, <laughs> like, who's this little <laughs> tiny little squirm worm? And uh, so he, Luke is escorted inside where he's met in the, where he meets Boros Baratheon in the Great Hall. And, and he's announced and Valaria. thunder and lightning strikes again. And we see that Aemond is already sta- in there, standing off to the left. And he's with a woman, which, you know, right off the bat, Luke should have seen this, realized that he's been betrothed to a Baratheon woman and just left right then. The deal is impossible to make because the the black the greens have already made a deal. He should have just booked it right at that moment. But yeah. dutifully he, you know, tries to follow through with his thing. And um it's interesting we learn we do learn that that Aemond has been betrothed to a Baratheon and it's remindful of how Rob Stark had to betroth himself to a Frey woman to get access to and passage through the twins and the critical yep. bridge that the Freys command. Similar type situation here. Oh, you want the Baratheons? Then, you know, we want in for the royal family, basically. You gotta marry one of my daughters. <laughs> and so he tells Boros he's brought a message from the queen, his mother. And he's like, huh, the queen, huh? Earlier this day, you know, I uh, received an envoy from the king. So which is it, king or queen? And right off the bat, he's being an ass. And I'm like, oh, God, this is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. And further insults the House of the Dragon, saying, the House of the Dragon does not seem to know who rules it. And he's chuckling to himself. Like, what's your mother's message? Luke just holds out his hand, (laughs) which is hilarious. And one of his guards. Little gangster move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right here. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the guards grabs it and brings it up to Lord Boros. And we figure out that he is um, illiterate. Lord, Yeah, Lord Boros the illiterate. That's what I'm going to refer to him as now. <laughs> yeah, good call. Um, and I guess it's not entirely unusual for Lords of Westeros to be illiterate. But I was surprised that one of the sort of greater houses, the Baratheons, would have an illiterate lord. That's that's surprising. You'd think like Stark, they're trained from early childhood to to read and write and do all this. Same with the Targaryens. Um, and yeah, so the Baratheons, you would think that they would be also. But, you know, like it's one thing for the Freys or the the Ironborn. What are they? What's their last name? Greyjoys. Greyjoys. Um, you know, lower lords type thing. Um, but yeah. So a little bit surprising. And uh, he's like, where's the bloody maester? Kind of reminded me of King Robert at that point. Yeah, that was definitely a Robert kind of sound in line. Yeah. <laughs> and he, they wait for the maester and Luke is, Luke is looking nervous with Aemon just lurking off to the side. And so he he reaches up and grabs the hilt of his sword, which is uh, just like his brother had been doing throughout the episode. And... Uh, Boros gets whispered in his ear by the maester and he's like, remind me of my father's oath. Like, oh, he's all pissed at the wording and the phrasing of it. Mm -hmm. Like, let me remind you, Lord Boros, that your family has sworn an oath. You know, Rhaenyra talking down to him, I guess. And Mm -hmm. he interprets it uh, as being disrespectful. So he returns the disrespect at least King Aegon came with an offer. He says, my swords and banners for a marriage pact. If I do as your mother bids, which of my daughters will you wed, boy? And he looks over and there's like three daughters lined up. And you should have been like, all three of them. But <laughs> <laughs> I may be small, but I'm enough man for all of them. And uh, <laughs> he's like, my lord, I'm not free to marry. I'm already betrothed. So you come with empty hands? Go home, pup. And the way he said pup, called him that, that was mm. damn disrespectful, you know? Yeah, Prince prince of the Realm, heir to Driftmark. Yeah, bastard. 
<laughs> so Boros seems to know about the bastardy and uh, isn't playing any of Rhaenyra's shit, apparently. So he's like, tell your mother that the Lord of Storm's End is not some dog that she can whistle up at need to set against her foes. And Luke is doing his best to be diplomatic and respectful. Mm -hmm. And I shall take your answer to my queen, my lord. And as he turns to go, Prince Aemon is like, wait, my lord strong. And his eyeball is just glaring. <laughs> Ugh. Did you really think that you could just fly about the realm trying to steal my brother's throne at no cost? And from his perspective, you know, this is a major infraction. Like, you know, legit, he's flying around the realm trying to steal his brother's throne. And it's just, you know, they both feel this way. But yeah, but uh, it's no small deed. And definitely. Uh, I will not fight you. <laughs> I came as a messenger, not a warrior. I came only as a messenger, not a warrior. <laughs> fight would be little and, challenge. Uh, exactly. Totally doesn't even, that'd be nothing. <laughs> Is this where he pulls off the eye patch? I want you to put out your eye. And he's got a fucking sapphire in his eyes. Sapphire. Oh! So gnarly. I wonder how they did that. You think it's all CG post production, or do you think they used like um, a big, huge, full eyeball contact that looks like a sapphire? You know how, like. Yeah, uh, it's probably, yeah, it's probably all in post. Yeah, that's know. what I was thinking too, but. Remember Jim Carrey when he did the movie uh, The Grinch? He had wore big yellow contacts and they like made his oh, eyes nice. really sore. <laughs> uh, so he pulls off his eye and he just looks so badass. Like this is really cool. George did a nice job thinking about thinking of that. Mm -hmm. He's like, uh, I want you to put out your eye as payment for mine. <laughs> One will serve. So crazy. I would not blind you. And he, he takes his dagger out and tosses it. And it clatters across the ground towards towards Luke. And it's kind of it reminded me of the scene where the Joker pretends to be dead and takes out Gamble, the, the, the dude, when he how out alive. And, he, you know, he jumps up and kills him after telling him about his scars. One of those fake stories. The uh -huh. really the good one about his father being a drunk and then there's two like henchmen left over and he's like unfortunately we only have one slot available so we're gonna have tryouts and he cracks a pool <laughs> cue and stuff. tosses it down to him and the way it like clatters across the ground sort of just reminded yep. me of that crazy and uh He's like, one eye will serve. I would not blind you. Mm, plan to make it a gift to my mother. And it's like, dude, he's just like Allison. He learned this from her, the like legit eye for an eye thing. Because she already yeah. tried to get his eye. So this idea mm -hmm. has been in his head, just boiling and festering for years at this point. He's like, I want that eye. I still want that eye, boy. Yeah. Luke stands up to it. No. Yeah. And Boros is sitting back in his chair at this point like, Whoa, what is what is going on here? Yeah, Luke stands yep. up for himself and he's like, then you're a craven as well as a traitor. And he rushes forward towards them, like lunging. And Boros is like, not here. And un undeterred, Eamon presses forward. Give me your eye or I will take it, bastard. And the way he lunges forward and poses dramatically with a dagger, picking it up off the floor, he looked like legit maniacal. Uh, great yeah, performance. Absolutely. Couldn't have been better casting for this guy. Like he looks like a lunatic. It's awesome. And this is when Boros like stands up. And he's like, not in my hall. The boy came as an envoy. I'll not have bloodshed beneath my roof. And I'm thinking at this point, don't leave, Luke. <laughs> you know, if he's not going to bludge yeah, under this roof, roof just exactly. stay until Amond leaves. <laughs> Don't go. Yeah, but Boros doesn't. Boros doesn't give him that option. Take yeah. Prince Lucerus back to his dragon. Yeah, so exactly. Kicking him out Ugh. now. Oh man! So they escort him away, and then is it? I think this is where uh, Amond has the dagger back in his hand already, and he kind of flips it around in his hand. Super crazy. Super awesome. And yeah, classic like gunslinger move, you know, flipping the revolver. Yeah. And, <laughs> yep. and apparently in the books, one of 
Boros's other daughters at this point. Aemond mm-hmm. lets Luke leave. And the daughter says like, what? Did he take your eye or one of your, did he take one of your eyeballs or one of your testicles? You know, like, what are you, what are you, are you a craven? Basically? I can't remember what the, what's the exact mm-hmm. quote. Um, so, uh, I'd have to find it, but that, that's the gist of it. Uh, did he, did he take, uh, one of your eyes or your manhood as well. Balls. Yeah. If I want to, I want a husband with all his parts. I mean, what, what happened? Do, do balls drop off? And so <laughs> yeah, in the book, that's what triggers him to go out and hop on Vagar. But we don't see that here. All we, we the camera follows Luke as he hurriedly rushes mm-hmm. out and uh, Amond is furious and Luke is scared. So Vagar is also furious and Arax is scared. Because the dragons and masters seem to not only have like a mind meld to some extent, but they they share not only physical pain, but emotional feelings, it seems. So, mm-hmm. but the dragon, but but the humans can control their emotions to some extent, while the dragons don't care to bother. I mean, why? Why would, why do they have to, why would they ever have to worry about that? It's not like they have to deal with interpersonal blowback or consequences <laughs> like humans do. They don't have to rein in their emotions at all. So it's interesting yeah. to ponder to what extent the emotions of humans influence their dragons and vice versa. If if mm. Vagar's angry, does Aemon get angry? You know, uh, we've already discussed potentially that dragons can impart strength to their riders um, as injured people rush to their dragons to try to stay strong in certain circumstances. But does does dragon rage fuel the fury of the men who ride them too? Uh, crazy impossible could Vagar sense Amon's hatred and act on it because he doesn't possess the same capacity for restraint as Amon, which is already barely any <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> oh, crazy I figured out the whole problem they're speaking to the dragons in English <laughs> a little bit that was back and forth no back. Vagar no Vagar <laughs> he did say sir I think he said uh, obey or serve at one time Arax no Arax Bro, imagine, man, Erex, if nothing, he's he's got balls to blast the biggest dragon in the world with flame. Yeah, I mean, no kidding. You got to be confident in yourself to do that. No kidding. Um, <laughs> I found the quote from the book. Come on, hit me. Hit me. <laughs> hit me with it. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so Boros has... Luke escorted to his, outside to his dragon. And in the book, here's the quote. It says, uh, you came here as a craven and a traitor, Prince Aemon answered. I will have your eye or your life strong. At that, Lord Boros grew uneasy. Not here, he grumbled. He came as an envoy. I want no bloodshed beneath my roof. So his guards put themselves between the princelings and escorted Lucerus Valerian from the round hall back to the castle yard where his dragon, Arax, was hunched down in the rain, awaiting his return. And there it might have ended, but for the girl Maris, the second-born daughter of Lord Boros, less comely than her sisters. She was angry with Aemond for preferring them to her. Was it one of your eyes he took or one of your balls? Maris asked the prince in tones sweet as honey. I am so glad you chose my sister. I want a husband with all his parts. (laughs) Brutal. Sick sick burn. Yeah. Yeah. So that set him off in the books and he went out and Mm. bind, bind and chewed and destroyed. Pretty epic. So we get outside. Arax is all flustered with everything that's going on. He senses the unease in Lucerus and his fear. And so he's kind of growling out there and grumbling. And Luke tries to calm him down. He's, he's like, focus, pay attention, Arax. All in, in Valyrian. Be calm, listen, obey. Goes through a whole list of commands. And Vagar is gone now. He looks over towards the wall where he had been and there's no sign of him. And the storm is thicker than it had been before. And it's blustering and chaotic out. And it's, it's, it's pretty scary. And he hops on <laughs> and starts flying through the sky to try to escape. And it seems like he may be escaping at first. But we get a, a view from behind 
approaching and it looks like it may be like a view from Vagar's direction. Then a grumble, that low low growl again. Mm. We always get to, Mm. you know, like you said, hear the dragons before we see them. And so Luke riding on the back of Eric's turns to look in the direction from that last camera shot had been, but there's nothing there. And he's like, ah, then it shows a shot from beneath as he's flying across and through a gap in the clouds, we see the giant larger dragon above him. And then he disappears (laughs) behind another cloud. Man, this is so crazy. Such a crazy shot because we can see it, but Luke can't. This is literally like a 747 flying above a little Cessna. Cessna. The size comparison is just enormous. Enormous. And Luke must hear something above him because he looks up and he's like, oh shit, I don't see anything. And he's nothing, nothing's there. And then a couple seconds later, apparently Vagar and and Eamon got enough distance so that they could turn around and come at him head on. And it's like a game of dragon chicken uh, for (laughs) for a moment. (laughs) And uh, they, whoa! He flies past and we hear Eamon laughing over the storm and like a a classic uh, pirate moment or something like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It seemed familiar to me like... Uh, there's, I guess there's probably a lot of scenes like that, like uh, where the bad guy's laughing in the background, but you can't see him. And, and after a narrow miss, Eric's flapping his wings, frantically trying to escape. But after just seconds, Vagar closes in from behind, chasing him. Ow! Vagar snaps his jaws at him and reaches with his claw to try to grab him. No dice. And this is a scene uh, right out of the books. Uh, Doug Wheatley, one of his illustrations, where uh, Vagar and Eamon are right behind him, just gunning for him. And I mentioned on the live show that uh, Eamon here is just setting up a bad situation. You can't expect a dragon to understand that you're only pretending the other dragon is prey, right? Like if you have a dog and you sick it on something, it's not going to know the difference between joking and and like, oh, this is actually a squirrel you should eat. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, they're going to go for and it. Even here, I mean, Vagar does a big chomp and then reaches down, you know, with her claws. Like, I, at, at this point already, I don't know that Vagar's not already out for blood. Yeah. Um, obviously, getting he flamed in the, the face. Anger. Yeah, getting flamed in the face, you know, that definitely, you know, sets Vagar off even more. But even here, I, after rewatching, I'm like, man, Vagar may have been going for blood right here, even though Eamon is just kidding, just playing around, man. Yeah, I think he was too, for sure. And I, I think it's at this point where Luke uh, tries to use the small maneuverability of his dragon and he enters a steep dive. Um and is trying to to get down low and outmaneuver Vagar and Eamon. Uh, but Eamon puts Vagar in the same dive. And so the rain and the wind is flying. Um, as Vagar enters the, the dive, all the ropes uh, that are attached to Vagar, oh, they're flying everywhere. Love those uh, ropes. Eamon is still just, you know, maniacal, just laughing and smiling, just knowing that there's almost no chance for this little dragon and this little boy to get away from him and his enormous beast. And um, once they kind of get down low near the water, um, Luke, I think, sees a little a canyon, almost a crevice, a little bit bigger in the rocks. So he's like, all right, yeah. More pod racing. Me, Yeah, exactly. This is straight pod racing. Or Top Gun Maverick. But uh, yeah, they... Um, Luke and Erex enter the canyon and it's really tight. At some points, uh, Erex is like pulling his wings in um, enough to clear the rocks, but still he's able to keep his lift and keep flying. Yeah, that's flying. true. Like, not, like an owl. Yeah, if you bring remember. your wings all the way in, you know, you're going to start falling. But, you know, they can just do that and then put their wings right back out and maneuver some more. And then as they as they entered uh, the canyon, Vagar and Eamon have to do, you know, have to do a Top Gun move, just yeah. pull up to avoid <laughs> crashing into the rocks. I thought we Nine might get some, G's. some views of, of Vagar, like not hitting the rocks, but like almost pushing off 
and like climbing the rocks with its feet oh, as it's flying awesome. to keep to keep from smashing into it. But I guess so they were cool. far enough away to where they just entered this like vertical climb to avoid, you know, the, the rocky outcropping. And then we get more cool shots of Vagar and Amond above the canyon and Luke and Arax, you know, flying down, uh, flying the canyon down below. And um, there's this awesome overhead shot of Vagar and you can see her wingspan and it's just enormous. enormous above that canyon. Colossal. And it's like in the moments that he, that Vagar is kind of hovering over the canyon in this moment of calm and and peace where Aemond is trying to scout and look down beneath for Arax. And this is when he yells, you owe a debt. You owe a debt. Oh man, that is so crazy. So ominous. Ah. Uh. And the rain and the wind is crazy. I mean, they're like yeah, drenched, just madness, soaking drenched. And uh, then he crosses over the end of the canyon, and he's looking for him. And that's when, out of nowhere, you hear Luke screaming, "No, Arax!" Then Arax comes out of the mist from the side, and boom, just flames the side of Vagar's face. Mm-hmm. And Vagar's like, Argh! And you can hear Luke screaming, no, Arax, serve me. me. And you can tell that Arax is not doing what, what he's, what, what Luke wants him to do. Luke has sworn to be a messenger, not a warrior. And uh, so I was surprised at first that all of a sudden Arax is attacking, but then you hear that Luke is telling him, no, no, no. And it must just be that, that Arax is, is feeling Luke's fear and feeling the threat of, you know, he understands the threat of the larger dragon and he just takes actions into his own hands uh, to try to save his rider and to save himself. And he blasts Vagar. And this is where things turn really bad. This pisses off Vagar, who growls and and as Vagar kind of lurches and starts behaving on his own, Aemon is sitting on the top getting jostled around in the saddle and he's pulling on the reins and saying, no, Vagar, serve me. Cause Vagar is just doing his own thing at this point. No, no, serve me. And then it cuts back to Luke and Arax and Arax is pumping his wings fiercely, trying to escape in panic mode. And then he boom, crosses out into the open air and he starts gliding and his wings slow down. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Keep moving, keep moving. And Luke is looking around and then just out of nowhere from the clouds, Vagar just whoop, appears and just munches them both. And, Immediately, oh, like, there's man. no chance. It's like no that chance scene for... out of uh, How to Train Your Dragon, except they actually get caught and eaten by the bigger dragon. <laughs> and at first I thought that Vagar just oh, nah, nah, munch and chew and then just spits them out like, you know, just, and he does. But he, oh, I, looked, I looked closely and Johnny Storr pointed this out to me. Um, Johnny from Outlawed Paint in, in Cali. If you need a good paint job on your car or, or motorcycle, hit him up because he's, he's awesome, award-winning painter. He pointed out to me that no pieces of Lucerus are falling with, <laughs> with Arax. He ate Lucerus and spit out the dragon. <laughs> and I watched closely and I see no pieces of Lucerus. Yeah, one, um, on screen. Screen Crush or another uh, recap video, they said they thought they saw Luke falling. And I saw somebody else say they thought they saw his cloak falling, but I'm not sure. It's all yeah, it's just pe- little pieces. It's really hard to but tell. Either way, it's, you know, I mean, just obliterated instantly. Nothing Luke could do. There's no way he could have avoided it. Like, Vagar had, had a oh. line on him, and it was just immediate. It's like, uh, you know, what this reminds me of is that seal hunting technique that the great white sharks use off of seal island down in the south where there's Mm -hmm. this underwater um geography where there's a flat ocean and it kind of curves up towards the beginning of this island and the seals will be you know doing their thing at the top and the the great whites just boom launch up and intercept the seals in mid mid swimming and they sometimes the great whites launch out of the air and it's breaching it's famous for getting you know people get great footage of the great whites breaching down there breaching out of the water is a special adaptation learned by great whites at seal island to help them surprise and capture their prey 
And this is like the same thing. Vagar calculates where he needs to be to intercept Arax in his flight pattern and just boom, just obliterates him. And yeah, it seems, yeah, it's hard to, it's really hard to tell if he f eats him fully or not. <laughs> I'm watching it right now. Um, oh, it's it's really hard to tell. I can't tell. I, I think he ate him, dude. I think he ate Lucerus. Brutal. <laughs> so I'm wondering if, we, if, if in season two, if they say they found Eric's body washed up on the beach or Luke and Eric's body, or if they say anything about it, how Damon finds out. I had an idea. They go out into the open air here. It's possible that Rhaenys is on Maylie's patrolling the area and she sees it in the distance and hears the screams. And uh, mm. so that could be possible. And then she hustles back to 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 Dragonstone to give the word. But yeah, this is not as intended by either anybody here. Uh Arax is not obeying. Vagar is no, not obeying. It lends credence to what King Viserys had said earlier in this series when he was speaking with Rhaenyra in front of Beleriand's skull. And he said that the idea that we control the dragons is an, an illusion. It seems like the dragons just wreak havoc on everything and then the Targaryens just take, take credit for it as if it was their idea, <laughs> you know, their command. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know, I, all in all, it's it's really interesting twist that this is all kind of a big accident. Um, I mean, not fully an accident, but because they shouldn't be playing chicken with dragons. But <laughs> their in Eamon's intention wasn't to kill him. It was to scare him and, and kind of run him off and to toy with him. But obviously, when a dragon's involved, dragons don't understand playtime, toy time. Um, mm -hmm. So, but... After thinking about it, I, I do like the book version better where Eamon is just ruthless and he sees this as his opportunity to kill Prince Lucerus, his arch nemesis ever since he took his eye. Um, that just gives Eamon this absolute brutality and evil that is a little bit of that is taken away from him here. And, you know, it's an interesting wrinkle. It, it, it dramatizes it more and makes it more like fretful for us, for Eamon, for the greens now that, Oh no, what have we done? Obviously Rhaenyra is going to unleash fury on them. So, but you know, it's the absolute cutthroat part of it. Like, like I've said before that they, they take a little bit of that away from Allison and Rhaenyra and Eamon here, but still, no, it's not really a complaint, but it's, it's still really, really fantastic, but a slight book change. And, but it's one of those things is where it's a history book. So nobody knew Eamon's intention. Exactly. It's just the after effect. Oh, Eamon went and with Vagar and killed Luke and Arax. It's like the history books have no way of knowing Eamon's intent and what really happened up there in the sky. So it's just witness, eyewitnesses through a storm at Storm's End as they were flying away. So how could anybody know? So it's not that it's wrong from the books. It's Again, it's the whole point of the history book. Don't know. And the show is filling in the gaps. So it's really cool. Yeah, I love that. I really like that. Um, and, and it could be our the perception in the history book could be from the way that Eamon described it upon returning. So even in the book's case, this may have been what actually happened. But Eamon has to decide, you know, what if I, he's like, as he's sitting on top of Vagar, and he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, he's, he's looking around in panic, like, what have I done? You know, and he's got to be thinking, like, do I admit this was an accident? and look incompetent and unworthy of riding Vagar, or do, do I just embrace and be a kin, you know, and it's like, what's better being a kinslayer maniac or being an incompetent, unworthy dragon rider. And so mm. he must think about this on the ride home. And uh, I really like how they've done this. They've add, added more details to the circumstances in the books uh, to, instead of like canceling things out, they're just adding nuance. And in the books, he, he yeah. takes credit and embraces being a kinslayer and which I think we're going to see happen on the show, but we're, it's just adding to that learning that it may be built on a lie and an accident. And then as the war progresses and his reputation precedes him, he probably steps into the role of the public perception of himself and yeah. actually becomes that maniac. So I like the idea that that we're seeing him, you know, unwillingly sort of be forced into that role of the evil kinslayer. It's similar to Jamie Lannister, you know, it, like yep. he has his reputation of being a horrible kingslayer with uh, with no honor. 
And since nobody would would believe him or understand his his the truth, and he can't, he's sworn to protect Arius' secrets. He just sort of embraces the role and and acts the part and comes across as vicious and and ruthless and uh, diabolical. So I think we're going to see a similar type thing happen here with Aemond, where it's an accident, but it results in his the development of this persona that he em- ends up embodying and enjoying and uh, and relishing in. And uh, we, we, you know, he does like uh, it's it's lurking beneath the surface. You know, he wants the eye. He he poses like a maniac with a dagger. And now it's like, uh, you know, it just just needed a little push. Right. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's one of the first things um, I'm excited to see next season is what happens when he gets back to King's Landing, how he plays it. Um, what Allison, what her how, what her take is on how they should play it politically. Um, obviously, it's happened. You know, how are we going to spin it? We're going to yeah. spin it as they attacked us or are we just going to say, no, we murdered him. It's war. Let's go. But, you know. Eamon flies away, you know, you know, away in the sunlight and he's just total, just shock, fear, regret, uh, just he's, he's, this may be the first time he's ever realized that he is not in control of that dragon. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. It seems that way. And, uh, this seems to be like a recurring theme throughout the show, people letting people think things and perceive them in a certain way. And then, you know, acting uh, as if that's the case, because people have said like they've softened Alicent, but we may just be learning that she embraced the perceptions of those around her, like Damon, who didn't deny the accusations of the heir for a day, who didn't deny sodomizing uh, Rhaenyra at the whorehouse, and Rhaenyra, who didn't deny having Lynar killed. They let these people have these conceptions to make them seem scarier and more intimidating, and. Uh, Maybe that's the case with uh, Amond as well, that he just sort of fell into the role of the big bad wolf and uh, decided to embrace it and roll with it so that people wouldn't mess with him as much. <laughs> and uh, so I think we'll get that sort of vicious, ruthless, diabolical Amond down the line, but it makes it all the more sort of tragic and impactful that it seems to have started as an accident. Yeah, it feels like they're they're adding more depth to the book rather than changing things and taking things away, mm-hmm. which we've seen in other adaptations. Uh, you know, they have like a sort of a skeleton story to work with, and I'm I've been really impressed with how they're fleshing it out and adding all the musculature and and everything like that. Um, it's crazy. You know, so much like the the parents set the dominoes in motion by teaching the kids to view each other as threats, the kids set their own dominoes in motion by treating their dragons as pets <laughs> wrongly thinking that they can control them and like yeah. Amond activates Vagar's prey drive because he thinks he can control him but so dude Vagar thinks you're hunting bro you know <laughs> and uh, uh-huh. and the flame attack from Arax just settles it Arax senses a danger feels Luke's fear and acts it's not a game to the dragons um, even though, or, or to Luke, <laughs> but even if Eamon is just screwing around, but, uh, sometimes you just have to make some mistakes to learn, <laughs> to, to mm, learn the truth, some, you know, some brutal mistakes. Yeah. So Eamon is taunting him about owing, uh, owing him a debt, an eye for an eye. Now he's, he's taken his life. So is, does he owe a life debt? <laughs> you know, is someone going to try to claim it? Remember only death can pay for life. Oh man. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah. Pretty sure that's what Damon and Rhaenyra are. That's going to be their mindset going forward. Yeah, I think so. Only death, Only death can pay for life. We, um, man, I wonder how many takes they did of this shot because this is long tracking shot of Damon walking into the hall. He kind of goes left around the painted table. We zoom down the painted table <clears throat> and then he is, it's really interesting the way they decided to shoot this. Eamon and Rhaenyra both turn their backs to the camera and slowly walk toward the fireplace. Takes her hand to see, and leads her yeah, we, away. We don't get to see 
him give her the news or her like see their face and how he conveys the emotion of what has happened and how she immediately takes it. We see her kind of like stumble and almost like fall knowing that he just told her Luke is dead. He was killed on the way back. Whatever he told her, we don't know. Must have been witnessed by Rainis. He's been killed <clears throat> by, or it could, I mean, this could be the next day when they were found and then, Raven True. Yeah, slew. we don't know about. Who, I mean, we don't. We we they show it to us immediately, but with this show and same with Game of Thrones, you never from... really ignore yeah the passage of time exactly unless they talk about the time jumps. So, but she stumbles and falls and kind of you know recomposes herself, and the the I, I really wonder if this was the first take because I I, I just of the of her reaction shot here of her. But, and, but this is all one long shot. So they have to reset everybody, reset Damon to redo the shot. I'm sure they did it multiple times, but the way they did it and she turned and the timing as the camera got closer and closer to her and she turned and this, I mean, I don't even know how to describe that look. I mean, absolute fury, absolute sadness and just m- mourning. I mean, it's really everything. And uh, um, motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Like, the tables have turned. She said, if we strike, if war is going to happen, we're not going to uh, strike the first blow. And they did it. Eamon struck the first blow and it resulted in the death, you know, of her sweet boy. So yeah. it's, it's going to be, it's going to get real bad for everybody, but obviously for Eamon and the greens, it's going to be bad. Uh, yeah. It's, it's so sad, man, especially, you know, considering the last, like throughout this episode, Luke had shown that he has so much trust in her and she tried to tell him, you know, I'm imperfect. And this proves her imperfection, like all too painfully uh, in the, in the worst possible way. And she tried to make it easy. She gave him the easy mission, you know, Uh, but they should have known that other dragons were going to be flying around to similar places. And she just had a mindset of peace and didn't think, uh, you know, didn't you, you can never really account for the wild cards, you know? Yeah. And Damon or Amon, Damon and Damon, not and Amon are the wild cards of this story, I think mm-hmm. for the most part. So you just, and again, you know, like you said, her mindset is where's we haven't started the war. I'm trying to hold the realm together in peace uh, Allison said terms via auto. She said she's going to give her answer on the morrow, but the war hasn't started. Nobody has, has fired a shot. You know, nobody has, I mean, there's obviously been aggression, you know, use the greens usurping the throne, but there's been no violence yet. Um, but now there has, and she wasn't expecting that Luke obviously wasn't expecting that. So it, I really want to see, where we pick up at the the first scene of season two, if it's still aimed on Vagar and he turns back to King's Landing and, you know, he probably gives them the good news, bad news. Hey, uh, I got House Baratheon with us. Oh, great. Great job, Aemon. That's good. And I killed Lucerus. Yeah. <laughs> <Or> what? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really interesting so. to see how he, you know, how he handles it. Because like I was saying, either he can be known as a fool and an incompetent dragon rider who is like, doesn't even deserve it. Or you can be known as a kinslayer who is ruthless and vicious. And, you know, like he, is he going to act tough and own the disaster to save face and pretend it was all intentional? Um, or is he going to admit that he's an idiot and, <laughs> you know, and lose all credibility and respect? Mm, you know? I think he owns it and, Becomes the villain. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously he's been the villain sort of, but really, like you said, really embrace it. Yeah. He's going to just go full bore into that psychopathic reputation. Hopefully that's what I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be fun to watch. Never go full psycho. Never go full psycho. Um, yeah. Any, <sighs> any other thoughts you have on this, this episode or <laughs> anything else? I don't in think it? so, man, this has been so fun. Uh, very, honored to be on the show and come and talk with you guys every week. So thank you, Duncan. Thank you fans for being so supportive and uh, all our feedbackers. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, it's been so much fun uh, doing this these last two and a half months. I've had a great time. Yeah, it's been awesome having you. I've had a really good time as well. And uh, it's too bad we couldn't get Rachel in here for uh, <laughs> to be our, our number three. Um, but, you know, I'm sure we'll make it happen next time around, hopefully. Schedule conflicts, you know, we just couldn't make it happen, unfortunately. But yeah, it's been really awesome having you on the show and I've had a lot of fun. And um, I think we should uh, come back next weekend and do a live show uh, just as a, a season wrap up type thing. If you want, I guess this weekend, now that it's almost next weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you got time, okay. Johnny Stitches uh, is going to be down as well. Archmaster Stitches and uh, Sir Matthew of House Rep will hopefully have time as well. Um, I know you've got limited availability on Sundays, but we can, uh, you know, talk about it and see what we, what we figure out and, uh, try yeah, to make yeah, something happen. Fun. And mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So stick with us and we'll be right back after a short break. Yeah, what a crazy, mm. crazy this, thing. This, this whole episode is a here we go. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Let's do some Ravens calls. Uh, Sir Richard of House Horsefield says, well, 10 quick weeks have come and gone already. Sure has, Sir Richard. Now to be sad for the long winter that approaches. What an episode. What a season. What a show. No real cliffhanger to keep us on the edge of our seats. Wait, what? That was a cliffhanger to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Let me start that over. <clears throat> no real cliffhanger to keep us on the edge of our seats, which I'm glad of. But oh, man, the stage for the dance is well and truly set. Cannot wait for season two. Damon talking more in this episode than he has all season. <laughs> <Think so. laughs> and still the baddest MF in the room. More badass Grandma Rainey's action. Yeah. The return of the sea snake and the emergence of the Kinslayer. Oh. Uh, this is me saying a uh, uh, GOT had their kin Kinslayer with Jamie. And now a Hot D has their Kinslayer. Uh, Sir Richard continues. One season in, was and Jamie I a love Kinslayer this. as well as a Kingslayer? Oh, yeah, he was Kingslayer. I think sometimes he considers killing Tyrion, but he never does. <laughs> or Cersei. Right. He wants to strangle Tyrion. Too. Tyrion is the Kinslayer. He kills Tywin. Maybe that's yeah, what I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah. <laughs> so a Kingslayer in GOT and a Kinslayer in Hot D. Uh, Sir Richard continues, one season in, and I love this more than GOT. Wow, Ooh, nice. High praise. It's just better. <laughs> On a personal note, thank you guys for everything you've done this season. Your show is also amazing, and you've helped me keep sane on the long drives for work, as well as countless memes. <laughs> awesome. You're very welcome, yeah. Sir Richard. And uh, glad you get to listen to us while uh, riding across the beautiful Scottish and English countryside. Driving through the Scottish rain. <laughs> Driving through the rain. <laughs> We've got the last High Gardener of High Garden, Corey Eugene Kuhn. Saying Lord Boros Galifianakis was proud to host a prince and his dragon. Yeah, just not the nice. second second son <laughs> to arrive. <laughs> Deuces loses. <laughs> he's, oh. He's, oh. Too soon. So Too brutal. Soon. All right, pieces. He's got a gif of Zach Galifianakis. Oh, I'm fancy. <laughs> <laughs> On another note, he says, does it make me a bastard for agonizing over Eric's death while struggling off little, sh while shrugging, uh, while shrugging off little Lord Strong's demise as just the tune we needed to hear before we begin to dance? <laughs> oh. Yes, makes you a bastard. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that little dragon getting chomped up into all the pieces. That was, oh, was horrific. So sad. That was horrific. So sad. 
Sir Matthew of House Rep says, last week we saw a bottle episode in King's Landing as Allison, Otto, and the Greens scramble to take advantage of the small window of time left for them after Viserys' death becomes known throughout Westeros. This week, we see Rhaenyra and Damon's reactions. First off, the news of Alicent's betrayal sends Rhaenyra into early labor, delivering a half-dragon monstrosity, Ooh. the likes of which Mary Mazdor will later witness, born of Daenerys to Khal Drogo. Rago. Yeah. Damon leaps to action, calling his banners to war, while Rhaenyra preaches for peace, much like Otto and Alicent on the Greens. We see the Valerians swear to the Blacks, and Damon gives us that all-important dragon roll call. <laughs> While the Blacks outnumber the Greens at least two to one, one of those Greens three is Vagar. <laughs> As not to risk more rambling on, I'll just say that poor Luke's death may appear to have been an accident. It is the point of no return between the two Queen Mothers and the children they raised for war. Oh, man. Yeah, there's no forgiving after this. No. It's just going to be fire and blood, you know. Oh, it's going to be crazy. Princess Adela says, I have lots of questions about episodes 9 and 10, like the Alicent foot thing. How did, how did it get to that? Why doesn't she have Sir Kristen, Sir Suckup, take care of that? <laughs> Two things stood out to me in this in episode 10. During the dragon fight, did it seem like the dragons weren't obeying? Yeah, big time. Just like Viserys said, the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. Um, and would Damon really kill Rhaenyra? It seemed like he... You know, he, he was considering it for a second. She continues, I kind of thought he might feel something for her, but I guess the thought of losing the throne and Rhaenyra having knowledge of something he does not reminds him of being a second son and not a true heir. Yeah, that's true. Also, the idea of losing the throne probably had him all edged on edge. Like, it was finally going to happen. We're finally going to score. Like, Beavis and Butthead, but then nope. <laughs> You know, eight through 10 really hit home for me coming from a large multi-generation family. The shit is real hate and lies being passed down. And sometimes when we try to fix it, it's too late. And the younger generations suffer grief, loss and misunderstanding. Give people tunnel vision. Thanks for all the time you guys put into this. It's a highlight to my week. Thank you for listening, Lady Adela. It's great to hear from you and awesome to get some feedback for, from you for the finale. Thanks for writing in. And we've got a voicemail from Archmaster Stitches. Sir Duncan, Lord Yo. Zach. How you guys doing, man? That's it. That's a wrap on season one. It's Archmaster Stitches here from the Siren Isle with the sleeping dragon Janos right below me. <laughs> I'm uh, Ooh, up in the in Gambrel. The high Siren Tower of the Siren Isle right now, cleaning out the studio. Um, so I'm a little out of breath. Run up and down the stairs. Oh, man. All right. Anyway, last night, great, <laughs> great, great fucking episode. I feel like, um, I think, I feel like I'm feeling that way because of the last part, kind of the same way I felt with Rainice breaking through the dragon pit. <laughs> that being said, I feel like both of these episodes are like reflections of each other, not really yeah. like a season finale, not like a penultimate. So I kind of, this episode helps me forgive last episode a little more. Nice. It's like, oh, okay, I see what they did here. Two halves of a you whole. Know, with the exception of Amon, there was really no one from the, well, that and Hightower, but there wasn't a whole lot of like green influence on this, on this episode. I mean, granted, it's a dramatic in the, at the end, there's a massive green influence with Amon's, uh, uh, snackery. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, man. Um, but snake. yeah, I feel like mirror reflections of each other. Like last one was the green episode. This one is the black episode. Like, but we're both ending the season. And I mean, I feel like they could have spliced both of these episodes up in tandem a little more and ended this season with like, you know, freaking something dramatic happening on the green side, something dramatic happening on the the black side and not leaving a whole lot of downtime because there was a lot of downtime at the beginning of this episode. And there was a lot of downtime. I feel like at the beginning of uh, episode nine, they didn't find but out about last all that episode. Said, that's it. I mean, that's my criticism. 
as far as that. Everything else was freaking gold, dude. Oh, Eamon's yeah. Eamon's blue ass sapphire eye. Dude. God, I love that dude. Right? I love, again, <laughs> speaking against the textbook, which just keeps getting like further and further back in my brain as this show elevates itself. Like, <laughs> uh, man, that source material is going to be really boring after this show is done. Yeah, they just add um, so much to it. But yeah, like. Flesh it out like mad. I love. I love how he's like, no, that's my, yeah, I don't like the kid. I want to cut his eye out, but I don't want to kill him. <laughs> like, because from that dinner uh, that we had a few episodes back, um, with the last dinner with Viserys and the way he's acting in the yard, he just seems like more of a daemon, like the stone cold killer. And he's probably going to turn into something like that after that traumatic event happening. Exactly. But you see his innocence in that moment, man, where he's still just a, a kid with some weapon he, a fucking, he just can't control. Makes his fall both all of the more tragic. Control. But uh, yeah, and little little Spitfire was like, hey, psh, there you go, how about that, you big bitch? And that's like, oh yeah, how about this? <laughs> Life over, you little bitch. So I thought it was funny how the dragons just at that point <laughs> are killing dragons. And once that starts, I mean, it doesn't sound like there's going to be no more dragons. Um, <laughs> that, uh, there aren't any when Game of Thrones starts. Fucking um, Shireen said, doesn't sound much like a dunce to me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, uh, great episode. Great feedback. I, I got to catch a little bit of y'all stream last night and oh, I got nice. to listen to the rest of it today. Um, Show up this weekend. I mean, again, I didn't have any buffering problems because I just watched your recorded upload. And when I watched it last night, I got to catch a little bit of it. But uh, cool. And I uh, I like a freaking so much. It feels like just happened. But um, I love the setting of Storm's End. I mean, it seemed like something out of like a Dark Souls game. Yeah. Um, oh, or something Dark like Souls. that. Just the setting, obviously, not yeah. creatures and shit. But like it just had this like Firelink gothic, shrine. ominous. That's what it felt like. Foreboding feeling to it. Just when he lands, just the music. Yeah, right. The yeah. setting, all of it was just exactly. so good. Just like and Firelink Shrine like when said, dropped off. Knowing it's going to happen. But in the books, no one was up in the sky with them. There wasn't some maester flying behind them with a little pen and paper like, oh, that's what happened. Look, you know, so it's so cool seeing this personal perspective of this uh, accounting that we've heard. I mean, I guess more than like major events, I feel like more and more the source material isn't really a spoiler for this stuff at all. It feels like they're they're putting so much of a spin on so many things without changing the course of history that, uh, you know, so good, dude, that you, I don't know. I mean, I'm still just as engaged. I feel like as my wife, when we're sitting down watching it together. So I'm really, really stoked with it. And I can't wait to see what they're going to do with season two. And, um, man, talk about a show that I wasn't that hyped for. Um, I mean, I was hyped, but I mean, I wasn't, I, I loved Game of Thrones, and I'm not one of those, oh, after the horrible thing that was season eight, how could I ever <laughs> watch another game? I'm not one of them people at all. I enjoyed season eight. Yeah, me too. But I thought freaking game uh, HBO like, was just going to just kind of like stick some crap together and try to ride off of the Game of Thrones nameplate. Yeah, exactly. And they haven't. They completely, this is just its own body of art and its own course and I mean, this show would be amazing whether there was a Game of Thrones or not. And Far I love exceeding that. my expectations. You know, so hats off to them and more focused telling since we're not worried about what is a house Lannister, what is a house High Garden, and all mm. that kind of stuff that they have to establish in the main series. Yeah. You get to enjoy this really nuanced story between this massive house fracturing. And I love it. So yeah. Great. Great feedback this season, guys. Both of you two dudes fucking killing it. Great feedback Busting from ass, you. Throwing out these long ass episodes that are so in depth and uh, going over everything. And I really appreciate all y'all's hard work. Thanks again for shouting out Sirenicide and hearing the haunted. Oh yeah, and coming Every time. this Halloween. Back from the dead, my new show. Not fiction. Finally, nonfiction. What the hell? What? Anyway, <laughs> what the what? Uh, just a little <laughs> teaser there. Why not? Have a, a great uh, off season, guys. And uh, I might be joining y'all pretty soon for something. Yeah. So we'll see. Until then, Archmaster Stitches. Oh. Always great to hear from you, Johnny. Excellent feedback, as always.
And thanks for your consistent feedback through the season, Johnny. It's been a pleasure to have you on the on the show. And too bad we couldn't get you on as a guest, but we'll we'll try to get you on this weekend for a season wrap up. Absolutely. Thanks, Johnny. All right, that's our show, episode 131. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks so much. See ya. A huge thank you to John Bailey, the epic voice guy from the Emmy-nominated Honest Trailers for announcing our show. And many thanks to our epic patrons on Patreon, Sirenicide, Lord John of House Grills, Sir Matthew of House Rep, Lord Jeremiah of House Becker, the last High Gardener of High Garden, Sir Corey Eugene of House Coon, Lady Naya of House Thrice, Lady Mary Jo of House Williams, and Princess Adela. On another note, if you enjoy my take on things, you might be excited to learn that I have a project of my own, a Bruin, a novel slash screenplay hybrid series called The Core Saga. And I'll be releasing more information about that soon. So keep your ears open because I've got over 1,100 pages written and it's going to be epic. More details coming soon. If you'd like to donate or subscribe to support us, you can go to paypal.me slash gompodcast or patreon.com slash gompodcast to donate an amount of your choosing. There are links to both at gameofmicrophones.com. Doing some online shopping, then go on over to gameofmicrophones.com, scroll down to the bottom, and click on our link to Amazon. As an Amazon associate, we earn from qualifying purchases. Any contribution you make helps, and you can help secure the continued existence of GOM. And make sure to check out Sirenicide and Hearing the Haunted, the horror drama podcasts featuring me and Archmaster Stitches. Go to sirenicide.com and hearingthehaunted.com and download them wherever you get your podcasts. Next episode, we'll be doing a season wrap-up podcast and we'll uh, let you know as soon as that's coming out. But it's been great covering this season of House of the Dragon. I think it's a really awesome show with a lot of potential moving forward. It's going to be, <laughs> I'm pretty excited for waiting a millennium until we have the next season. Absolutely. It'll be worth it though. If you'd like to call in, you can call us at 813 Joffrey. That's 813 563 3739. Yeah, feel free to send us a message and we can incorporate it into our live season wrap up show. Or if you want to send in comments about how you liked the season, you can shoot us a raven and email us at ravens at gameofmicrophones.com. Make sure to join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash G-O-M podcast, where we share memes and fun banter about Game of Thrones and Hot D. Yeah. Infla! Oh. Dragon Chomp! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can also watch Game of Microphones on YouTube, BitChute, Odyssey, and Rumble. Audio podcasts are great, but video is better. And we're still trying to build our tiny little minuscule subscriber count so go to youtube.com slash game of phone game of microphones right now and subscribe likes comments and shares are appreciated we're also on twitter instagram gab and minds at g-o-m podcast and we're on tumblr too at game of microphones all right that's our show thanks Thanks for for listening. listening Vagar, no, no. Okay, little, 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 little. ready? Yellow, little leather boots, little leather boots. <laughs> <laughs>
Red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. <laughs> all right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Drop it. Should I live? <clears throat> Record yourselves. <laughs> Express yourself. Yourself. War. War. <laughs> like Otto, yeah. A dual wounded. He's an Olympic long jumper. Jumping straight to the conclusion. <laughs> yeah. They killed him. You've killed my brother. Prepare to die. Do, 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 do. Yep, sorry. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> got it. <laughs> all right. Burn them all. Burn them all. Burn them all. Where's my sister? Woo! He's on the mend. Woo! Damon says Vermax. Or in German, Vermax. <laughs> like Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht and Flaggen, Flaggen, Snaggen. Yeah. Damon is so frightening in this moment. He's awesome. And he is, you can tell, he is absolutely. He means it with every ounce of himself. He means it. Roasting the green hosts. Roasting the host, host, roast. <laughs> toast to the roast. To toast. Host. <laughs> she she to- she roasts the green host to toast. Speaking of toasting, next we have the cremation scene. Oh god, that was such a brutal transition. Uh, <laughs> sorry. That's not what, I mean. <laughs> what is wrong with you? He doesn't have to be asked like, uh, you know, Damon had to force yeah. the other two guys at Dragon Point, <laughs> you know, yeah. so yeah, awesome. Not a gunpoint at Dragon Point. Yeah, yeah. Damon is like Rick James, man. He's a habitual line stepper. You got these names down, bro. You're Dude. like, boom, Bartimos, Kaltagar. <laughs> like Damn, I can't even like say it. With Reina, Baina, with Reina, Bela, Lena, those I have the most trouble with, with the Valerian ladies. And that look at the end is like a Danny look, a mad Targaryen woman. Don't mess with them. Don't mess with them. If they can, you know, get a toehold, he actually says that word in a minute. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Instead of foothold. Um, yeah, foothold. Just, just so it's not even a toehold. It's a tiny. We just need a little toehold. Um, Next really time it'll so. be, uh, you know, Damon goes in singing his song, doing his jig, dancing. Next time it'll be Damon and Raina singing a duet. You know, <laughs> yeah, right, harmonizing yeah. with each other in counterpoint. Turn it, <laughs> turn it into a little, a little music, a little mini musical inside of uh, Hot D yeah, season two. She climbs on up. Vermithor. Crab people. Crab people. Crab people. I see it all the time. I don't know why to write this like H A R or H A R R. It's, it's like Moop Heron Hall with a capitalization and everything. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's like, I have a hilarious. problem. My phone knows. <laughs> my, spo- my phone text, uh, predictive text knows how to speak uh, a song of ice and fire. A toehold. <laughs> you owe a dead boy. I'm Team Green. I, like I root for Team Green. Like I root for the Joker. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And uh, he said we can have every green head mounting mounted on spikes before the moon turns. <laughs> and you know Which, me. I mean, I guess I love those spikes. So I was all for that. <laughs> Go ahead. Heads on spikes. Heads on spikes. <laughs> yeah. Um, he hesitated before even entering past the the um, the dangling sh- the the curtain and I thought you were approaching this participle. <laughs> participle. I was say dangling participle. Sorry. The dangler. Yeah, Damon's mother dialed during childbirth. Uh, Did you say dialed? <laughs> Finally, the king and his good grace will pardon any knight or lord who conspired against his ascent. Um, <laughs> clear the room. Clear the room. Clear the room. Clear the room. <laughs> clear the room. Clear the room. Clear the room. I mean, yeah, he literally Darth Vader's uh, <laughs> Padme here. Yeah. And he, he Anakin's Padme. Uh. And, um, too few to win a war for the throne. Like, thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, <laughs> he is a captain, too. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> the Lord of the Tides, Master of Driftmar, Driftmar Captain of Obvious. Uh, <laughs> but he trusts her because she's perfect and she wouldn't make a dumb decision. Don't eat the help. And as Luke walks forward, we hear it. 
a deep grumble. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It's so awesome. You got to marry one of my doubters. King Aegon came with an offer. Oh, man. Hold on. I'm about to sneeze, possibly. Oh. What type of nut always has a cold? <laughs> Cashew. <laughs> nice. I will not fight you. <laughs> he looks like a lunatic. It's awesome. If I want to, I want a husband with all his parts. Do I just figure? I figured out the whole problem. They're speaking to the dragons in English. <laughs> a uh, little bit. That was back and forth. No, Vagar. No, Vagar. <laughs> Uh, Come on, hit me. Uh, hit me. Uh, hit me with it. You sound like an airline pilot. <laughs> Tina uh, from uh, Bob's Burgers. <laughs> airline we're pilot. At, uh, flight level 350. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth ride. Oh, thanks for flying with Delta. <laughs> oh, nice That's awesome. That's going in the outtakes for sure. <laughs> You know, he probably gives them the good news, bad news. Hey, uh, I got House Baratheon with us. Oh, great. Great job, Eamon. That's good. And I killed Lucerus. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> Is he going to act tough and own the disaster to save face and pretend it was all intentional? Um or is he going to admit that he's an idiot and <laughs> you know and lose all credibility and respect? Deuces, Lucis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, too soon. So too brutal. Soon. R.I. Pieces. Does it make me a bastard for agonizing over Eric's death while struggling off little sh while shrugging? Ah. Oh. Dragon chomp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>